Uh, let me say it again. Welcome to Columbia University, to the Hammond Institute. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm really excited about this event. It's been in the works for a long time. Um, really, uh, I think it was at least two years ago that Vasa Perez and Frantisek Porhaiski and I began discussing uh, the idea that there should be something big uh, this year, uh, or initially we knew it needed to be sometime in that sort of two-year period that was marking the 100th anniversary of the publications of the different parts of the, uh, the Good Soldier Sheikh. Uh, and uh, the two of them uh, were very much my uh, uh, partners in this venture in the early stages, recruiting the talent um, and uh, putting together this program. Uh, and so my, my first uh, thank you is to them for, for their work in, in making this happen. I certainly could not have put this together on my own, certainly not a product as, as beautiful as the one that you have here. Um, I also want to thank uh, very vocally um, our host uh, institution, the Harriman Institute, and the East Central European Center at the Harriman Institute, which is the principal sponsor that has uh, provided the space and uh, the resources uh, to, to make this possible. I uh, also like to thank the Columbia Slavic Department, which is a minor uh, financial supporter of this event, and also our media partners, the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia and the Czechoslovak Society of Arts and Sciences New York chapter, which have helped get out the word uh, about this event. Uh, and just, um, you know, this conference is called The World of Yaroslav Hasek. Uh, uh, Vasov and, and Parant and I were struggling for a while with the name. We considered different variants. Uh, there was certainly a thought of evoking the world of Franz Kafka and uh, that <laughs> landmark publication from the 1980s that, that did major work sort of put in Kafka in context. So it was that thought, but uh, we really thought this idea of either the world or the worlds of Yaroslav Hasek would get it at what we wanted to do here, which is um, a world in a few different senses, right? Um, uh, the actual world that he came from, the context, Prague, uh, uh, the 19 teens and 20s, things like that, that world. Uh, the world, of course, of his fictions and the logic of his fictions and how they work, that's going to be a topic we're going to address. Um, but also, uh, we have very much in mind uh, the big world, right? Uh, the world that is all around us that we feel in some way really is a world that Yaroslav Hasek did much to define and anticipate and give us all insight into. And uh, it's for that reason that we really try to, to bring a very diverse group of scholars together here. And, and we're so happy with the results, uh, with, with who has come. Uh, I mean, of course we have people whose main background is in Czech literature, but most of the people here are not people whose uh, you know, principal endeavor is Czech literature. And uh, I certainly am, am very much looking forward to uh, what these different perspectives are, are going to bring uh, as we come to understand better uh, this Czech national treasure uh, and, and really treasure of world literature. And um, I think, oh, it's still a minute maybe. I hit all the major things. I think I have. Well, maybe I know we have uh, standing by. Uh, Richard Hacek is connected uh, by Zoom. And uh, uh, our, our speaker, Yomar Hansi, uh, 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 was our connection to Richard, uh, who uh, agreed to uh, just say a few words of welcome. And so if he's there on Zoom, I'd like to give the floor to Richard. Uh, are you there? Hey, Dan. I'm get to you. Yeah, we have a little nebo rád poděkoval všem, kteří se zapříčinili nebo kteří věnovali tomu úsilí, aby mohla tady ta konference vzniknout. A proto my tady z Prahy a z Lipnice nad Sázou vás zdravíme. A jsme velice rádi, že to všechno začalo fungovat tak, jak mělo a vůbec. Já bych jen tak... Uh, so he would like to thank everyone who has made this conference possible and put it together. And he's sending best greetings uh, from Lipnice nad Sázavou. A rád bych jako připomněl jednu zajímavou věc. A to je vlastně vydání dobrého osudy dobrého Jáka Švejka v New Yorku v roce 1930. 
uh, well, so one particular event, the publication of the uh, the Adventures of the Good Soldier Schweik in New York in 1930. Uh, jak víte, možná dobře, velice dobře, že to přeložil Paul Silver. A zajímavý na tom je, že tato kniha byla vytisknuta v New Yorku. Já vám ji takhle ukážu, možná, jo. A tato kniha je velice vzácná a byla vlastně před rokem 2000, kdy byl z té výročí public library, teda v muzeu lidovým, teda v knihovně, a to byla vystavena mezi 150 knihama světa a autory, který vlastně nějakým způsobem ovlivnili uh, 20. století. Okay. Což je so, if I can, uh, he, um, he wanted to point out that uh, uh, this book, uh, the Selber translation, was published in New York, something which not too many people know. This is a, a fairly rare edition that he's got a copy of that he's sharing. And you wanted to mention that this book was featured in an exhibition in the year 2000 uh, of 150 books that uh, kind of shaped uh, the 20th century. Velice zajímavá věc je ta, a jsou na to dokumenty, že moje babička Jarmila Hašková, jako manželka Jaroslava Haška, který už byl v té době po smrti, byla požádána, aby napsala úvod nebo k této, tohoto prvního překladu. It's interesting that my grandmother, uh, Jarmila Hašková, the wife of Jaroslav Hašek, uh, was actually asked to write an introduction to this, in, uh, this translation. Je na tomto velice zajímavé a dodnes pátráme, kde je ten rukopis mé babičky, ale doufám, že se nám to podaří. We haven't yet found the, the manuscript of this introduction, but we're, we're looking and we hope it will turn up. Já bych ještě, jestli dovolíte, jen malý takový vstup do toho, bych zmínil Jana Masaryka, kterýž to tež byl na univerzitě kolumbijské a měl přednášky na začátku 20. století. I'd also like to mention at this time, if I may, uh, Jan Masaryk, who uh, was at Columbia University and had some lectures in the early 20th century. On se celou dobu, až vyšel teda ten člověk v tom 21. 20, 21. až 23. roce, se velice zajímal a když byla i druhá světová válka, tak byl jeden z těch, který udělal předmluvu k anglickému filmovému vydání dobrého vojáka Švejka. Ještě jednou, že jak, jakou roli měl v tom filmu? Předmluvu. A, ah, I see. So he gave a, 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 an introduction when the first film, when a, a, a prominent, not the first, but a prominent film adaptation was made around the time of the Second World War. A byl tak spojen se Švejkem, že se stal součástí vlastně tragédie z koncování jeho života, kdy vlastně měl otevřenou knihu, když v té době, po 50. letech, teda zemřel skokem údajně z okna. And uh, of course he's, he's sort of joined in a, a tragic fate in that he had an open book when his Uh, he made his his uh, uh, fatal fall or jump uh, from the window that, that ended his life. To je tak jako dodatek, který jsem chtěl říct, a který jako jsem si myslel, že je třeba to sdělit. Jinak jsem rád a vzdávám hold všem, kteří dneska budou u toho přednášení u všech těch akcí, které budou následovat. A rád bych popřál, aby to vše proběhlo v pořádku a bylo úspěšně ukončeno. A takovou ingrediencí, aby byl v rámci toho všeho jednání a konference ingredience humoru. Ale humoru, kde by byl vše v pořádku a kreativně pohodnoceno, jak je třeba.
And this is uh, really all I wanted to add for your consideration at the beginning of this event. But most of all, I want to wish you a successful conference. I hope everything goes well, that it uh, uh, meets your expectations and uh, the results are good. And I hope that it will include at least a, a significant element of humor. Well, uh, it looks like I'm proceeding dangerously close to my uh, original schedule. Um, I just want to say about the format, uh, each, uh, each speaker is really going to uh, have this 45 minutes to present his or her work. Uh, um, and I've encouraged everyone to leave some time at the end for questions and discussion, uh, but it will be up to them. Uh, and also just to note that, um, you know, I tried to group uh, these, these papers uh, thematically in a way that might generate some more uh, frisson and, and conversation, but these are not panels. Uh, e each of these works stands on its own, and, and certainly no one needs to feel uh, a pressure to respond uh, uh, specifically uh, across these. Um, and so with that, I would like to invite uh, uh, our first speaker, uh, Bohumil Posh, to come join me. Uh, professor Forst is a professor of literary theory at Maastricht University in Brno and a senior researcher at the Czech Academy of Sciences in Prague. Uh, he has studied and taught at Charles University in Prague, at the University of Toronto, and at University College London. He's the author of five monographs uh, focused on uh, topics such as fictional world theory, and the title there is an introduction to fictional world theory from uh, 2016. His other monographs on literary character, the Prague School, uh, and Czech realist prose. And he's also the author of about 50 studies published in Czech and English on various topics. He's also uh, a translator of scholarly books and articles from English into Czech. Uh, I'm sorry, the other way from Czech. Uh, oh, yeah, from English into Czech, um, including works by Lubomir Doležel, uh, Thomas Pavel, John Peer. Uh, Marie Lor uh, Ryan, David Herman, and Brian Richardson. His main fields of interest are literary theory and its history, narrative theory, literary realism, structuralism, semiotics, history of Czech literature, and of course, fictional world theory. And he's going to be uh, speaking to us today on uh, um, strategy and effect, narrative and semantic techniques in Hatzek's Libis Soldier State. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, tremendous conference. Uh, that's uh, really important for me for several reasons. And uh, last but not least reason is just to be given the opportunity to speak about, to speak here today about the book, which is uh, not only a favorite book of mine, but also uh, a very important and influential, if not the most important and the most influential books a book of my of my life. I will I will, I will try to uh, explain this. Uh, this book has to be it has been around, so to speak, uh, from the very beginning, always. Uh, thanks to the fact that my father was a big, very diligent and involved fan of this book. So I remember as a child that uh, there are many references to to this book and to Hashek's work in general. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I must admit that my first encounter with the book happened, I don't remember that exactly, I was uh, maybe eight, maybe nine years old, that was my first adult book, you can imagine how, how much I understood at the time, you know, <laughs> reading this book, but, but because it was always, it has been always around, so I wanted to read it at some point, so after all those ch children's book, whatever, so I, I finally took this book and read through it, and I was very surprised, I, I remember partly that feeling that it's not only that, uh, you know, my father used to refer to this book, but I, I, I just realized how much of the family idiolect was based on this book and references <laughs> from this book. But, but you, you would be surprised as well if you realize that when, when your parents want to want to show you, by uh, loving parents, you know, want to, sh to show you some affection, they would pick the names of the uh, artificially developed beasts, you know, <laughs> from this book. You know, you know them from either from the Czech version or from the. From the from the other translations, you know, and I was very surprised. I felt very special. I was like, well, my parents, you know, there's this Hodulajrava, which is uh, connected, well, so which is translated like Hodulus Orax. I, I believe that's the that's the correct thing. And you know, my 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 
My parents used to call me the diminutive version of this thing, but they used to say that, well, are you hungry? Are you hungry? <laughs> so uh, but you feel very special that, you know. So then, uh, of course, I read the book as a teenager a couple of times because, as I said, it's, it's been always around. And uh, then finally, a second big encounter was when I started studying at the university, uh, luckily enough, uh, shortly after the fall of communism. And this book, actually, which I until then, I considered a funny book, a, a very familiar funny book. And finally, I realized that while well, all the new interpretations, on, on, all these new views of the book, you know, of the interpretation, and uh, putting this book to, to various uh, environments, I mean, to, to different, uh, I will, uh, actually observing it and evaluating it from different points of view. And I was, I was there. I was, I was a student in the 1990s, being a uh, uh, being trained to be a, a, a teacher of Czech you know, literature. And that was only then when I realized, well, it is a funny book, but it's not only a funny book, is it? There is something else to you know, the, the book. And again, in the pace of, of, the, of time, you know, I, I read through the book several times. Uh, and uh, this is my actually third important uh, uh, encounter with the book because that's the first time I'm going to speak about this, uh, about this book publicly. and. Uh, uh, slightly uh, at a at a scholarly level, so I'm. I only hope I'm not going to be too blasphemic, you know. So uh, here's my here's my talk. Uh, uh, sorry, at the beginning I'm going to I'm going to do something like what would be expressed like shipping coast to Newcastle or Nositsu to Aten. Uh, I just want to start with some kind of general statement, which is like what are we usually talking about in terms of good soldier shrek? I mean the book. Uh, these days, when we speak about it, I would say again at a smaller level, there are like several topics and several areas in which we keep this debate. First is definitely classification. The genre is that you, you must have encountered this. this uh, you, well, sorry, who you are interested in this book? You know, uh, is it a war novel? War novel? Is it a war chronicle? Or is it a more politically or socially critical novel? Is it a grotesque? It is as well, of course. Or is it an allegory would be as well to an extent, being partially or as a whole? Well, is it the most humorous novel about the war, as Milan Kundera states or suggests? Or is it a synthesis of satire and humanism, as for example, Lubomir Dolezal uh, suggested? Well, they probably all of them. Uh, and the final result, the final genre, will, will stay. Uh, I would say blurry for us, uh, unless we do it, we sort it out today. Mm -hmm. uh, the second area is the, definitely the circumstances of production. All this legendary, legendary return of Yaroslav Hasek from uh, Russia and Soviet Union, uh, the whole thing about the about writing the book on demand, you know, and also in different stages of, uh, 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 I, I would say, mind at uh, toxic intoxication and so on. Uh, also, the part of the part of the writing part being dictated and so on. So this is another area which is incredibly interesting. And the third one, uh, which uh, I've, I've entered only recently, is the kind of the sociological view of the book. You know, well, not only sociological. How, how much did this book uh, actually uh, contributes to the Czech canon, Czech national literary canon? How much this book belong to some uh, something which we call the readers' biographies? And all these things you can actually measure how much they did influence someone's reader's experience. I was a respondent, you know, once, so I know that. So I was like, that was the most important book for me. And of course, we do speak about Schweik. Uh, we can't avoid uh, speaking about Schweik in this respect. So, uh, how do we picture actually Schweik? Probably like this, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, probably the, the most, the visual, visually, the most familiar picture of. Of Schweig, which appears in many, probably in all Czech, well, you probably understand or know that better than I do, probably in all Czech, all Czech editions and definitely in very many translations. Uh, I quite like this. Well, everyone knows that this is good soldier Schweig, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not interested in, in the arts apart from literature. So let's go to the, to the, <laughs> uh, to the, uh, uh, well, uh, sorry, if I may. Well, of course, the, the proprieties are, are there, and there are beer, pipe, uh, fat, and smile. I think that's it. You know, very, very, 
uh, be very important. Oh, well, you know that this uh, let us uh, use of let us illustrations actually uh, can be considered a part of the book actually in a way. So, well, who is Sheik really? <laughs> uh, he is definitely a beer drinker and pipe smoker. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, that's uh, something we, we know either from the pictures or from the description in the book or from the movie as well, definitely, or movies. Uh, uh, definitely, he can be considered a funny and laughable idiot. That's one of the ways, of course, everyone these days says, but not, he's not only that, he's something else as well. So what this something else can be, he can be an uncanny malinger and war avoider, which is actually true as well. And of course, he uh, can only pretend that he's an idiot. Uh, but uh, the question is whether the motivation of Schweik is now speaking something a literary scholar should never do, no speaking for a character, whether his, uh, whether his uh, intention is to pretend anything. But uh, on a slightly more general level, well, this, these questions about like a little big man in the, in the sense like a little history, big history, little world, big world, and so on, also uh, also appears. Homoludens, as Hannah Gaifanova suggested, is one of those uh, very interesting, I would say, and uh, very you know, illustrating views of the, what Schweik is based on game, right? Oh, is he a Deontic alien again mentioning Lubomir Dolezio? So is he really, is he really, is, uh, um, uh, does he really populate the world, world somewhere between prohibition, obligation, and permission, or is he outside this world, outside the boundaries of this world? And of course, well, he is also a Czech literary cultural phenomenon. He is a typical Czech in some views. Uh, <clears throat> well, he is definitely a symbol of uh, something because uh, as you know very well, probably there is a verb derived from his uh, name, which is Shveikova, which can mean actually, I, I checked the dictionary a few days ago, uh, which can mean and forget quite a few things, but all of them are somehow concerned with the fact that uh, someone who pretends that he is doing something and he is not doing it exactly the way he is supposed to do or something like that. Uh, one, one meaning is that you talk more than you work, which uh, <laughs> is a possibility, isn't it? And for the symbol, Czech national symbol, uh, Czech national symbol is definitely there because uh, I don't know, well, you, you may not be familiar with this, but Czechs are actually very well. <laughs> so the typical beer glass, you know, well, there are quite few of them. Uh, this is one of them. And well, you can imagine it's very similar, actually, a very similar shape. I remember this ugly thing, which is made of metal or whatever, and with this toxic red, which he never says, or no one, or no one called Shrek says it in the novel. Uh, good soldier Shrek. Well, I don't even know how to translate it. Like keep take it easy. Take it. Oh no, take it easy. It's yeah, take it easy. You know, beer again. Beer important. Well, beer is very important. Or whether the smile. There is no buy. This is a quite modern, more than a uh, beer glass. It's something you can buy on the internet if you are interested. I don't remember the older versions. Uh, well, no, actually, I'm, I'm, I, will I will try to be slightly more serious now. Uh, well, in terms of qualities, sorry, well, I, I hope it's still, it's still big enough for you to be, to be able to read it. In, in terms of his qualities, when we when we look at Schweik as a, as a literary character, uh, not in a very sophisticated way, while well, we can actually derive some some qualities, uh, his behavior, actional, uh, actually is in accord with uh, in, in concordance with his verbal uh, behavior. Uh, I call it puzzling because I need a word for a further slide, you know. So. Uh, I will start with the things which are obvious from the from the novel because they are named there or they are uh, helped by the way the, the narrator the uh, um, third person narrate, narrator helps it a lot because he describes Shrek a lot you know so well it's said that he is humble Shrek is definitely humble it's 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 said in the very first uh, in the in the introduction already that he's a humble man but is he that's my question is he only a humble <laughs> person because well there are stages in which not like a like a major quality of, of him but there are stages in in, in well mockery is of course his this quality which uh, there, there are no doubts about it but he okay also teases people 
Uh, he uses balloon, he uses other, other people, you know. Uh, not like that they would harm them, but the, again, I'm not saying that teasing someone and being humble, it's not impossible to go together. But at the same time, I wanted to find some something uh, slightly slightly different from the main quality. So he, the obligation, again, well, yeah, he is in a way very obligatory. Well, on the other hand, well, a very big part of the discussions about Sheikh is about his being a rebel in a special way of a special kind, right? Subordination, yes, to an extent, definitely so. Well, he's a, he's a, uh, not butler, but, but uh, yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. And but uh, well, on the other hand, in the well, in the development in, in the novel of the novel, he actually he emancipates. He gets some rank, and actually he is in the position of superordination as well. Loyal. That's a very important thing. He is loyal in a way. Again, uh, he is loyal uh, when it suits him. Uh, he can be very disloyal to pretty much anyone. Who loses? And again, well, I can't, I, don't, I can't speak for a literary character. I would never dare to. But well, there are traces of disloyalty as well. Purposeless playfulness, yeah, that would that would, uh, that would correspond with the homoludens and fabulation, which is a part of this of this playfulness. Well, versus uh, a purposeful acting. Well, he he very often actually he does things for purpose. He knows that this is going to be. Or he can uh, he can actually insinuate that this is going to be the the result of his action. And again, stability. Uh, this actually that would, that was actually deserve a, a whole talk, I guess. But the, he develops in the in the place of the novel. Definitely, the character develops, and he he is stable in a way. And also, he very he very obviously develops towards some kind of uh, emancipation, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. Well, his verbal behavior, that's very interesting, puzzling as well, you know. There is the literal meaning, which is a part of the, of the, of the whole tension, semantic tension of tension of the novel. There's the literal meaning he takes or he understands uh, versus common sense, which sometimes actually, it's against the literal meaning, sometimes it corresponds and very often happens when someone, well, the machinery or whatever, uh, the war machinery takes the literal meaning, he goes against with the common sense and vice versa. Uh, construction via the construction, via, via the construction, I will, I will focus on this in a couple of slides. Uh, he constructs, definitely, he constructs verbally something. He constructs in, in, in a world, in the fictional world already existing. But well, at the same time, he deconstructs many worlds. He actually constructs before he deconstructs them. And well, it's based on all his uh, strategies. I would say verbal strategies are based on uh, uh, analogy. Uh, he hyperbolizes very often as well. There is also irony. And there are other things that there are traces of allegories as well and other, other, possible, other possible means. Uh, when we look at it from the reader's point of view, at least from my, my point of view, uh, as a reader, uh, well, he is, he is very, very rarely psychologized, very rarely. Uh, very, uh, which, whichever mean we have got in our mind, you know, I mean, like the psycho narration of uh, some kind of inner monologue or whatever, he is not very well psychologized. Uh, we don't know much about his motivation coming from the psychological point of view, uh, about his intentions, about his preference, about his purpose. Uh, and another thing which, which is connected with his behavior, well, it's very difficult to predict anything. Uh, sometimes, yes, well, in a slightly bigger pieces of the novel, uh, but the pro well, then you know, you understand everything, it's uh, coming you know, going, proceeding smoothly, and suddenly something happens. He does something which uh, you can't predict as a reader that this is going to happen. Uh, he switches the roles between being being, uh, being a rebel, which is, he's never a proper rebel, but he's never 100% obligatory, and so on. Uh, and, uh, well, the result is that he's, uh, he's difficult to, to comprehend. He's, uh, he's a bit ambiguous. And uh, the question is well, whether we really should talk about Shrek as a character, as a, 
not a living human being, but as a fictional character, which actually enables us to, to give them some uh, human uh, qualities, but on whether it's a different story, and I think it should be a different story. And uh, I would try to talk about uh, Sheikh being a principal uh, or principus, in my point of view, than a character. Uh, my first suggestion, well, he's a narrative, narrative principal, definitely he is. Uh, uh, he draws the reader's uh, attention to, to himself. He does that. Because when you say the, the, the novel, well, it's full of shade. Maybe shade extends the, the space of the novel even. Uh, but at the same time, he's in a very, very uh, uh, survival position to the plot. The plot develops uh, only and uh, mainly through Schweig. There are exceptions, there are little exceptions, but the uh, majority of the plot is developed through him. It's either about him or he is the, he is the active person who uh, actually developed other episodic plots, uh, the episodic episodes, actually. Uh, well, he is on, from one side, he is determined by the story. The, the, the author or the narrator wants to tell us this story and the author wants to tell us something, uses the, the, uses Sheikh as a, as a tool for it. But on the other hand, and this is very interesting, uh, he seems to be also determined by the real world, which is not very, very common in terms of, well, again, that would, that would, deserve, a, that would deserve a couple of lectures, but, uh, uh, you know, the whole connection with, between a uh, fictional and factual world it's very interesting, and definitely in Hashek's, Hashek's writing, there is a strong tendency to authentication. Uh, uh, he does it uh, perfectly. He does it uh, as you know. Uh, he does it uh, hundred, almost hundred percent. You know, because of almost one hundred percent, because there are quite few. Ashwig being the, the only mm -hmm. or the main one who doesn't have a, 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 a real world, uh, real world. Uh, uh, Sorry, is the word uh, counterpart? Comes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, Schweig as a, as a narrative principle or strategy is passively followed by the main plot line. It is he is the one who actually focalizes everything. He is followed by by the uh, by the by the uh, main plot uh, line. Uh, but also he, as I said, he implements uh, other. Other episodic narratives, other episodic plots in the in the main line. Uh, whatever they do with the main plot line, usually they uh, disturb it. They usually they are. I will come to. I will come to that a bit later. And there also, uh, just uh, briefly, there is a there is a term narrativity. You probably know very well. One of the one of the uh, people who contributed actually who, who uh, developed the term was Mary Steinberg, and. Uh, well, in his in his definition, narrativity is based on uh, suspension, curiosity, and uh, everything is there. But then, who is me? Suspension, curiosity, and the third one is. No, no, no. Uh, suspension, curiosity. I, I missed the third. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. So suspension, curiosity would be all right. So yeah. So well, everything about Trey causes the readers, uh, the readers' uh, curiosity because the reader never knows what is going to happen in next step, in next chapter. And also, also uh, he is controversial to the extent that uh, uh, I would say he causes whatever the suspension, the narrative suspension. Which is caused by well, which is uh, which is caused by many strategies, not only by Schweig, but of, of the narrator as well. Uh, you can see this this very uh, this uh, this very uh, this very uh, principle of narrativity or narrative principle of Schweig pretty much everywhere. Uh, another principle I'm going to name in one minute can be seen already in the first sentences of the of the novel. Uh, as it goes, a great people cause for great men. There are murders, unrecognized heroes, without Napoleon's glory or his record of achievement. An analysis of their characters would overshadow even the glory of Alexander the Great. Today, in the streets of Prague, you can come across a man who himself does not realize what his significance is in the history of the great new epoch. 
Modestly, he goes his way, troubling nobody, nor is he himself troubled by journalists applying to him for an interview. If you were to ask him this name, he would answer it in a simple and modest tone of voice, I am Schweik. And that's exactly, oh, sorry. that's exactly what brings me to another principle which can be, can be found or can be actually assigned to, to Schweik. Uh, I call it fuzzy dialectic principle. Uh, uh, yeah, and um, this, uh, well, because yeah, there is dialectics, definitely lots of dialectics uh, in the novel. Nevertheless, it's not, uh, that's not the dialectics we are used to. Uh, it's uh, the, the thesis and, and that's it, thesis says are not, uh, are not uh, contradictory to the extent we would like them to be. It's not either false or right. It, there is something about big, small man history, uh, but there is something in between. You know, there, he is a he is a soldier. He's an individual. They are not they are not exclu exclusive. Uh, there is a, the main plot. There are episodes, but once again, they kind of uh, we can divide them. We can see that they are divided, but we can also see them and, and in one whole. There are tours and detours, which are very going to be very important for me. And there are there is construction and the deconstruction. And I think these two last main principles are very are, are the main important ones. So the whole novel, to me, it's based on on <laughs> uh, on when when we talk about the novel as a, as a fictional world, uh, it's based on three. On, on three principles, the first two being uh, connected with the Schweik as a, as, a, as a principle, the third one being more general. So there is definitely this physical element, uh, which can be actually seen, especially in the, those tours and detours. Tours means uh, something which is uh, happening Officially, something Schweig participates in officially as a soldier. Uh, detours are uh, the opposite. They actually they represent something that uh, that is avoided from the tours and something which goes in a different way. Uh, there are verbal, uh, there are verbal uh, semantic means, uh, verbal general principle, which is I call it forking uh, just. Uh, simple, I, I didn't find a better word for it. So I, I call it forking, and this is connected with the construction and deconstruction. I mentioned it a couple of times already. So that's the way I'm, I'm going to speak about forking in, in one minute. Uh, this is the way which actually di difference, you know, differentiates between not only the, the main plot line and the episodic lines, but also the main, the way uh, the whole novel and the argument of the novel is structured. And there is the definitely the semantic thing, which is a, uh, which is the big and small. Uh, I call it ideology. Humanity could be called the, uh, which actually, <coughs> sorry, materializes in this novel, uh, uh, in the clash of uh, ideology. Humanity could be could be called just uh, war machinery and humanity maybe would be better in terms of this in, term, in terms of this novel. Uh, the two senators. There are two, two main, there are like some little ones, but they are not important. There are two main uh, detours in the novel. There is one big tour and two detours. Mm -hmm. And definitely they have got a huge, the detours have got a huge uh, narrative potential. Uh, they do actually bring lots of suspension, uh, suspension, uh, sorry, suspension, suspension, and they also, also uh, bring, uh, uh, a lot to the development of the of the narrative. They have got a very important author, author, I can't speak English anymore. Uh, authentication potential, uh, especially the first one. It's like if he if no, he if uh, Schweig wants to or the author wants to show us through Schweig actually uh, real people, real places. The first detail is so unnecessary in the novel from a, any point of view. But it's very, very important from the point of view that, well, look, this is the real life. Majority of the people named in the first detour actually had, uh, uh, have had uh, 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 real counterparts or they are based on some uh, real people. 
Uh, it, it, the first data wants to show us there is a real world, of course, uh, affected by the affected by the machinery, but not not totally. And of course, they bring us uh, they show us the specific places or spaces, actually, as as, as I call it, between the uh, freedom and not freedom. And we, if we add to this uh, this general thing, trade. So uh, he is again, as I said, followed by the plot, and he's followed by, by the whole uh, meaning of the novel because, well, he is uh, he's a soldier. So he through him we see the direct the war machinery or ideological machinery. Uh, sorry, the ideological uh, tour. Uh, but uh, we can see also the details, which are very important. They are not this. They are not desertions, you know, because the, he is not. He never. He never crosses the border. Well, he does, but in, in a way, that's the second one more important than the first one in this respect. But not, not really. He is not executed as a deserter, which is good at the end of yeah. the day, isn't it? Uh, 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 it also causes these details. They also cause the fact that what is not seen again by the main foc focalizer, Shrey, it's not, it's not that it does not exist, but it's some kind of put aside. You know, again, there is a tension between two words. Uh, both of them, it, it's like one word doesn't exist if Shrek is not in the in the world, and and the other doesn't exist when Shrek is in the first one. Uh, they are they are, they are they are probably well definitely because you can't be in, in two things uh, at once, so they are mutually exclusive. And uh, <clears throat> One more thing I would like to mention, I'm not the first one who actually noticed this, is that there are, those two details are different. Because uh, the first one, as I said, wants to, uh, again, not speaking for the author, uh, to, it's more based on the fact that, well, this is, an, uh, this is a world outside the, 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 the world which is in war. But the second one is more about Shrek himself. This is like, uh, it's shorter, it could, it could have ended up in a much much worse way for him and so on. And I would say, well, his, his, uh, world, uh, his world deteriorates a bit, uh, probably thanks to the fact that those two, those two rails, as I'm going to call them at the end of my talk, actually, they are getting closer and closer together. And the question is whether they merge. The more Shrek is involved in, in, the, in the war machinery, the, the, the least... Uh, uh, chance of, of those details actually are possible. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, this is the, this is the beginning of the second detail, which only illustrates which only illustrates uh, uh, not only the, the, the way Shrek actually decides to leave to leave the main road the tour, it, but it also illustrates that his uh, his decision making is sometimes absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? Uh, well, anyhow, anyhow, this is the way I'm going, said Shrey. It's a more comfortable road than yours. I'm going along by the stream where the forget me not not grow. And if you want to traipse along in the growing heat, you can. I stick to what Lieutenant Lukas told us. He said we couldn't miss the way. So I'm going to take it easy across the fields and pick some flowers. <laughs> twice, twice flowers mentioned twice in, in one paragraph. That's very unusual, by the way. Shrek is becoming garden or whatever. Uh, don't be a fool, Shrek, said Quartermaster Sergeant Bunny. You can see from the map that we, we have got to go to the right, like I said. And uh, the famous maps, maps can be wrong, or make, make, maps are wrong sometimes too, by Shrek. And he's thrown downhill towards the stream. And you know, the, the consequences is that he's captured and he's almost, uh, he's almost executed, but uh, again, and he makes it that Google Midori says actually Shrek could be a national hero in this history. Uh, this forking, which is even more problematic than tours and leaders. Uh, forking, it's a it's a very, very broad term for me. Uh, the means used for this forking, what uh, I will explain what forking means talking about, about forking. Uh, well, it's analogy. Uh, uh, very often, well, we will get there at the beginning of the of the novel. Uh, well, there is there is the, the scene about Ferdinand being killed, you know, the analogical things, you know, this is an analogy, an analogy, an analogy. The four thing is, I have known someone who had a similar problem. I've met someone who has got this experience and so on. Association, free or not, that's definitely <laughs> there. 
extrapolation. Extrapolation is one of them. And also translation. And translation, what I mean is uh, translation from common sense to some to some literal meaning. The function of a verbal forking, uh, definitely it's semantic. It's it contributes to the to the whole puzzle of the novel, uh, to the whole thing that uh, the main line, that main narrative line is uh, dissolved by the episodic lines as well, and so on. And also the, the whole meaning of the of the of the of the novel is uh, it's not it's constantly disrupted. Uh, the purpose of the forking could be could be I'm just uh, guessing. Uh, translation from big history to small history and lie some kind of demonization of the real world, uh, of, I mean, the real world in the fictional world. Uh, construction and deconstruction, definitely so, definitely so. Do, do, do know it's, it, it's incredibly deconstructive uh, probably in a different way that, well, usually when we speak about uh, the self-deconstructing self narrat narratives, we, we would never ever think about hashtag, but in a way, this is actually a very, a very puzzling uh, strategy. And again, as I said, the divergence of main plot, line, and episodes. Uh, working, as I, as I promised, is at the very beginning. So they have killed our, our Ferdinand, said the gentleman to Mr. Mr. Schweig. And again, uh, his reply is our, translating from the official history to his little history. Which Ferdinand, Mrs. Miller asked Schweig, continuing to massage his knees. I know two Ferdinands. One of them does jobs for Prusa, the chemist, and one day he drank a bottle of hair oil by mistake. And then there is Ferdinand Kokoschka who goes around collecting manure. Actually, I prefer the Czech version, which is Bira Psi Hovinka. Uh, they wouldn't be any great loss, either of them. Uh, and that, again, well, when he discussion goes uh, along, and then he says, well, there are some revolvers, Mr. Miller, the, the association, that won't go off even if you try to tell you was Got it. There is lots like that, but they are sure to have got something. They got something better than that for the archduke. <laughs> and I wouldn't mind betting, Mrs. Miller, that the man who did it put on his best clothes for the job. You know, it was a bit of doing to shoot an archduke. It's not like when a poet who shoots a gamekeeper. Uh, again. It, it is for kings in a way, and if it's it's not in a way, there are usually more than one means and one 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 uh, strategy is involved in this working. Uh, this the second part of the second paragraph, which reminds of kind of scas, uh, scas practice, you know, narrative scas. I mean, our uh, type of narrative. Uh, actually, again, uh, you can you can see. Thank you. Uh, um, you can see that uh, this is uh, a free association that. Well, what kind of an idea is that? That if you want to assassinate an, an nobleman, that you have to be dressed for that, you know, properly. Yeah, what kind of? Uh, I would expect this. In, 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 sorry, if anyone of you is English, <laughs> you know, being written by a British author, but not Czech journalist. You know, that's very interesting, isn't it? That it doesn't sound Czech at all to me. Nevertheless, uh, conclusion: we are getting there. Uh, Mm. I, I'm going to use a metaphor, which is uh, para, uh, sorry, rail, rail, uh, which is very important because while majority or very, very important part of the novel actually takes place in a train, which is going on the rails, right? So there are two parallel rails, or could be seen to parallel rails, maybe more than that, but uh, who knows? So the, again, let's start from the from the most general things or more general ideas. Big world, small world. Uh, big history, small history could be the same. Uh, being uh, embodied in well, on the one hand, the big world, big history, and war machinery, which is very very <coughs> present in the novel. The small uh, small world, small man, small history. It's uh, it's embodied in everyday life. Uh, and actually, I quite like this uh, <clears throat> uh, this similarity or this this allegorical similarity, similarity because the big world actually is it is the main plot line as well. The, the war machinery it is actually it, it, it structures mm -hmm. is uh, uh, it actually develops the main plot line. Whereas the the episodic uh, plots or episodic uh, narrative uh, narratives actually more corresponds with the with an uh, 
uh, with an individual, with a small man, with a small world. And uh, again, the, uh, the, if the big world, the one of the whales, ends up in the negation of humanity, slightly big words, but about, I hope you understand what I mean. Well, uh, on the other hand, the, the other whale uh, uh, develops to or ends up uh, results in essence of humanity, being human, being again human. And my only question is, well, whether this metaphor, it's, it's uh, fruitful because it seems that, well, a train cannot go on one rail, but we call it this rail, right? So, but on, on the other hand, well, this doesn't seem to be two rails that should support one thing, that, that a train, a proper train, something, whatever we call it, should be based on two uh, so diametrically different lines. And again, well, um, that's a very good thing that we can use this kind of visual fallacy thing. So when we look at it, uh, at the novel, and we know that uh, the war machinery and, and the, the human world uh, do more and more merge, just simply because uh, normal everyday people are uh, involved in the war machinery more, more and more, they can't escape, they are trapped in the train actually, going on the rails and going to the slaughterhouse called war. And well, my question is whether it's just an optical illusion that uh, they merge somewhere on the horizon mm -hmm. or whether it's not, you know? And of course we don't know the final answer because uh, that's the question which was already asked by, by many, many people involved in this. And the question is, that's my final question, what would have been the further development of the novel had it not stayed unfinished? And I'm not going to answer this question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this talk, which uh, I think is, is a great way to start this conference. It, it opens so many of the big questions about how we uh, how we interpret this novel, and it gives us a lot of food, I think, to, to, to consider going down. I see that Professor Tolman has a question. Yeah, or a comment. It's, it's just a very brief question. I'm not sure I understood it. You said that the novel has a plot line. <laughs> what is the plot line? Uh, I, I'm not a theoretical. No, 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 no. Theoretical understanding of. No, 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 no. It's. Uh, I, th I think you you know that your question is more sophisticated than. Uh, it has. Well, what I meant was. Uh, Definitely, I met something like main plot line, uh, and now I'm I'm going to I have to speak about some kind of uh, 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 framing narrative, I guess, or which is uh, and I'm sure Patish <coughs> actually is going to speak about this. You know, uh, yeah. I, what I mean is the, the the plot line done by the development of the fictional world, which means the uh, the setting, the setting. <laughs> Uh, that's a very theoretical concept. Yeah. But the question is actually very good because does it really have this main plot line? Is it is it a collection of episodic lines? Or can I even call it a, a main, the main line? It is there. It's a circumstance of the fictional world. So I, I just made this shortcut about, I hope it's not confusing. I, I, I think there is a main plot line, but historical one. Yeah, his, well, that would be another great one. Well, could be, could be. Yeah, historical. Also, geographical plot It's easy to follow. Yeah. After you've done it. That's that's yeah. exactly what I said. Well, maybe setting or narrative setting that would be a good. As, as narratologists like it. And that is one thing is true because what this main plot line. Well, if if someone asked me which one is this, I would have to say, well, that's historical. It's uh, geographical. It's like done in the fictional world. You know the way it's set actually. Yeah. Well, that's not a literary notion. It's not sorry. That's not a literary notion. No, no, no. Okay. Well, that's what I want. No, no, no. Yeah. That's off, yeah. Uh, I really like this idea of the two rails emerging <laughs> on the horizon, where the everyday history and the big history become the same thing. And what it is, it's a, it's a, what it turns the novel into is a, a story of the development of something like total war. In which everybody is involved in the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Every resource yeah. in the nation is dedicated to one goal. So there's like you know, 100% taxation, like everything goes into the world. Um, 
And it makes me think about the ways in which uh, I, I wrote a piece on Shrek and encyclopedias and Shrek in relation to modernist epic, in relation to the questions of totality. It makes me think that you could read this as an allegory of the rise of totality. Could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not a question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm still not sure whether whether this is the thing. I'm not still sure whether it's not a fallacy, you know, whether it's not an illusion, you know, kind of, you know. Well, they, they seem to be merging. I, I agree. But can they? That's what or I like will they? That's what I like about it. You know that whatever situation Shrek is in, there's always going to be, well, you suspect, but there's always going to be two so, different You can't so, right? imagine Shrek where he's actually just a good soldier doing his duty. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Yes, Peter. Yeah. Of course, you know, the, the, the question why, why you call it dialectics. Dialectics usually have some solutions and synthesis out of that. Yeah, that, that, the beauty of arguments of Schwing is precisely that conclusion is never. Dialectics, at least in my vocabulary, I would use that word. You know, I, I, I don't know, literally, you know, you know, let, let, let's take the linguistic aspect. And the, there is a profound tension with, you know, using rice. Between the cooperative principle, mm. the axis of the this the felicitous conversation, mm. he observed the principle of cooperation meticulous, but mm. always well is the axis mm. the, the of the That's, that's exactly right. It's, 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 how, you, how do you synthesize it? How do you bring this? No, you can't. You can't. Well, that's why I, well, your, your suggestion is better. I just call it fuzzy. I you're a mathematician, so I just, well. I'm happy. Well, that's exactly what you are saying. Okay. Yeah. 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 Maybe problematize a little bit the opposition between big world as a world where we have a narrative of negation of humanity and war, right? I see that's what you're pointing to. And if the world of small men is, is the world of the anecdote and, and the detours, but those detours are often terribly violent, right? The world that's evoked in all of these private recollections, people kill each other for no apparent reason, right? I'm not sure if it's if it's as clear an antithesis to the, the inhumanity of the of the big world narrative. That was just a simplification. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, I hope it opens uh, another discussion. Yeah, you are right, definitely you are right. This is like black and white a bit, sure. but uh, yeah, just the purpose of, oh, sorry, for the purpose of us uh, having something to talk about. Well, I, I think it's done that amply. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, uh, our next speaker is Peter Steiner. Uh, let me see here. Take my so, do here. Yeah, and I think you can advance with this. So, let me introduce you, uh, although perhaps little introduction is needed. Uh, Peter Steiner, Professor Emeritus of Slavic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, born in Prague, he received his PhD at Yale in 1976. Before coming to Penn, he taught at the University of Michigan and Arbor and at Harvard. After retiring, he served as a visiting Yudenshan professor at the Guangdong University of Foreign Studies in Guangzhou. Uh, his research interests include literary theory and modern Russian and Czech literature. His major publications include his translated edition, The Prague School, Selected Writings, 1929 to 1946, uh, which came out with uh, University of Texas Press in 82, uh, and also the books Russian Formalism, A Metapoetics uh, by Cornell in 84, and subsequently in editions in Japanese, Italian, Bulgarian, Spanish, and Czech. And um, one of my favorite books, the, the Deserts of Bohemia, Czech Fiction and its uh, Social Context from Cornell uh, in 2000 and subsequently in Czech in 2002. And most recently, uh, Václav Havel or Existenciální revoluce invazi do Iraku, uh, uh, the uh, University Press of Palacky uh, University. Uh, the English translation would be Václav Havel from Existential Revolution 
to the invasion of Iraq uh, uh, from 2022. I would thank Mr. Zmieli who enabled me to publish this kind of a little bit scandalous text. <laughs> uh, so, all right, so, uh, you know, to, to put the damper on this <laughs> jubilatory spirit, I, you know, not every Czech likes Ray. I remember when I well, like, hated the power. This folks, you know, it's I don't know, I don't know, body humor or really bombastic and all that. So, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of schmucks, uh, sh sh uh, a matter of space. All right, so let me, let me kick it off. I will talk uh, about the you know, same lines as Bohumil. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of a, always, I was always puzzled by. Kind of the identity of Schweik, so I will look at it from a more kind of a technical perspective. So let me try whether this works. Indeed, it does. So my departure point is uh, Borges, <laughs> the gospel according to Mark. Well, it's a kind of a you know, not very serious comment, but I like it. Basically, he says that all literature is basically a reiteration of two stories. Yeah? <laughs> One is Odyssea, yeah, and the other is the New Testament. Yeah? The man, man who is seeking his feeling on island and the other who in the bucket on Golgotha. Yeah, so strangely enough, I mean, if you read the you know, state of Paris, volume which make both texts are mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little, I will say, Edel, you know. China. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, here I brought some some examples of uh, you know the biblical parallels in the first volume when Shwe got busted you know he was taken to his court and you know first you know this is very famous in Czech famous saying Ježíš pán byl taky nevinný a přece ukřižoval je as the one we of course is talking you know we. <laughs> Roman rule over Jerusalem, which in Czech context, of course, was Austria versus Bohemia. Then yeah, Pilot Pontius is, of course, prominently mentioned. And uh, again, he is on the hill of Golgotha. So Borges was probably right. <laughs> you cannot, uh, how's it, uh, right, a big coat. You cannot, you cannot avoid it. So you can see basically. The first volume, as you know, Via Schweik's Via Dolores, yeah, the uh, station of the cross, police headquarters, the regional criminal called the asylum, and so on, so on. So, you know, we can read it this way. Uh, of course, what's, what's, what's more apropos for my talk is the uh, Jesus is what I call nostalgia and enigma of his identity. Yeah? Uh, Christ wants to come back, and not only once, as we know rather well, I'm still waiting for the second coming, so <laughs> it's this kind of a coming, always coming back, and uh, he tells you, according to John, in a little while, correct, Maličko, ne uzvišnje, opet Maličko, uzvišnje, ja, it's in English, so what is really kind of a crazy is that Schweig quotes this, <laughs> he calls it, but he reverses it. You know, when, <laughs> when, when he talks to 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 Duba, I guess you said, we will see each other again. He says, and he says, little bit, and you will see me, and a little bit you won't, which is of course the reversal. What is, and what is funny is that a parrot actually put it in a proper order. <laughs> he calls it the Bible, not straight. Yeah. So. Uh, and of course, the who is Christ? Yeah, he is, and he like calls Paul. Is he God? Is he human? And in our Bible, being a polyperspective narrative, is not very, anyway, it's pretty vague. If you read Mark, in Mark, he is not aware of his godly nature, it only from the end. In John, of course, he knows it from the very beginning, but the ambiguity is there. Yeah, it's obviously the beautiful. Of Bible that you don't know. All right, so this is for, and you can you can play this parallel further. Yeah, you can speak about these uh, Schweikian monologues. It reminds me of it's basically like you know parable of Christ. Yeah, you, you see something and you provide a story which elucidates it. Of course, it's more <laughs> a parody than, than parable, but yeah, it's it, this is this is striking. 
Of course, uh, now moving to uh, Odyssea, which is kind of a more apropos, uh, it's, you know, Schweiz Odyssey begins a new, a new under the arm of us, escort of two soldiers. This is when he's coming down from Strahov crossing the Charles Bridge to what Carlin, I guess, yeah. Of course, uh, Odyssey was quite a, quite a popular genre after World War I, yeah. uh, because it was the, you know, the return of the Czechoslovak regions from Russia via Japan and the United States was pretty very. And of course, Schweik knew these people rather well. It was their kind of a colleague for a while. So I just brought two examples of the uh, post-war Czech, Czech or Czechoslovak policies. This is one by Vanek, the other by Zeman. And this Vanek is actually quite interesting. There are quite, quite a few motifs which appear also in in, in Shvek, you know, being arrested in Austria, being arrested by Austrian army as a Russian spy. My name was a Russian spy. <laughs> but it reminds me a little bit of you know this this this, this story of, of Schweig being arrested or arrested by his own troops. So uh, I'm sorry, I oh yeah. So here are uh, it's kind of a made parallels between Schweig and Odyssey. Yeah? What well, is Schweig's impact? Yeah? He's nearly lost. Ireland is most likely a part of the <laughs> What is interesting, of course, is that the, the Andres of this pub now is, is very proleptic. <laughs> it speaks about the future. <laughs> I, I didn't know why it's called Daboishti. I, I checked, I googled it out. That there was 12th century battle. <laughs> so it, it sucked to that place. But it's, it's a really funny that we have And at the very beginning, you have the promise of what will happen. His domicile, however, is obfuscated. Yeah? Mm -hmm. He says, Unas, Narohu, Daboishti, at Katerinska, Sri. Which is impossible because they are parallel. <laughs> so, and I should get to know. I, I knew it because I, I was in a hospital, there was a hospital there. And I remember I had the surgery of my knee. And so, before the surgery, I could walk out. So, I spent some time at the pub. <laughs> and Catherine Sarah and I are not, are not parallel. Uh, you can speak about two policies, okay? the small ones. Because the circularity of the country starts on that, he passes and comes back. Yeah, uh, the is a vicious circle, it is called a certain moment. Yeah, so the, these are kind of a small Odysseys, you can call it a way, it's a little bit of a kind of agree, but you know, why not? And but the, the big one is interesting. Yeah, uh, Bohum will ask how the book will end, and there is an implied ending. Yeah. When Schweig said goodbye to Odisha, he said, when the war, war is over, come and see me now at six o'clock. Winkley. That's so, all. Um, so it was among the Czech emigrants. It kind of took up. It was, you know, she was looking for occupation. She was looking for occupation. The invasion, you know, me that. And, and, and the chalice, yes. Yeah? So this is kind of a, the one way of looking at it, yeah, the circularity. But of course, the figure of policy is very, very shaky, and <laughs> good people obviously well, usually don't speak about it way. Right? Yeah, he's the, the world literature of the first but the dodger who tried to get out because he was apparently mad, yeah. The, uh, taking madness, yoking a horse and arms to his plow and so he sold on, on the beach and so on. So he pretended to be mad, however, he didn't succeed in that drafting. And of course, he's totally slippery character. And I, I just selected uh, you know, men of many turns as the first line in Homer. I, I read it. I know, 50 years <laughs> after 50 years again, it's a funny book. <laughs> and adaptable to circumstances, polytropos, clever, resourceful, smooth talking, <laughs> not exactly a conventional Homeric hero in the local activities. Yeah? 
his qualities were forcefulness, courage, and so on. So he's the first, you know, remembered his own the heroic death. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of also funny. So uh, Horheimer and uh, Adorno in the famous dialectics of Enlightenment actually speaks about the ambiguity of what is his character. I said, he said, I spun Verschlagen werden und Verschlagen up and cunning. Uh, it's kind of in English, it doesn't sound so good. Uh, but in Czech, I would probably translate it Hnani a Prohodani. Hnani osudem, chased by the pain and Prohodani, tricky, uh, cunning. Yeah. He's forsaken, but determined to survive on his path of flight. He must be flexible and opportunistic to accommodate himself to the most difficult or different situations. Then here I kind of sum up and you know to show the ambiguity of, of, of uh, Odysseus, I sum up about three completely different readings. Uh, one is from Horkheimer and Darno, Adorno, the narratives of enlightenment. They're basically uh, for reasons which are beyond me. Uh, Adorno and Horkheimer see him as the prototype of the bourgeois individual. Yeah? Basically, the cunning they uh, interpret as kind of an instrumental reasoning. Yeah? Basically, uh, cunning is like an exchange in, in, in which everything is done correctly and the contract is fulfilled, yet the other <laughs> part has cheated. Uh, English here will be defined print. <laughs> the other part doesn't really define print. So, uh, and he kind of speaks about the adaptation of bourgeois reason to any unreason which confronts it as a stronger power. Yeah. And the polyphemus uh, is a simpleton. He's not aware of the duality of every name. On the one hand, of course, an index naming very specific individual. On the other hand, of course, a lexical item charged with meaning. Yeah? If Odysseus he calls himself nobody. Yeah? He, he saves himself by making himself, himself disappear. Yeah? He, he, he asks him what name, he said nobody. Yeah? On the other hand, you can look at it completely different. Yeah? This is from John Paradotto. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a, what he calls the uh, arbitrary narrative, yeah. Uh, it puzzles the audience uh, and it requires some uh, motivation, but it is not uh, provided, yeah. Uh, when asked about his identity, or the seal said, My you speak, he should say nobody. But why did he say nobody? I will mm -hmm. say Ivan Ivanovich <laughs> or any other the name. <laughs> so <laughs> Well, he could not, I mean, logically speaking, he could not know the end of the story. <laughs> and of course, uh, even the name of Polyphemus uh, contributes to this confusion because apparently, I don't know, it's Greek to me. <laughs> Polyphemus apparently means much speaking. And after other uh, cycle of scholars, uh, you know, asking what's going on, uh, they call him, you know, Bullshit, the most speaking, loquacious <laughs> man to use a gentle expression. So, you know, the, the, the play on the, the, uh, on the uh, game on the uh, game, uh, you know, playing with the name, the proper name is both ways. It's Polyphemus and also the nobody. Yeah? And, you know, the guy is the Peralotto. Uh, you know, he's basically the uh, Homer needs the name for the climax, climax of the story. So it's it's purely, 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 at, at least according to uh, to this man, it, it is cunning as his best, a story about cunning achieved through cunning, but who is being cheated are the readers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another reading, I mean, uh, secondary literature about Homer, I mean, I have, it's a life project to read it. So this kind of struck my fancy, yeah? He is not rational, but he is pious. And this is the episode uh, the, on the island of 
Trinakia, and remember they were hungry. Uh, they landed at this island, and Odysseus was warned by Kirke not to touch the cows, yeah, because they belong to Helios, the symbol of sun. Yeah, so he told his crew, keep your cotton chicken fingers away from those cows. They, of course, did not listen. Yeah, so this guy, Mr. Dobbs, is using the game theory <laughs> to analyze how rational, what would be the rational behavior if they were kind of a cunning rationalist. Yeah, of course, he says the dominant strategy is to violate the sacred cows because in the moment, yeah. You don't know, it's better to peace, start free, and then if the gods punish you, die quickly <laughs> at the sea. This is a kind of a more economic way of going than to <laughs> slow death by starvation. So, yeah, the guys who devoured the cows uh, died, ships, gods, kind of a uh, uh, were in cahoots with Helios, they sank the ship, and all men who feast on the cows die, but only pious Odysseus is spared. So, a good strategy is to obey the gods, not your reason. This is the <laughs> argument of Mr. Dobbs. Now, there is another kind of a slippery character for which I'm not going to speak much. Actually, Hannah Geithman. Uh, spoke about it in a great length. Uh, it is not mentioned in the text, but of course, uh, you know, as we the picaresque novel and so on, it's, it's, it's obvious. Of course, the, the, the Don Quixote is equally puzzling figure. Yeah, I, in the Swedish, I mean, the Spanish psychiatrists have a ball actually <laughs> analyzing this, his, his, his uh, mental. Efficiency, monomania, chronic parallel partial system, the rhythm of the expensive type, the megalomaniac form of philanthropic variety, uh, dramatic experience of aging. We got this well, so, so there are all, you know, a whole bunch of these mental diseases. On the other hand, of course, you have rather prominent thinkers who loved Don Quixote, Carl, Carl Schmidt, yeah. As a totally good and noble person, despite all of his, all of his ridiculousness. And of course, you know, Muno wrote the mom of the book about Don Quixote, where he kind of praise him to the hilt. He embodies the paradox of idealism to change the world, must be able to reimagine it. And this is what apparently Don Quixote does. So, going further. Uh, I kind of a switch from these noble characters to some a technician or a technician to Shklovsky. And Shklovsky actually wrote an interesting, it's a badly written, actually, very difficult to read, but it's an influential piece. Kak, Jelan, Don Kiko. And basically, what he says that, you know, he is shifting. He starts as a simpleton, and at the end, kind of a, he became a sage. Uh, a fountainhead of bookish wisdom during the book one with more and more refined subjects. Yeah? So Shkowski reads this arch partial speeches and he basically concludes that the characteristics of Don Quixote are, are not important yeah? because this figure is just a poetic device. He's a copula concatenating heterogeneous material dictionaries, uh, famous quote, blah, 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 Cervantes. Uh, and the plot is constantly interrupted by many inserted stories connected only because they are told by Don Quixote or because he participates in them. Yeah? So Don Quixote's identity shifts according to the requirements of a given segment. So taking this Shkovskian insight, you know, it's in English on the theory of prose, you can it actually online. Uh, yeah. So uh, I kind of try to come up with something more general, and I see the fortunes of Soldier's Way as an episodic novel. I coined this term. I don't know whether it is the best way to describe it. But what is characteristic or what is important for such, such, a, such a novel 
that the parts are more important than the whole. The whole kind of way doesn't have an ending, and yet uh, we read it. It's a great pleasure. The other focus, as Bovill pointed out, is you know, it was a shake, but the focus because he brings these fragments together, he makes it glue together. There are the heterogeneous episodes which take place in many different and highly unusual, exotic almost uh, locations. The Schweik is always on the move, but his trajectory is not purpose, and he's moving anywhere in a, <laughs> what I call the presetic motion, a Brownian, Brownian <laughs> motion, yeah? It is the arbitrary decision by the authorities which collide is the capriciousness of the main protagonist. Yeah, so basically there is this clash and he moves absolutely chaotically. And the plot is, needless to say, is literally interested, interspersed with mini stories narrated by Schweig. And of course, what is interesting about these mini stories, I know one or it reminds me of, and these mini stories are very often not Rarely apropos the given context, and kind of they are, they are weird. They kind of the parallels is, is are unusual to put it mildly. And the identity of Jose Schweik's flux and uh, his characteristic and the contradictory depending on the function he serves in the given moment. He must be a versatile man of many firms. And I have kind of a few examples of, yeah. Oh, it's a, this is one aspect of it. The next aspect of why it is so, so contradictory is that fortunes is a palimpsest. And this is, I knew on Georgia's article. Yeah, basically there are three previous texts according to Georgia on which uh, uh Hashem was drawing. Yeah, he wrote it, you know, at all impromptu. He was uh, never had any conspect, it's nothing. So uh, the first is the sequence of stories, the good soldier way before the war from 1911, in which according to yeah, he's conceived as an upset enthusiast over zealously following orders leading to observe situation and what is striking about this character in this uh, cycle is the this equanimity yeah he is facing many punishments and the, the authorities cannot make him much he does care the second which according to Georgia is the closest to the real shape is really the good solution in captivity published in here in 1917 and here she is a mouthpiece of anti Austrian and anti German propaganda. What is interesting, of course, asking the question how Schweig would end. Apparently, <laughs> according to this version, he goes AWOL and joins the Czech regions in Russia. It was published in here, 1917, makes sense. It was kind of a part of the supporting the war effort or liberation effort. And of course, this is kind of a more tricky, but Goleshaw claims that Bugulma cycle actually also is kind of a link to Luzkoje Schweig. Yeah? Uh, he says that it is Schweig turned upside down, transformed from a victim of power into a representative of power. But there is kind of a two types of power. Yeah? There is the uh, regiment commander Yerakimov, who is kind of a, the true Revolutionary and then Kamrat Kalaji Gashek, who is kind of a deep, what we call a humanist. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it reminds me a bit of, actually, it would be also interesting to, to follow a little bit of uh, Babi. Yeah? The Babi, you know, the, 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 the humanistic writer facing the revolutionary terror. How do you do it? Yeah? So this, is, this would be kind of a good paper, I guess. So these are apparently three. Uh, uh, kind of a prototype from which uh, Hashek pulls details, pulls some motifs and so on, and put them together. So, because they are three different texts, they can be contradictory. Yeah? So, the episodicity of epi episodicity of the of the novel and this kind of a palimpsest-like character makes Schweig so 
difficult to grasp. I have three weapons in some kind of areas, which they might have to be uh, economic. So there are two, uh, three examples of, you know, kind of a puzzling contradictory <laughs> trade and sex. <laughs> it is never mentioned, only twice. Yes. Am I right? Does is sex mentioned more time? More yes. time. It's not an <laughs> novel. <laughs> <laughs> this, this sounds quite yeah. graphic to me, the second. Yeah. <laughs> well, on the one hand, of course, <laughs> he is kind of a the, the, uh, naive man in love who professes the you know love to his to Carla Vecoa. <laughs> I like it. I love you about as much as a child in my ass because you are such an idiot. This was a very difficult item to find in Czech. It's a pastero. <laughs> it's a product when you, when, you, when you process linen. It's a wooden, wooden, wooden particle. And I, a lot, a lot of time I spent finding the, <laughs> the English, English uh, equivalent, apparently shy is what Master is. Also, it's Ossina is used mm. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. But Master is, and it's even more, being a Czech, I, I what is Master I ask myself. <laughs> Master in code. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is one kind of a, the, the romantic lover crashed by Google. Uh, about unrequited life of uh, love of Mrs. Veklova or Miss Veklova. And then, of course, you have this rather, rather <laughs> pornographic <laughs> encounter between Schweik and the lover to be of uh, uh, Lieutenant Lukas, who basically he performs his sexual duties rather, how to put it, forcefully. Uh, Homer, Homeric <laughs> So it, it's strange, yeah, it's strange. Uh, you know, innocent lover and uh, you put it a uh, bang. <laughs> so the other one is the video with Skarnavas. Yeah? It is introduced as this, this, this uh, uh, anabasis, yeah, anabasis, and uh, you know, xenophon, kind of a march without any night. Like, he did not know. He, you know, Asia Minor, it was Greek to him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he had to march forward. On the other hand, if you read Schwenk suddenly, when he's trying to steal the dog, if you recall, uh, he is buttering up the lady who is guarding, uh, guarding the dog, and he's uh, you, you kind of sympathize with her. I'm not from Prague, too. And uh, I'm from Bodnani, she says, and then we are not far away from each other on such way. I am from Protivi. This knowledge of the topography of South Bohemia, which Schweik acquired during the Monevus, yeah, he was there before on the military exercise. So he definitely had to know just Gabudio without the southern Bohemia. And even worse, yeah, he is telling the story and years ago in. Our Budiovice, Unas Budiovice, a cattle deal called Vekislav Ludwig. And so, so basically, the story is very long. There's so five or six different names that deal there. So it would, at least to me, imply some personal equators. And so, Unas Budiovice is strange. I mean, how could Guy get, go to Milesko? <laughs> if he was from just a Budiovice? So that's kind of like beyond. Believe. And the third one, uh, Schweik's, Schweik and the Habsburgs. Here, the famous first sentence of the novel, and he's kind of a puzzle who is Ferdinand. A few pages later, <laughs> in the past, he tells you the genealogy of Habsburg coming to the last, I mean, obscure figure like Jan Ork. I still don't know how he was related to if somebody to tell me. It's always listed as the relative of, do you know how was he? Jan Ork was? Or? Yeah. 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 Who? He was, he was I, I, I know, but uh, what was the relation? A cousin? Mm. Nobody knows. I, 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 <laughs> I can't find it. But he was the prince of Bohemia. Yeah. He was late. He, uh, in a bloody, yeah, it was already that. 
Yeah, well, that's, that's still Neo Shiva. Yeah. And so he, 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 excuse me. He was a close relative of Mount Sinai. That's uh, yeah. yes, everybody says, but yeah. what was the relationship? That's uh, what I'm I, I don't know. I couldn't find it. I really tried. It was more difficult than shy. <laughs> I love Google. <laughs> so here you have kind of somebody who is absolutely puzzled by uh, name, Ferdinand, and somebody who knows, you know, the genealogy of the, the, the Habsburg family of the glass. You know, so it's, you know, and these are just simple, simple examples. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure that others can be fine too. So, all right. That's all. <laughs> <laughs>
And this, what, what Schlossky is writing about is a Picaresque novel or a certain kind, but that's a kind of a standard, like if you look at Grimmelshausen in, in German literature and so on and so on. So this is traditionally labeled as Picaresque, and the main idea is exactly what, what Schlossky is. It's, no, no, no. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's an all of scenes or episodes in your sense, of course. Yeah. As, as, as. Jakobson would say, call it Ivan Ivanovich, got to define it. <laughs> so, yeah. sure, I mean, yeah. I, I said provisionally, yeah. it's a, you know, like, think that as a certain connotation, saying, I don't know, it's just a lot of many masks. Yeah, all right, I mean, I, I pointed out that there that is this big nice aspect of it, I call it episodic, not how you don't, you know, attach much value to the term, that the function of designation for the stock. And yes, I, I, I thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I my comment is about Adorno and Horkheimer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, so you you quoted uh, that part about this is and nobody. Uh, but I, I remember from that part of the, the phrase that that this is calls himself a, a better Nobody in order to survive. Yes. So, so becoming nobody yes. is the only way of survival. And that's exactly what we see in Shri. Yeah, yeah, I know you I definitely brought this, this aspect forward. Yeah, the cleverness of, I call him man of many turns, which is the best line from Homer. Yeah. <laughs> but then what you mean, yeah. sort of self erasure, yeah. Yeah, the, the erasure of, of anything distinct is, is what, what uh, is a part of this truth. That's true, but this is not done linguistically like in, in Homer. Yeah, no, not in Homer, but, yeah. but in Wednesday. Yeah, he's kind of Mr. Nobody, though. And shy and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to connect this with what you were saying, Peter. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I'm, a, I think, a weird idea that we <laughs> at the beginning of the <laughs> uh, because the issues using science and technology during the sirens episode, and they find this really ugly, mean, and similarly, iron age of civilization. But for people who work on American modernism, there is the way Ezra Pound, for instance, uses the issues a man uh, with no name, a man with a name to come. So the anonymous hero. Of the modernist epic, it is therefore important to see sort of almost anonymous hero goes, let's say, to K or Kafka, mm -hmm. then to the traditional heroes of uh, romance and so on. So, how so that we identified with Odysseus as Utis? So, Utis is not chosen at random, it is just another pronunciation. Of Odysseus mm -hmm. and the name Odysseus is a Cretan name originally, a place where everybody is a liar, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the claim is the way. <laughs> so, Odysseus is a man who lied by telling the truth, telling the truth by telling a lie. Uh, you, you, you have that. But quasi and anonymous and closer to the sailors who die. Well, I, I, I mean, uh, of course, I'm not uh, for, for uh, I don't know, I'm not looking for the beginning of this Buddha mentality, and they strange thing out. In the Homer, but of course, modernism is uh, something that is uh, iron cage, civilization, uh, instrumentality. Yeah. All the I like mean, the Lucas. Please. No, I like this. I like this discussion very much. Um, yeah, so I, I, I agree. I, I mean, that's sort of my reading of Shane Cities and that the qualities are a hero and a character is a version of this genre epic hero. Um, I wanted to connect that with 
uh, I didn't go to any sex, which uh, <laughs> we've actually done. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that I'm really interested in, actually. Uh, so this is well, what are, <laughs> there are pictures of Hashi, oh, like, there are pictures of Hashi cross-dressing. Like, there, there's this essay, like, how would that speak with Hashi? Yeah. There's a lot of intimacy. Yeah. Uh, inter, interspecies intimacy, oh, dear. intimacy between people of the same sex. There's a lot of rather strange uh like the gender mm -hmm. and sexuality in Hashi. I think maybe one of the reasons that we have trouble finding it is because we're looking for it in terms that might be quite appropriate to this idea of a, a hero without any particular identity, right? And you have like an like, <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not necessarily binary. There is a sort of like general sexual play in the novel. A lot of the jokes are kind of dependent on uh, assumption of sexuality in the background, like being yeah. your like, like it's there. Tell me or study man. Yeah, you know, the in that whole anecdote, which goes on and on and on, Pinyar is just constantly being like raised up and raised up until the first one. The point is, the first one she marries back is the big girl, though. Right. And then that's the end of Pinyar, right? And then, and the whole joke is that, like, we're actually talking about sex or doing some kind of like almost like masturbatory anecdote telling which involves these like links between the men and the right so there's a lot of sexuality in the novel and i think i will be sexual sex yeah right. okay and in some ways i'm what i'm saying i'm sexual identity yeah i mean for all yeah yeah i think it would be asexual yeah yeah i don't think we need to what i'm saying is you don't need to define sex and Heteronormative binary penetrative term. Oh, it's not the same. I call it American law. It's not the same. Clinton, 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 also, we find that a strange community of men, and it's basically the bombing, I guess. I mean, in the army, no women, but <laughs> <laughs> so we you know, have this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very just to go back to what Pascal was saying, we did a musical term that Beckett launched the pseudo couple and mm -hmm. to talk about Lukash and Craig mm -hmm. as a sort of made pseudo couple, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily for Beckett entail actual sexuality, but the sexual link. Artworks, yeah, yeah. Artworks, yeah. 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 I mean, no, I, I think there was more. Technicalize the idea of that we basically are on the novels and all the mates. He wrote it in a such a not even go away. I mean, he yeah. had to rely on his memories, rely on what he owned before, he put it together, and now we are kind of professionally trying to make sense out of this. And that was basically the point I was trying to make. I made it wrong. Science and politicians <laughs> overcoming errors and, and establishing the act of good so they get congrats. <laughs> uh, Peter Stewart's just the Stewart's. I think it can take my time, and of course, I'm speaking. Thank you. All right then, uh, zooming right along, we start with different innovation. All right. So I am happy to uh, introduce our final speaker of the morning. Daniel W. Pratt is Assistant Professor of Slavic Languages at McGill University in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. He works on Central European culture, broadly considered, including Czech, Polish, Austrian, and Hungarian literature and culture. 
his first book, uh, Now Under Consideration at Northwestern University Press, uh, examines the development of non-narrative constructions of temporality. He's currently working on two additional projects, one on the socialist construction of world literature and the other on the so-called second generation descent. And I'm also very happy to announce that Daniel will be here at Columbia next fall as the uh, Ishpan Bayak visiting professor of Central European Studies. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, and, and it's actually also wonderful that I get to follow up on these previous two talks. Uh, you did incredibly well by putting this all together, uh, and, and I, I hope that I won't really do too much repetition, and so I might have to uh, extemporate a little bit more than I had planned on, uh, because I will be going over some of the same ground, but I'm going to be making a somewhat different argument at the end of the day about how all of this works. Um, so this actually does come out of this first book project, and so this is one of the reasons why I'm focused on history here, and I'll get into that a little bit as I, as I go along. Um, but although we have this book that would eventually become one of the most widely known books in the Czech canon, uh, the Gujulte Schweig had a somewhat rocky reception at the beginning uh, of, of its days, and especially in the first years after publication. In his essay on the novel, Ivan Albrecht cites the publisher Edward Weinfurter, who refused to publish the text, writing, we will not work with such vulgar literature <laughs> that it has as its aim to raise a nation of ruffians and louts instead of intelligent men. This is literature only for communists and not for a <laughs> Czech person. And, and I love this because in a lot of ways, it, it really does have as its aim to raise a nation of ruffians and louts. Uh, but the thrust of this uh, critique is that this lies in a problematic depiction of the Czechoslovak person, of the Czechoslovak nation. And this is one that's just making its name on the world stage. And on the one hand, Hasek here gets lauded for creating a character that becomes so well known across the world. But on the other hand, he is criticized for making that character Schick. <laughs> uh, and, and it's hardly the type of person that most nations would like to have as their standard bearer. And, and I think Weinfurter actually has a bit of a point here. Schick is not a good character for cracking a strong image of a good Czech or of the good Czech nation. Uh, Schweig's growing popularity caused all the more anxiety at the time because Thomas Gottlieb Masaryk and Edward Benesch were concurrently hard at work crafting an image of Czechoslovakia for both domestic and international consumption in order to assure the stability of the new country. According to Andrea Orzov, Masaryk himself crafted something of a leader cult, quote, intended to integrate Czechoslovakia's diverse nationalities and to legitimate the young state. And it can constitute a central element of Czechoslovak's <laughs> national myth. So Masaryk portrayed himself as the kindly paternal figure, the Tatichek, who rose from humble origins, both Czech and Slovak, no less, uh, only to become the great philosopher and then the president of the new state. Along with this image of the good king, the reference, of course, back to Václav I, once again, according to Andrea Orzov, the Masaryk cult rested at least impartial on the correlated cult of the Czechoslovak legionnaires and their brave national service during the Great War. The legionnaires, of course, here are something and Peter just brought up, uh, and the promotion of the new Czech state relied upon these two pillars of the Czechoslovak Legion and the cult of Masaryk. But Schweik's presence as a world-renowned figure, known for his cunning idiocy, vulgar sayings, and antipathy towards authority, hardly squared with this image that Masaryk, the Masaryk regime, was trying to advertise, both at home and abroad, particularly since Schweik was created by someone who'd been a part of those legions. So with the efforts to create a new national image in the background, it may be tempting to pass off Hasek's novel as nothing but a mocking collection of incidents and stories during the First World War, an ephemeral, satirical take on the twilight of the Habsburg Empire. But what I want to argue today is that actually Hasek set his sights far higher than merely a rebuke of either the new Masoretic regime or the old Habsburg one. Not only did he reject the historical narrative being constructed by Masoretic and the old Habsburg constructions, but I think he rejects historical narratives as such. For Hasek, history itself must be non-narrative. And because any narrativizing of the historical project results in abstraction, a move away from the direct lived experience. I think Hasek ultimately rejects any abstraction as he rejects any narrativizing above the immediately local. In doing so, he rejects the kind of historical narrativizing that results in imagined community. And instead, he focuses on the kind of storytelling that creates 
community through the act of storytelling itself. In other words, through the event of storytelling. And this is just something I'll come back to at the end. I think Hajek uh, uh, sets these higher stakes from the very beginning of the text. And here I'm going to do just like uh, Bovemil did, and I'm going to look at the preface. And this time I'm actually going to look at it in, uh, in entirety, because I think it's actually worth reading and talking about. So great times call for uh, great men. There are unknown heroes who are modest with none of the historical glamour of a Napoleon. If you analyze their character, you would find that it eclipsed even the glory of Alexander the Great. Today, you can meet in the streets of, of Prague a shabbily dressed man who is not even himself aware of the significance in the history of the great new era. He goes modestly on his way without bothering anyone, nor is he bothered by journalists asking for an interview. If you asked of his name, he would answer you simply and unassumingly, I am Sheikh. And this quiet, unassuming, shabbily dressed man is indeed that heroic and valiant good old soldier Sheikh. In Austrian times, his name was once on the lips of all the citizens of the Kingdom of Bohemia and the Republic his glory will not fade either. I am very fond of the good soldier's fate, and relating his adventure during the World War, I am convinced that this modest, anonymous hero will win the sympathy of you all. Unlike that stupid fellow Herostratus, he did not set fire to the temple of the goddess in Ephesus just to get himself into the newspapers and school books. And that is enough. And so I wanted to bring up this entire thing for a few reasons. First of all, is to think about the historical figures that uh, uh, Hasek is using to book in this selection. He begins with Napoleon and Alexander the Great. And these are the founding fathers of what we can call great man theory. These kind of great figures of the historical time period. Uh, we can think about these in the sort of classic kind of Hegelian understanding of you know, great men of history here, who are the, the figures that will kind of rise above and push history forward themselves. And, and to compare Sheikh to them as the shabbily dressed man who is not even himself aware of his own significance, uh, this betrays an ironic view, at least, at the very least, of this grand historical narrative. So Hashik is already kind of ironizing the status of the great figures of history. But then at the end, I think this is where Hashik was the bigger son. Because by using this comparison to Herostratus, who, if you remember, was the one who burnt the, the temple of Athena in Ephesus, just so that he would get into the history books. And then of course, his name was banned in order to be punished for doing this one thing. <laughs> and, and of course, I am now uh, disobeying the general rule. We're not actually supposed to talk about Herostratus because he did this and we don't want him to actually be in the hero, uh, history books for doing this heretical arson. Um, but nonetheless, we sort of have to talk about him. But I think what he's doing here in comparing Sheikh to both Herostratus on the one hand and to Alexander the Great and Napoleon on the other, is that Hashik is making an equivalence between Herostratus and Napoleon and Alexander the Great. That actually, Napoleon and Alexander the Great are not great men, but merely people who desire to burn the world in order to get into the history books. <laughs> and so instead of acknowledging there being an idea of great men, he's actually undermining the very foundations of that theory, of this idea of how we understand the historical narrative itself. And that is actually what makes Schweig such a great figure. Now, Schweig's characterization as a hero in the Czech context, I think, is the first of Hajek's interventions into the historical narrative. Instead of privileging generals, revolutionaries, or heroic soldiers, he picks a drunken lout with an idiotic smile as protagonist. If we were to tell the story of the First World War and forgetting about Schweig himself, such figures would be, quote unquote, insignificant details in the larger narrative. And this is in the terms of Arthur Danto's philosophy of history. <laughs> now, in his seminal work, Analytic Philosophy of History, Danto claims that history is, quote, expressed in significant narratives. Each part relies on earlier elements to tell the story that has, quote, unquote, significance through its pragmatic, theoretical, consequential, or revelatory structure. The history that contains only those elements which develop the story creates a unified whole. Each narrative would ideally want to include only those things relevant to some other event or significant to them. The quality, according to Dan, of a historical narrative then relies on the amount of insignificant detail that is excluded. According to Dante's rubric, Schweig would be excluded. <laughs> and so here, what we have is somebody, and in fact, an entire novel that would be excluded from a Dantoian understanding of the historical narrative itself. Now, uh, John Gat Ritter in his article on Schweig kind of recalls something of this. And we've, we've sort of already touched on this idea of the big history versus small history in, 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 in Bohemil's uh, talk here. 
Uh, but John uh, uh, Gatrider calls this this distinction between the macro of historical, which we can think of as the sort of Dantonian understanding of this, versus a micro historical, which is the sort of the more local element. And from the very beginning, according to Gatrider, at least, we can see the way that the macro historical moments, like that of the assassination of Ferdinand, affect the micro historical realm of Sheikh's lived experience. So here we have the kind of macro historical intrusion upon the lower micro historical element. And although these macro historical forces interfere uh, with the experiences of Sheikh and his ill, the major focus of the novel is not on that macro history. So if we think about the plot as the way that Bolmiel was talking about this, as this sort of larger thing in the background here, this is this macro historical element. But we never actually get that story. That story is just assumed that we know it. We, if you were to try to understand the First World War through Sheikh, <laughs> Like, well, what information will we actually get? We get almost nothing. So instead, we have this very, very different understanding of how the world actually works here. So the novel rejects the standard narrative forms of the war genre, of showing how the microhistorical plays out, and instead, it, so the macrohistorical, and instead turns the exam, unexamined, excluded activities of the era. Thus, according to Gat Rutter, uh, microhistory subverts the rules and effects of conventional uh, historical or narrative discourse. Indeed, he argues, the transvaluation of macro history and micro history is central to Hoshik's intent. But I think Gat Rutter stops short of Hoshik's full audaciousness. He argues that we are bound to look for a meta history in the book, alleging that there is an overarching narrative, such as the movement from the political structure of the Habsburg state towards a new potentiality of populist solidarity and the embedded narratives as a movement away from history as negative experience of the past towards history as forward-looking project for the future. This utopian prognosis of what Hashek would have done with the book shows Gat Runner's insistence on a narrative scope to it. Instead of allowing Hashek's novel to completely oppose the narrative construction of history, he forces an overarching narrative on it. And this is actually why I like the way that Bolton put this is that we have these tracks leading off, but we have no idea. It's an, maybe it's an optical illusion here whether they actually meet or not. And then instead of having to impose that meeting point on it, we have that openness that actually, so it's very, very radical at the end of the day. And I think that Hashek had no intention of creating an overarching narrative. I think he directly confronts the his, official histories of the war by including two battalion historians in the novel. The first, Kenneth Adolf Bigler, has a list of titles for proposed histories of the war, including, I think, did I put this on here or not? No, I didn't, sorry. He calls them the, uh, and, and this is the sort of a longer quote here, the characters of the warriors of the Great War. Who began the war? The policy of Aust Austria-Hungary and the origin of the World War. The glorious day of Austria-Hungary. <laughs> Who will be victorious? <laughs> our offers and our men. Memorial acts of my soldiers from the times of the Great War. On the turmoil of battle, the book of Austro-Hungarian heroes, days of battles, days of victory, victory or death, <laughs> our heroes in captivity. And these are all a, a book title that he's proposing here to, to talk about what the war is going to be about. And all of these contain elements of what we could actually see as historical genres from the work of Aiden White and his work in meta history, all aimed at showing the great history of Austro-Hungary during the First World War. And Hasha Q is pointing to how even in, in media rests, the historian can find the expected outcome, the expected genre in which to understand the events. So in other words, our, our, our historian here is looking at what's going on. He expects Austria-Hungary to be victorious here. And so he's already deciding on what genre to tell the story of the war in. And it's that genre application, and this is what Aiden White argues, is that we're always already applying a genre to this historical narrative. That he, this is why he argues that it ultimately is a fiction making activity. And these give the act actions of the Austro Hungarian army members a type of meaning, but it is clearly approached cynically. Uh, and, and here I might actually say, is it kinically, right? <laughs> to, to make a reference both to, to, to Mark and Peter here? Um, Beagler, the historian, has no desire to stay close to the truth of the events, but rather to place the events into a ready made narrative to describe the heroism of the Austro Hungarian army. The narrative has become more important than the real events on the ground. But Beagler is not the one in control of the story. Hashik will not let him have his narrative. 
And, and he takes a bit of revenge on poor Beagler here <laughs> because Beagler ends up with drinking induced diarrhea that is mistaken for cholera. <laughs> and Beagler gets a rude awakening in the hospital, seeing how for the first time people died of cholera for his imperial majesty. <laughs> his mighty histories and dreams of battlefield victory die with him in the hospital. And this is Hashik's revenge for having the gall to write a soaring history of the war itself. What we see here is that Hashik doesn't just portray historians in the same way. He relates the same type of narrativization to all institutions, from the states to the churches, as cynically placing their grand narratives over the experiences of the individual. After being imprisoned himself, Sheik issues some words of comfort to his fellow inmates, assuring them that what we have got the police for, except to punish us for talking out of turn. If the times are so dangerous that archdukes get shot, no one should be surprised if he's carried off to police headquarters. They're doing all this to make a splash so that Ferdinand can have some publicity for his funeral. Of course, he mends this long monologue on the topic of punishment. You have to have some horror to make the morning worthwhile. <laughs> and so what happens here is that the narrative of the morning, the narrative of the, uh, the problem of an archduke getting killed means that the response has to live up to that moment. In other words, the narrative of how big the archduke is necessitate the kind of reaction. So here again, we see the way that the, uh, the, the position of the Archduke means that we have to have a commensurate uh, a cabal and, and, and punishment that exists beyond it. So in other words, the narrative here goes far above what is the actual lived experience of the ground. And in this case, as in so many of the novels, the narrative trumps reality. If the Archduke is so important that the only possible outcomes of the assassination are mass imprisonments, reprisals, and ultimately war. If, however, the Archduke were really not that important, then his assassination would be more and more appropriately without the same loss of life and liberty. For the Archduke's position to be assured in perpetuity, the reaction to his assassination must be swift and great, or else it proves that his position was not actually all that great. In other words, the proof of our student's position only occurs in what his death sets off and the way that his death becomes a part of this larger narrative, not because of any inherent value to his person or the truth of his assassination. The plot for such major figures must be major because otherwise it would show that the figure is not, well, major. <laughs> now, despite Tashik's fondness for checks in the novel, we can see actually a number of situations where he kind of lets sort of Germans, Hungarians, and so on uh, have some real problems in their world. Uh, uh, Tashik actually largely disparages this newly crafted heroes of the interwar period, and in particular, the Czechoslovak Legion that he had once been a part of. In the second section of the novel, Sveik is thrown off the train into in, in Česká Budějovice for pulling the emergency brake, and so he sets out on his uh, foot to find his regiment there. He begins his so-called Anabasis, a reference not only to Xenophon's classic text, but to the Czechoslovak Legion itself. The term Anabasis had been Anabasa, had been replied to the Legion's travels as early as 1919. And Vanek actually has a, a book from 1927 called Anabasa that is about his travels during uh, with the Czech Legion. So this was a term that comes up. And it, it, this, this term actually was, quote, used for propagandistic rather than strategic purposes in trying to glorify the Legion's exploits. So the Anabasa here was actually used in official discourse as a way of showing how great the Czech Legions were. And so Hashik is satirizing these newly appointed heroes by comparing their trek across Siberia to Sheikh's bumbling excursion across the Czech lands, in which he is mostly aided by villagers because they think he's a deserter. I love this, by the act that they think he's a deserter, and this is why they help and so again, it's really undermining this whole idea of this great heroism. Instead of privileging the successes of the burgeoning national mythos surrounding the Czechoslovak Legion, Hajduk displays the local anti-war sentiment in the Czech countryside in order to debunk the legendary martial narrative of the Legion itself. And so I think for Hajduk, there is no heroic purpose to this kind of historical narrative. And there can be no real narrative of history at all. Even in the overarching construction of Hajduk's novel, this is evidence because the narrator's voice becomes more and more distant as the novel moves on. This is one of those things that we, we, we read through it, we start off in that first section, and this, you know, the outside, you know, book into narrative, narrative is much stronger. But as we keep going, that outside narrator gets thinner and thinner and thinner. 
and to become so much more about the stories of Shvek and the other people he meets. You know, we often think about this text as just being Shvek narrated, but there are lots and lots of other characters who tell their stories as well. And this is when we come to a really different construct of how the uh, book actually works. Instead of having any kind of overarching construction, as Scott Ruder would like us to believe, the overarching principle of the novel is precisely that there is no grand narrative at all. And indeed, all narratives ultimately break apart. Instead, the novel, as Kapokatsky has argued, is a peripheral novel for peripheral people. <laughs> or I might add here, and change our terminology a little bit, an anecdotal novel for anecdotal people. And it's with this turn of phrase, I want to shift the terminology from Gat Ratter's uh, uh, microhistory to the anecdote because of how this term works. First of all, the reason I'm using the anecdote here is that we have a kind of nice way of uh, comparing this in, in Czech between Historia and Historica. And this opposition between Historia and Historica, I think is a really important one. Uh, and at the very beginning, Hasek actually uses the term Historia in that um, here, when he's talking about the, the historical uh, greatness of Napoleon, and also the, 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 the figure of history for Schleich, all of this he's using historia. So this is one of the ways that I think he's actually using it, and we can kind of compare this to the historica, which is, you know, different than anecdota, which is more like a joke in Czech, right? But a historica, more like this kind of short, kind of contained story. But the word anecdote, and this is why I want to use it, actually comes from the opposition to history. The etymology of the word anecdote, anecdotos, means something unpublished. And it has its origin as the unpublished things linked to history itself. The first time that it's used is the Emperor Justinian's unpublished memoirs that are eventually published as anecdota. And these are about sort of court rumors and all of this kind of, you know, things that are outside the normal scope of history, things that would be excluded exactly from Dato's construction. Later, they would develop into amusing stories about major historical figures, but they are ones which are left out of the historical narrative, ones that are not shaped into a Leopardian or Conrassi, the grand narrative of history. Even as early as the 13th, 18th century, according to Lionel Grossman, the term anecdote was widely used to designate a species of historical writing that deliberately eschewed large-scale narrativization to borrow Hayden White's useful term. The anecdote may be true, but by ignoring any more than the minimal construction of the narrative, it cannot create history in the larger narrative sense. To put it a different way, the plural of anecdote is not history. I think Hasek is using this anecdotal form not just for the humor of the text, but to show his antagonism towards the narratological understanding of history. As a collection of anecdotes, the novel Schweig is its non-narrative collection of stories that emphasizes the humanity of the small individual in all of his or her petty, small-mindedness. <laughs> in Hasek's worldview, however limited or idiotic a person may be, they do not deserve to be sent to the slaughter. He condemns any allegiance to the ideals, imagined structures, or larger narratives, emphasizing instead the very local and anecdotal experience of the world. By focusing on Schweig, Hasek expresses his derision for the kind of historical narrative. His hero Schweig simply has no significance whatsoever. He fights in no uh, battles over the pages of the novel. And in fact, the only time he's actually in a battlefield is when he's on not Boyish. <laughs> That's it. That's that is the one time we actually see like him reach a battlefield. And I love that that comes at the very beginning of the novel. There's something really wonderfully ironic about this. And his interactions are almost exclusively with other small fellows who do not matter much either. Hasek turns the tables on the historical narrative by focusing on the figures of no importance, but nonetheless making the reader aware of the effects the work has on them. Those who experience the virtues of acting in the name of nation, religion, or general duty are shown to be drunkards, idiots, and fools, with just as many venal drives as the rest of humankind. Hasek's works undermines any abstract motivation for war, depicting his characters in an all-to-human light. I think Schweig's own stories also contribute to the breakdown of narrative constructions. As Karl Lopetsky argues, Schweig himself is, all, uh, is above all speech. Whoops. <laughs> a little quick there. Uh, he is not a character in a novel, and this is where we can come back to what uh, Bolomir was saying, that he is a kind of a narrative principle here. Sheik is the stories he narrates, and that narration alone. 
because we know so little about Shafiq other than the narratives that he spins, the narratives become estranged from the world itself. Shafiq draws attention to the uh, distinction between the stories and reality, forcing the reader to often laugh at the absurdity of the assumed connection between the two. If Shafiq is the preeminent storyteller and we cannot trust him, then no storyteller can be trusted. The form itself is debunked through Shafiq's manipulation of it. But Shake's story also played a different role. And that is of creating a type of community. If Masadek and Benish were right that creating a leader cult surrounding Masadek and making use of the story of the legionnaires could help bind people together, then there is some truth to the fact that stories do bind us, that they have this capability of bringing us together. They can be the shared lore of a group, in the case of folklore, uh, larger historical narratives that we sort of feel like we're participating in uh, or make us feel as a, a particular part of a nation, class, ethnic group, community, or whatever. But part of the admitted difficulty that Masadek faced at the beginning of his political career, career was creating just such a set of stories around which the people of Czechoslovakia had rallied. But these larger historical ones are the ones that shape challenges because they trump the reality on the ground. On the other hand, Shvek creates a type of, and I would argue, anarchist community through the act of storytelling, in which the event of storytelling is more important than the story itself. We see this happen again and again in the novel, when people rally around Shvek, not because of the meaning of his stories, and not because they have any appeal to a rally a higher idea, but because he represents the stories of those left out of the narrative, or left out of the historical understanding that Dr. proposes. And in some ways, this is what binds together the novel itself. It is this act of storytelling that creates a community of stories, that creates a community of those of us that read it, that engage with it. That's actually the community that I think he's trying to create here. And it is one that then comes together in our lived experience. And that is the really important interjection that I think Hashik is actually making here. And again, as an actually good anarchist, strange to say that Hashik was actually a good anarchist, but I think this is one place where it actually works. And so as I see it, Hashik uses the anecdotal form to show as antagonistic to the narratological understanding of history, as well as to create a new sense of community through storytelling. As a collection of anecdotes, Shvek is a non-narrative collection of stories that emphasize the humanity of each individual and all of her pettiness, venality, and small-mindedness. Hashik condemns any allegiance to ideals, imagined structures, or larger narratives, emphasizing instead the very local and anecdotal experience of the world since at least those anecdotes do not justify burning the world to get into the history books. And that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just two points. Uh, one it might be very important for you. Uh, if my memory is still with me, uh, Marek is towards the end uh, named Batalyon's Keshik Shaiva. Yep. And he writes um, the history of the battalion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not only this, and it's a victorious history, and so, uh, it's fully in line with the official, et cetera, et cetera. But importantly, I think he is also telling the, the reader how to write such a history. He says that you cannot write in the first engagement, we won uh, everything and advanced 20 kilometers. In the first engagement, we had great losses. We had to retreat uh, injured uh, soldiers and so on. In the second engagement and so on, mm -hmm. and in the final engagement. So he is telling you, uh, well, the Shrek never tells you how to put an anecdote together. Mm -hmm. He, he fa you facing anecdotes is you, in your terminology, but Marek is, Mark is the anarchist. Uh, he is telling you how to write, uh, how to write a history, and uh, that I think is a meta text, basically. Absolutely. And in that sense, I think it's it's very important. But yeah. the second question, actually, is philological. This introduction is it in the first edition? When did it come in? Because if it is in the first edition. That was that would show that uh, that uh, Hartek had an enormous command over what he was doing, yeah. uh, right. and uh, I would like to see this in, <laughs> because uh, nobody works with the first edition. Everyone works with later editions, uh, book editions, and and so on. 
So it, it might kind of strengthen that's, the, that's that's the, the that position. Uh, it might strengthen the position uh, uh, that Harshak was not just writing nonsense. No, no, no. No, no, no. I meant you know, it's, yes. it's there, it's also in the office. Oh, oh but that's in the office. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, that, that's very important. It's so it's in the first booklet, yeah, uh, yeah. Se so separate that, edition. Uh, um, I, if I have time, so yeah. more, I could even show it to you. But Great, yeah, 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 that's very <laughs> I, I would say, I, that, I, I, I would say yeah. that's very important because he had a yeah. right from the beginning, he yeah. had a conception, and that's wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah what I. Uh, just for what just crossed my mind actually is very well your uh, comment because um, I think another text that could be considered a matter text to this question of historiography is actually the Dian is done it. And which is super interesting because there Hartig introduces himself as the a political historiographer, but what he actually does is that he like completely defies any sort of development. Um, and I have looked at the Rukopis uh, of these Dian uh, Strani texts, and it's it's like this massive amount of anecdotes and historical and whatever. And they're all it's they're separate teaches, and he um, he wrote three or four different table of contents that suggested a different order for these uh, various texts each time, and it doesn't really change. The, the the whole framework of of the conflict um, mm -hmm. if you take order of these texts, so the, it's actually a sort of meta text on writing history without mm -hmm. controlling uh, events. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, this is, I think it's way too under research this text because I think it actually makes sense to connect this to. Yeah. Yeah. It was published first in the 1960s. I know. And at that time, we love to read that because we had other party history. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a great kind of yeah. commentary on the. Uh, what is it? Uh, short version, uh, uh, okay. course, <laughs> and so on. So it, it is, uh, it, I would say it's more important than Shrek. Yeah, okay. I would say that too. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Peter, uh, yeah, I have one short comment. You know, we, uh, I think, uh, I remember in my high school geometry, I think there was an asymptotic curve, which never moves over the point of average. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's kind uh, of sounds. I have two questions. One, what do you make out of you know the Shrake's statement, you know, seeing the declaration of war? And he says to him, could we have this war in the way? He can have predict the outcome of this war. I have a theory about it, but it's, it's you know, he, he has some what we say called pro, pro, protection. Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, this, this is one. And the second question is it would be interesting to see whether. You know, he was in Russia and he read Russian literature. You mm -hmm. know, he knew a lot of country forward. But uh, this deconstruction of his story is basically, you know, I'll spoil what I mean. Mm -hmm. And that's the general is uh, useless because the you know, war is like the Brownian moves from little soldiers mm -hmm. independently. Or, I mean, Dostoevsky about, you know, Napoleon is a criminal who does it to glorify himself. So this this might be then a way to look at it. I don't know whether you had it, but that would be you know, Russian literature and called it really obscure national. Yeah, I I, I I have no idea about whether he knew this or was influenced directly by War and Peace. Uh, it, I've always kind of read this as him. This is this is a result of his fallout with the Bolsheviks. That, that we have this moment when he kind of switches away from having any kind of uh, uh, faith in the, the, the Communist Party. You know, so is hardly emotionally. Well, well, I know, I, I, I more mean a, a, a Hashik's moment there. I mean, there's these great stories about how when, when Hashik was a committed Bolshevik, it's when he actually stopped drinking right. and seemed to actually be a reasonable human being. Uh, and then, and then it's, <laughs> it's, it, I think it's the, the sort of fallout from that that comes in. He says, you know, even this stuff, like none of this. I think there's this absolute rejection that happens, and that would be my interpretation of it. Um, I, I, I think Shake is, you know, enjoying himself basically when he says we will win. It's, it's just there to be kind of okay. 
My interpretation is actually this is it's again so it is again yeah. depends on the syntactic uh, mm -hmm. stress. Mm -hmm. If you say two bullet yeah. implies that all the previous ones were lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's yes, so mm -hmm. two bullet are could be there and these people then nice. Okay. Yeah. Again, this is very, very delicate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. he, he should be with that analyzed linguistically. Right. The, the play our language is really that's great. great. That's great. I, I like that idea that you have to the parentage, you have something before? Yeah. Oh, uh, another sort of filling in thing that the book is full of these moments where Ashik mentions the historians of the New Republic going back and looking at the documents and discovering that Schmidt's file has been replaced with a Joseph Case file, right? This is a <laughs> moment. Right. And, and, and it's been sorted out, he's been executed, right? Right. Um, so, like, he's modeling the, imagine, he's imagining. The historian coming back to the story of Shrake while he's writing the story of Shrake and trying to put together the real history from which might be relevant. But my question is about the words that, and that's enough at the end of the mm -hmm. and that's enough. But in some ways, you, know, you understand why he's saying that it's, it's sort of like a statement of humility. It's enough just to be Shrake or to have to exist within this world of anecdotes and not in the world of history. But it's actually not enough for the historian, right? <laughs> Um, as becomes clear in the like in the later parts, the, the novel works much better when there is a bigger history in the background of the anecdotes of filling it in and working their way around. They don't work on their own. And you know, they, it's like the whole process of what you described is kind of like the opposite of the sort of new historical process where you take a little detail, the historicist process, you take a little detail and you connect it to the bigger thing. What what Hashik is doing is taking a little detail and showing how it's irrelevant to the bigger story. But you still need that bigger story for the effect to work. I, yeah. I, I mean, this, this is the, the strange conundrum about the word yeah. anecdote here itself, because by being the thing that is not public, it assumes that there is the thing that is public. Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, exactly. To be non historical means you assume that historical actually exists right. as well. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder if we can say that uh, it, there, I think there's an option here for Schweig to just stay at the chalice <laughs> and, and, and have that be that. that and, and in some ways, that wouldn't that be a, a, a better real world event? So I, I mean, in some ways, this is that, that sort of problematic element here that maybe, maybe the better world is the one in which we don't have to have novels at all. Yeah. And we just all hang on to the chalice and, and we talk to each other and tell inane stories. And then maybe that's actually like the, the, the best of all possible worlds. And, and, and to sort of make a quick Voltarian aside in some ways. So uh, I you're, you're you're sort of reading history means something quick and it's still grinding. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if I can exactly tell you what I learned. But basically it's, since I'm technically living in Asia Minor, mm -hmm. I'm interested in these sort of Asia Minor connections. And of course, on a, on a basis is originally a, a, a journey across Asia Minor mm -hmm. to the Black Sea. But then, what yeah, yeah. <laughs> the connection I never made was an anecdote actually coming from from um, Procopius, mm -hmm. from, which is the Byzantine court. That's right. And then he had Ephesus in his introduction. I mean, I don't think Hajik was consciously doing anything, right. but you know, with history coming out of Herodotus, you really from Kali Parnassus, which is Roman yeah. Turkey, there's sort of an interesting. Asia Minor geography underlying yeah. that. It's sort of a more, much more of a subconscious thing, but I think it's, in, it's sort of a nice. It's not Greece per se, right? Yeah. And of course, I what I am interested in is how Hashik looks at Ottomans and exclusively, and you, you know that because you read my book. But yeah. um, I, if we go further back, there's the classical and Byzantine Asia Minor, which I think I never actually saw that connected until mm -hmm. just now. Of course, it's the origin of history itself. Is it? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, wow. Well, not accidental, I suppose, but it's interesting. He has goes in there. So. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're here. <laughs> um, yes, Indri. If I may, uh, this Atoya Dost uh, could also be translated, and that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or too much, <laughs> even. Yeah. But it's Dost. Dost, yeah. But it's Dost. Again, depending on how we put our emphasis on it. Uh, yeah. On intonation, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm very happy that that um, you brought up the idea of anarchism, and that's something I want to learn more about today and tomorrow because it's, it's a vague sense I've always had is that is it this is an anarchic novel, and you know I don't really understand political anarchism, 
And, you know, I'm still struggling with how this novel works, but I, I hope we'll get to more of this because it's it's something I know I need to fill in. So I'm, I'm glad that we started that, that conversation thread. Yeah. Okay. Can I jump for a moment, please? <laughs> well, good. I've been, I, I, you will be my guru. Hello to all. Can I jump for a moment, Chris? Please, please. Well, uh, it was very interesting, and I would like just to uh, um, remember uh, to remember that do we know the Hashik's own attitude to these stories? Uh, they are derived from the real person. Um, mm, of Strashlipka, František Strashlipka. And uh, from the war poems of Hashik, we know that he hated all his stories and said that the most horrible things in the war, it's a Strashlipska history of life. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, this is uh, obviously part of adding absurdity to the whole things. And uh, one interesting um, um, link to a very deep understanding of uh, the mechanics of these uh, um, stories as uh, um, element of creating continuous absurdity is uh, Albert Camus. And uh, he used these in L'Entranger, where the, uh, uh, in the prison cell, the hero finds the story about uh, Czech's story, Czech's uh, Czech story, absolutely absurd story uh, about uh, coming back of the rich brother who wasn't uh, came unknown uh, to uh, sister and mother, and they murder him. So it's, it's uh, his uh, drama, Le uh, Malatandu, I believe. So, anyway, so um, I think uh, Camus uses the same technique uh, of introduction, of the dark, uh, introduction, absurd story to add absurdity to, to the story. So uh, it's very interesting, um, so to say, link and uh, um, an understanding of the technique of uh, one writer and uh, using it. So, once again, I would like to say that it's very important to uh, remember Hashik's own attitude to all this life story in a real life situation. And, and I think this is really important even for us today that we can talk about the, the atmosphere of the, the, the traditional pub, where, where we also have this kind of active storytelling that exists there, this way in which we interact with people in those actual atmospheres that, that seems to have this kind of positive communal effect. As opposed to these, say, grandiose stories that uh, he, he created, and I think that distinction there. And, and again, I'm not trying to sort of valorize the the, the, the pub here, as so many people often do here, but rather just that kind of interactions, this real human interaction, which I think also can uh, really privileges. And this idea of actually just being with another person and trying, just trying. I mean, I mean that 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 in some ways is Camus' entire ethics is just trying. To, to be okay with another person in a world that's meaningless. And in some ways it seems as though this is also a, a similar kind of existential side of, of, of Hashek. Um, I think it's just, uh, 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 there is, uh, I'm not trying to, uh, to, to, to say that uh, there is just one, one, uh, one tool. I, I believe there is a lot of layers that were used here, and uh, I think that it's just an addition to what you already said. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I 
Actually, it isn't uh, Lucas saying telling Luke that uh, she another is professor of history? Is that right? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gosh. <laughs> so, well, he has a history in his memory. Wow. And, 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 wow. He's of course his probably his own, but. <laughs> And Marek is a, a student of philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so most of our questions are about whether people would be willing to share the slides. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and I will make um, a pitch uh, for um, uh, my colleague, the uh, uh, marionette puppet here is going to be putting on a Shveik production for theater for the new, uh, for the new city in February of 2024. So uh, do keep that uh, uh, on the horizon. All right, any other bits? We can certainly continue this. You have another? Uh, okay. That means one sentence. Also, the ocean is It's another model that is strange. Yeah. I mean, it's all about the conversations. But I, but I also wanted to, while well, I've got everybody here, I wanted to ask Maybe you'll know. That, <laughs> uh, that early review by Edward, what's his name? Edward, oh, Edward, yeah. Weinberg. Weinberg. It's, it's in an Edward Rice review and cites Edward Weinberg. Yes, that's Weinberg. Weinberg. Yeah. Does that exist or do you just make it up? That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I've, I've, I've not seen it. Yeah, I researched that. I just went over this guy actually existed and I found no evidence of there ever having. No, like, but he. In case he did, he did not write this down. Yeah, of course, but I, I, I couldn't find any evidence of this being a written down quote. Okay. So maybe it was a first conversation, right. or it was something that he just came up with because this was like you know bigger. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would love if this is actually just completely made up too. It would be satisfying. Wouldn't it would be satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> it's also like indicative of the way in which Patrick's reception relies on a kind of opposition, an oppositional stance. It works much better if somebody says this is uh this is not literature for Czech and yeah. Right. If they can then say yes, it is, right? <laughs> they want somebody to say this is scandalous or shocking in order to be able to present it as a little bit more interesting. Right. It also certainly helps us. It helps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, yeah, let's indeed uh, continue the conversation over lunch. Thank, Thank you, you all. And thanks for our morning. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've been right.
Это почему-то наушники не включаются.
Представляешь, заработал этот ГАИ, а я, не, а я не могу заполнить, потому что у меня этот самый 24 числа типа я купил. Ну, я дату, ее придется исправлять. А мне 21-е, я сейчас написал. Ну, там может... Ну, да. Хорошо, воткни свой, без проблем.
Нет, котика, я же не могу. И, а, а, мне все равно придется исправлять, потому что у меня это... Дата должна быть правильная. Ну, я, наверное, не смогу сегодня записаться. Они начнут проверять документы, скажут, у вас неправильно. Непонятно, кто мне заставлял ставить дату. Я, я потом мог вписать совершенно спокойно. А? Он думал, что ты не писал. Ну да. Ну ладно. Тебе надо будет дать поведение просто.
it's a joke. It's a joke. No, it's uh, Eric, when you get it, when you get a chat, you, you and Joe Michelle didn't have a chat about well, you know, right? So we fell here. We just had a step. Well, I know. Okay. Eric is chasing a close and probably the ball. Well, I'm regularly talking about chat. I didn't even touch. What yeah <laughs> <laughs> so well, it, I, I don't dwell on this but I don't know if I'm writing my I don't want to write my book. I don't want to write my book. I don't want to write my book. I don't want to I was in best at souls. Yeah, I 
on the table right there. At least since I've been here, they would have told us. I think I'd like to think so, yeah. You have to make it until the mid afternoon break when the hot coffee will arrive. <laughs> well, maybe uh, uh, just in advance of our next presentation, I, I realized that I, I should have been a little more uh, specific in um, my statement of thanks um, at, at the opening of the program. So I'll, I'll correct that now. Um, uh, here at the Harriman Institute, there are uh, many people that we, we need to uh, recognize for uh, making this conference possible. Of course, starting with the director, Professor Valentina Zmirlieva, who has been very supportive of Czech studies and, and of this project. And had she had a slightly less insane week this week, she probably would have been here in the morning to uh, wish you all well. Um, to Associate Director Alarachko, who was very important in the early planning stages and sort of pointed me in the right direction and said, this is what you need to do to make this happen, as she always has been anytime I try to do anything more ambitious uh, here at Columbia. Um, and uh, Tatiana Belvarodova, who uh, many of you have been in contact with, arranging your uh, travel and accommodation. And last but certainly not least, Eileen Hoon has been running back and forth and has really been our main point person uh, um, uh, taking care of all of the little details. So uh, if you see any of these individuals, feel free to thank them in person <laughs> uh, uh, for the great work they've done. I also realize that uh, I'm here reading everyone else's bios and I haven't introduced them myself. I mean, some of you know me very well, uh, but for some of you, I'm just the weird guy who sends all these emails about the Hashek conference. So my name is Chris Harwood. I am the senior lecturer in Czech at Columbia, and I've been teaching Czech language and a little bit of Czech literature since 2001. Uh, I'm a Russian literature scholar who went wrong and um, ended up in this town. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, for the past several years, I have been on and off uh, co-directing the Central European Center here at the Harriman Institute for my sins. All right, and I think we can probably, uh, I can introduce, oh yeah, uh, that's a good point, I, you could have brought it up later, but since, yeah, since we're a little bit off topic, um, I, you know, I was playing this email game with you uh, about who wants to go out for something on Saturday night, and, you know, as I indicated, the, the response was a little bit unclear, I feel like I've gotten enough responses at this point to justify making a reservation at Bohemian Spirit, um, for six o'clock on Saturday. Um, and so uh, I would just appreciate it if sometime, eh, ideally by tonight, uh, certainly by midday tomorrow, you let me know whether you'd like to join. That's a sort of uh, unofficial, everyone pays their own way, have as much beer or anything else as you like. Um, and it's a little bit of a complicated trip. We'll see, uh, you know, depending on how many people are going and how adventurous they're feeling, whether we'll get into taxis or, or take public transportation to get over there. So do, do be thinking about that. So a few of you have already said, yes, I'm going. And if, but if you haven't, uh, just, just do let me know if you plan to go so I can get the right numbers for that. Um, yeah. 
And so with that, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker of the, of the afternoon. Uh, Jomar Hensi was born in Norway in 1960 and grew up on a farm where he lived until the age of 20 in a world of animals. After completing military service, he studied cybernetics and worked as an engineer for obtaining a degree in computing science at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne uh, in 1990. And since then, he has worked as a software developer for various institutions and companies uh, based in Liverpool, Kongsberg, Antwerp, and Oslo. Uh, and since 2004, he's been working in Oslo for a US company and living alternately in Olomouc and Oslo. Uh, he first read uh, Schweik in 1991 in the English translation and was immediately fascinated with Hasek's humor and biting satire, uh, as well as the novel's rich array of characters and factual or apparently factual references. And over the years, he developed into a Schweikologist, Hashkologist, undertaking uh, trips in the footsteps of Schweik uh, in 2004 over a four week period, and of Yaroslav Hasek in 2010 for six months. And uh, since 2009, he has actively developed a website uh, dedicated to Hasek, collecting facts about the backdrop of the novel. Um, uh, uh, a backdrop which Hasek himself is a very important part of. Uh, when he realized that internet sources had really only scratched the surface, he started to read available literature about the subject um, and discovered many gaps in our knowledge about uh, Hasek and Schweik uh, that still remain. Uh, and this was an impetus for him to investigate collections of historical newspapers and other publications. Uh, and in parallel to do research in archives. And it's these latter activities that are still keeping him busy and will be the theme of his presentation today. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to say thank the organizers for the invitation. It was at the time a big surprise and I'm immensely grateful for having this opportunity to at least present what I, and not only myself have been doing, I'll mention a few other people. So. First of all, I a disclaimer. <laughs> there, may, there will be things in there that are not necessarily my discoveries, but I'll try to be fair and mention who and who took part in this before we go on. So, since we're, we're now in New York, I want to um, start with a, an angle from this city. Yeah, maybe actually, if I, uh, you could flip this into your pocket. Just because I've be heard from the people on Zoom. Uh -huh. Our speakers were saying. Okay, yeah. Right. Okay, so now you see the arrows there. This is the immigration register down at Ellis Island, 29th of March, 1906, when a certain friend of Yaroslav Hasek arrived in New York, Zdeněk Matěj Kudě. A little bit on the side, but have a look there. Where the polygamist, where they're an anarchist. <laughs> Good day. He was categorical. He said, no, I'm neither. <laughs> but, we can, <laughs> but we can imagine what about that Yaroslav Hasek? <laughs> if he wanted to go to a conference here, for instance, <laughs> he would have big problems, would have had big problems. <laughs> So, and this is also not, again, my discovery recent, a collector in Prague, Martin Prost, got hold of this picture, a rare picture of Hasek. We don't know where it is, when it was taken. He looks a bit tired, probably had a busy day with writing um, stories, anecdotes, and whatever. So let's continue. Uh, forgot to mention the, uh, the material I've collected out is broadly falls into two categories. One is bi biographical about Hasek. Second is are things that are related to his writing. For instance, there might be things you can read line by line in Sheikh, but actually he found somewhere and copied it or remembered it. I'll get to that on each particular item. So, uh -huh. yeah. A brief history, most of you will know these names. Jan Moravec, he, is the he was the first to ever uh, tie parallels between Hasek's life and experiences in the Austro-Hungarian army and Sveik. 
and he's been quoted a lot. Václav Menger, you would know about biographer, friend of Hase. Vetislav Hula, I, I want to return to him a few times, is not a very well known person, but he was a very important researcher and a friend of Hasek as well. Antik, you know, probably, came canonized Hasek as a communist, but a little bit more than that. Jaroslav Fizek wrote a very well-documented book about Hasek in Russia, but it's tiresome reading. It's, it's stuffed with ideology. It's incredibly tiresome. Uh, it's horrible, but, but, it, but it's still really important. <laughs> because of all the facts, and he also documented it very well. Rakko Pitlik, say no more. He was generally regarded as the most important Haskologist, uh, expert on Hasek ever. Cecil Parrott, we all know. He, well, wrote the Bad Bohemian, translated even entire chapters from the whole of a whole set. Admitted it as well, so I think it was well, probably didn't do anything out of order. In 1983, there was a symposium in Bamberg, and um, also one in Dobrich, I think, but I used the one in Bamberg for my research. It's, it's also written down in detail. Pavel Gahn, oh, an expert on Hasek in Russia. He wrote, also wrote a book on it, and published four papers. Zeni Sadlon, translator of Sheik. And importantly, it, this was the first useful website about Sheik and Hasek ever. And it's, it's been there for a long time. And I consulted it a lot in the beginning. Peter Kovarik, not that well known, but he, I just thought I mentioned him. And then to our stuff, the web pages and the research that I've done together with. Sergei Sarlau, who was here recently on the, I don't know, in Kemerovo, it's now three, four in the morning, I don't know. Yaroslav Serak, a good friend of mine also, a Hasek, Haskolo, and uh, a few more Hans-Peter Lakuris, and he has also some uh, input about Turkey and Sheikh. And uh, again, a few books, Rakko Pitlik Data Fakta Documenti. Everything thrown together, a bit chaotic, but still immensely important because the information is there. I already talked about quickly and Parrot. I won't say that much. I think I said all I need to say. But a few documentary books, Jaroslav Hasek Photography, Big Bibliographia, that is actually an, an overview of Hasek's writing. And then there's another one, Another bibliography is about Hasek. This was Boris Nedilek in 1983, I think. Pitlik, Slitsky, Profil, Yaroslava Hashka, and Data Fakta Documenti. I mentioned them. And now, what next? After Pitlik, after Paro, Parrot, and, and other, others, of course. And these are the things that we've been digging out since 2010. I've Categorize this per archive. I'm concentrate, concentrating on three important archives. Starting with the Literania of Neo Turkey's in its brief, the archive of the Czech uh, Memorial to Czech Literature. Important, probably the most important from a Haskolo viewpoint point of view. Austrian State Archive, War Archive. Got a few gems in there, I'll show you later. <laughs> And the uh, Czech military archive, Vojenský historický archiv, also got a few interesting things. And this, this is a, this is a, uh, the first image there is from Usta. Not very well known, but he doesn't say anything. Researchers didn't know already that he was captured by Horupan on the 24th of September, 1915 and so on. Maybe more surprising, Hasek did not have a record <laughs> in the military. He was not, he was not, he, well, you might think he would have been sitting in jail all the time, but officially not. I'll get back to it later. It can be explained quite logically. <laughs> <laughs> now, first archive used to be a Strahov, beautiful building, beautiful room. 
Now it's moved, it's been moved to Litomjevice. I think you can order material for Straho still. I don't know, I, I haven't been there for a few years. Two, that, uh, two main, the so-called Fondi, the collections from various people. Dena Antik, Tretislav Hula, Jaroslav Hasek. This, the Hasek Fond is important, is has uh, the advantage, it's, it's now digital. You can look it up on the internet. So I won't, I don't, I don't want to talk too much about that one. You can read it yourself. Other things I studied was about Menger. He was not, not only a friend of Hasek, but he was, he was also a researcher. He wrote two books and he, he published a series in Lidovino Vini in 1933 that actually adds to what is written in the books. And the books are a bit sort of semi-fictive. So I'd rather, when it comes to Hasek and Menger, I go for Lidovino Vini. Budje, Longen, Hoskova, Rakopitlik, and a new one, Hasek's second wife, Sura. And this, this has not been studied. I think they're still working on it. Uh, how am I doing time-wise? Uh, you are uh, probably a bit behind. You're less than nine minutes in. So. Okay, it should be. I'll have to speak up a bit. <laughs> then on cheek, a communist ideologist, but importantly, he was like a Hoover. He hoovered up whatever was there about us. And, and stuck it in the Literani Archiv. And here you can see Antik with his comrade Joseph Stalin in front of him, the lower one. The upper one, the Scottwald, and you can see Antik at the, at the right. And who the others are, who the other comrades are, I don't know. I don't know them, but uh, probably quite important people. 70 cartons, not categorized. A lot about Hasek, but there's also a lot more personal, like, like the photos here from, are also in this archive or in this fund. And Vetisla Hula passed on a lot of material to Antique. And so that will be found in, in uh, his collection. Police records, Hula made progress reports when he discovered a new story. It, or I should say, identified a new story. He reported to Antik, and very meticulously, it's, it's great research. And uh, then there is a cor correspondence with Kudye, Bohumal Wojcika Hoffer, those were two co-soldiers of Hasek in Czeskiewicz and at the front, but also quite interesting. Fetislav Hula, I'll say a few words about him. He was uh, captured on, uh, in 1915, ended up in a prisoner camp in Russia, uh, rip or sort of uh, reported to the legions or whatever they were called at the time, probably the Ruzina. And he met Hasek in uh, 1917 in Kiev, both worked in the ed editorial offices of uh, Czechoslovak. They, they became friends there. Hula was a communist, and it's probably he who nudged Asek towards the extreme left in 1918. You can see from the writing in Czechoslovan that Asek suddenly started to be, from having been anti Bolshevi criticizing Len Lenin and so on, he sort of moved a bit to the left without ex explicitly praising Lenin. And a lot of correspondence. He collected pseudonyms. There are 118 different names identified as being used by Jaroslav Hasek. Photos and so on, corresponding with Hasek's old mates, with Antique. He wrote a series of explanations or annotations to Schweik. Five cartons, you can see them here. And that's from Strahov. But um, hopefully it will be digitalized soon and we can all study it. Uh, explanations. Um, Philibert, I thought uh, this is everything in Czech, but it would be too tiresome and time consuming for me to translate it. But most of you will understand it anyway. So, and 
if you if you have any questions, please ask anyone here who can speak or translate from Czech. Uh, some of the <laughs> some of the <laughs> the explanations are quite funny. If you look at Ufleku, well, if, we, if you go there and sit down with the petit bourgeois, drink a beer, you can soon get ra radicalized. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, well, still, it's very good work, but very few, actually, very few errors in all of this. Very few. And he, he did it in, a, in maybe six months, handed it, handed it over to Anchik, who printed it. Not a word about Ula, not a single word. Interesting records. Jaroslav uh, Hasek, Ula identified police reports on Hasek 95 times. <laughs> And but only one of them is anything that's got to do with politics. He was uh, inciting to violence against the policemen at the anarchist demonstration in, in 1907. The rest are just public order, drunk, drunkenness, vandalism, some other provocation. No, not, not just some other, quite a few. <laughs> Vandalizing a tree. <laughs> And provoking the Austrian secret police after the world broke out. This is a great story. <laughs> but uh, I, I think Pitlick wrote about it. I definitely wrote about it. Uh, Menger did wrote about it. Some fantastic versions of it. But uh, this is from the police itself. And this man, policeman Slavicek, he is actually mentioned in Shake. Klima and Slavicek. Now, this is the, the Har Yaroslav Hasek fund itself. Manuscript of Sveik important, important online, as I already said. I'll just show a little detail from the Rukopis, the uh, manus manuscript. It's writ partly written on paper from os official Austrian institutions. <laughs> so I can imagine Hasek, Hasek having had quite the, had a lot of fun when he wrote it, but it wasn't only on this paper, he used anything, calendars, whatever. And another item from the, uh, from the manus manuscript, you can also see that he, when writing, he could suddenly change his mind. Here he He's writing about a concentration camp, Steinhof, where allegedly Pani Müllerova was sent mm -hmm. after her misfortunes. He started off with the Neubuch, probably suddenly probably realized there wasn't any concentration camp there, changed it to Steinhof, which again doesn't have a concentration yeah. camp. <laughs> but he really meant Kallerhof by Graz. He had written about it already in the Voyage Anxiety. Mm -hmm. So just sort of got it a bit uh, confused. Jaroslav Kela, person who put pay to the myth that Hasek deserted or defected. The circumstances around the battle were such he couldn't have done, but there were low hundreds of, of people taken prisoner in the same on the same day. So why just Hasek deserted? That's someone made it up. I don't know who. But very unlikely that he did. He might have intended to do. That's another another thing. But that again, we don't know. Uh, a small little detail here. Um, Hasek crossed out things, but he also borrowed from. Uh, he borrowed entire phrases from from uh, literature he, he had at hand or remembered. And one of them. Here is, is crossed out General Jeva Pasha Akon. And who, who is this Akon? And well, we can look at Jetava Valka, Slovem i Obraze, page 507. This is evidently where Hasek picked this quote from. And there, well, he's crossed out contra Admiral Mertens. He never made it into Sveik. <laughs> he never became a Herostratus. <laughs> he ended up as a nobody. <laughs> and here he is, Johannes von Merten. And he was one of the, quite a few German officers in Ottoman service. You can see he has a, uh, 
Hey, this is not a typical German attire. So this is this is Nertenpascha. <laughs> now this is the picture from our invitation today. There's a little bit more to it. Claim to being taken in Kiev in 1917, almost true, but not quite. Again, Hula dug out the information that makes us a it makes us able to identify where it was done and with whom and when. He wrote to Antique, but he is now no, fiddling with a photo of with Hasek Menger and some future General Sipek. Mm. So someone's missing the, the Menger and Sipek. Then he tells Hula again wrote to Antik, and he has even identified the date. It was a celebration after the day of St. Saint, Václav Saint in Berezna, in now in Ukraine. This is Jan Sipek as general, later First Republic general. He landed in big trouble under the Nazis and even the communists. He got the worst of both. Václav Menger is obituary in Rude Pravo, probably in 1947. There is now 12th of October. The date down there is the Russian Orthodox calendar. The one there is our calendar. Now, Moyensky Historetsky Archiv. A few things there of interest. Kmenove Listi, Grunburg Letter. A lot of factual information about not only Hashem, but also a lot of characters around him, even those he sort of mm, put into shake, if you like. And this is this one is from the Grunburg Blatt or of Kadet Biegler, whose name was really Hans Hermann Gustav Biegler. <laughs> but Hashem didn't bother about it. And this is the, the uh, order, the hierarchy here. He, he says he was in the 4th March company and his commander was Oberleutnant Luka, uh, Lukas. And he actually, that further on, I didn't get catch this one. Wiegler on the 18th of August, 1915, got the horrible stomach disorder, which probably found its way into shake in an incredibly smelly way. <laughs> Speculation, but it's uh, Hasek was there as well, so he would have known about it probably. This is uh, Hasek's Grundbuchsblatt uh, uh, in a Czech version, and that's an example of another one. Vincent Sagner, Austrian officer, later took the step on into the Czechoslovak army, but he, he had to go through Lustratze that he had behaved as a proper Czech during the war, and he actually did. I can't go in, I, I could go into detail, but then time would run out. Um, important document, if you look at it from a geographical point of view. Das Infanterie Regiment Nummer 91 am Vormarsch in Galicien. It marks day by day the movement of the entire regiment, and I try to read recreate it here, and this would have been the route that Hasek followed until he was captured at Varupa. And um, it, it gives the date when the, the regiment uh, arrived at Jovtansi, where Schweik ends. But they only stayed there for two hours, 15 minutes, so there couldn't have been any big, uh, big thing going on there. But Hasek, he moved things around, he moved it geographically, time-wise, so what happened at Jovtansi could have happened somewhere else. But this is just an example. Hasek's Krankenburg. It was bad actually, because Menger mentioned he had a heart condition. And I think he once also said in South Yava that he had a weak heart. And this is that documented when, uh, when he, uh, how would you say, Narukovau. When he was, uh, yeah, when he, he reported in the, in the 91st Regiment in Chesky it's uh, it says here, here's a chronicle, joint rheumatism, and there's a, a sound 
from his heart valves or something. So he was obviously, and this led to him not being, uh, he didn't serve as a normal armed inf infantryman. He was, he became a, a messenger in the end. So, uh, so-called partly super arbitrated. And these are known, these, you, these documents have been known for a while. And now I'll get back to why he, here he, it says he was not punished in the, in the Austro-Hungarian army. Well, that may not be entirely true because every unit, every regiment could hand out until one month in prison without it going to a higher court instance. So there's no doubt that Hasek was locked up in Teske. <laughs> there's absolutely no doubt. We have, we have evidence that he did, if he went on a, a walk about with, with his Kranken, Krankenbuch, I don't know, maybe he did, maybe he added a few, a few details. And um, this is, uh, this can also be studied online. It's in the uh, archive in, uh, in, in Strahov. Greeks archive in, in Vienna, also quite interesting. Again, it's closely related to shape, but there's nothing there that has anything to do with Hasek's time el or elsewhere. The uh, Feldkuraten, well documented, Ludwig Latzina was an extremely uh, uh, un unruly uh, field chaplain. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a, a not, not, even he alone is enough for another presentation, so I'll skip it. And this is an example of what Otto Katz could have been from, from uh, informed sources or roughly translated. It is said that your way of life is not entirely ideal or uh, nicht einwandfrei. Can, can any, yeah, without reproaches, something like that. And this is not Otto Katz, it's a Croat, El Korat. Mm -hmm. uh, full list of, of, of losses for a regiment, and Hasek is, is one of them, Korupan. It's got 1,000 names on it or more. So those without saying that, why should Hasek, he and only he, give back to the Russians? It doesn't make sense. Battlefield maps, so on, so on. Not. In Schweik, there, there's a quote from two army orders, Franz Josef and uh, Josef Ferdinand. Um, it's about the alleged desertion of the 28th Infantry Regiment. It's also a, a separate theme, so I have to skip it. I can only say quickly, they were these army orders probably never existed. Some variations did, but not like like it's given there, but Hasek only used the sources he had. He didn't, he didn't invent anything. Armeskamatismus, if you want to know if any Feldkorat Martinez existed or Otto Katz existed, go to the Austrian, online Austrian National Library <laughs> and look it up. All the officers in the entire army are in there. No Otto Katz, obviously. <laughs> If Otto Katz existed in Prague, there were Jewish traders, Otto Katz, quite a few. So he might have sort of merged the Otto Katz in Prague into some Feldkorat, or oh, typical of Hasek, it would have been. Belohnungsantrag. Hasek was decorated after the Battle of Sokal, end of Ju July 1915. So I just... Uh, uh, and the legend says it was because he captured 300 Russians who wanted to give themselves up anyway. And so, according to Jan Moravec, and this one has spread through the years, it's still, it's still floating around. Uh, the facts were all, read, all were quite different. I don't want to translate this. There is a Czech translation here to the right, but he, he was decorated because he, uh, he led uh, groups into position and so on, reported, did his job, and also encouraged his fellow soldiers during, during that battle. 
And uh, this was the day of decoration. Cadet Wiegler was also decorated that day. But unfortunately, he was in a city place. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably on the way back to uh, uh, Interland. <laughs> so he's not on the picture. But Hasek is, I've, I've circled him there. Next to him to the left is Jan Manje, Grovistas Kralu. No doubt. We have two officers, three or two officers here that we know as sort of part model models. This is Rudolf Lukas. Uh, Hasek made him into Lukas and made a check out of a Bohemian German. We liked him, obviously, so we are to make him a check. <laughs> Vincent Sagner, or Sagner, his commander also on in at the front, and he also has borrowed a lot for his, his uh, Captain Sagner from this Vincent's. This is the regiment. This is the man who actually decorated Hasek, is Rudolf Kiesenda. He who's also handed over a lot of his stuff to the war archive. This is everything from uh, the Stan Rudolf Kiesenda. On other Czech archives, Soka Baron, Jan Abel, Del Kurat has his diary there, stored, and photos. I've, I've digitalized it in cooperation with Soka Baron, and it's on my website. Police registers, they put pay to any discussion where Hasek lived, when and where, and where others live, when and where. It's all in there, it's so-called uh, what's the German term? Weldebuch. Uh, po population registers, very similar. State archives, you can have find birth records, baptism records, marriage, death. Uh, with Sherak, mainly has identified quite a few of the, of the people mentioned in Sheikh based on this one. Census records, 1910. It even goes down to ridiculous details where we have actually verified who the prostitutes in the brothel <laughs> for Arthur in Czeski Budjevic so where the names are in there. I haven't published it. They, they're, oh, yeah, they're pretty, yeah, they're, the granddaughters or great granddaughters wouldn't be too pleased. <laughs> well, we found a lot there. Like, when was Theodor Rotter, the policeman, born and where was he from and so on? Private archive, the diary of Jan Manje, Kralupa, Kralupa Ak. It was found by chance by, I think it was his grand, great granddaughter had some stuff from a, or in the attic somewhere and a diary. Very important, but immediately put on the web by Jan Dasherak. Czech libraries, Ministry of Defense, excellent source. It's got everything that has to do with mainly the legions, all the legional literature, whether it be Mede, newspapers, Czechoslovan, very important. Uh, so a lot about Hasek directly, a lot of general history as well, obviously. Uh, I found this one, I thought it was, it was quite funny. Now look at it, it's, it looks like uh, Franz Josef. Konrad von Hützendorf having a Pinkelpause, or they were having a, a we or, or discussing a preventive war against Serbia or whatever. <laughs> and uh, well, that, that's on the side. <laughs> and this is the first uh, that was from Czechos Czechoslovan voters. Uh, this may the, uh, the story about the, the picture of. The Emperor Franz Josef led to Hasek being investigated in Vienna. <laughs> I don't have the, the picture of it. And second one, a theme we've already seen, uh, Anna Baza. I'm okay. <laughs> uh, this is a theme that actually had been used by Hasek before, before Sheikh. This is from 1916, the office is from And I think the reason he there's, a, there's so much in, in Sheik and elsewhere that actually is taken from ancient history and other history. And on the gymnasium in Jitna, Ulitsa, where Hasek studied, uh, uh, Xenophon was on the, on the, on the uh, 
curriculum. So he might just have picked it up. But interesting your theory anyway. Never mind, but like from a historical point of view, I think probably Hasek threw it in. <laughs> and another one. This is from uh, this is a picture. And if you look at the text titles below the picture, it, it's to the letter, the same as Hasek used in a conversation between between Sheikh and a, a messenger in in Prague when he was sort of off duty for, he was arranging something for over for an apology Lukash. And the whole thing there is to the left of the same. So again, he's definitely used this Kronikas Vietoralki as a source. It was published in 1915. I would guess he had it in front of him. But he had an ex excellent memory, but remember things like that after, after six years, it, it sounds incredible. But who knows? Uh, Frantisek Langer, he wrote that Hasse could, they, they tried him out a few times, he could reel off entire passages of text, and it was correct. So he, he might have remembered it, though. he wouldn't rule it out, but it does sound in, improbable. Um, and as uh, in Jeski uh, it's in the Iacheska Miedetska Nihona. There's a series called Blumenwald, Zuni and Felder. And there you can find certain elements again or, or circumstantial things around Asik. No, he's not mentioned directly, but like following the history of the reg regiment. Other Czech libraries, a National Library, Moravian Library in Brno. On the Prague City Library, yeah, these, those are all uh, online and in the so called Cremerius uh, collection. National Mu Museum is very good. They have all the pi periodicals. Gira will be there, for instance. I wish I had a chance to study it, but we will hear more about it later. Or tomorrow, was it? Um, Jewish Museum, Tribuna. So this one will have the Ugulma story, stories in it. Uh, Czechoslovo, Prague Presse, has a, also quite interesting. Prague Presse has a lot about Hasek. It is probably one of the newspapers ever who did most to propagate it, and so did Prague Tagla. Mm. And some sort of circumstantial things from Czeski Budjevic's uh, work, like when was the regiment transferred to Kirajina and so on. It's in the paper. And in Olomouc, there's a very interesting calendar, war calendar. You can see this one. The text there is identical to the text you will find in Sveik. And the picture, this is picked from the German version, but it's the same. So the entire motive of the uh, posters on Tabor station is picked from calendars. And this was published in 1918, but Hasek backdated it typically to 1915. It is, for instance, about the uh, Battle of Pagliamento in Italy, which happened in 1917, and, and so on and so on. Again, an example of how she pretty freely through things and events and stories about the, the theft. Foreign libraries, Austrian National Library, excellent. You've got Prague Tagla. Uh, also important, as I said, important to promote the Schweig Max Braun, but for instance, he translated the first chapter of Sheikh already on the 5th of January, two days after Hasek died. Uh, a little bit about Sheikh and the reception in Austria. At times quite hostile. But, but not, <laughs> not everyone. <laughs> in Hungary, it was even worse, apparently. But I don't know Hungary, and I, I can't really <laughs> verify it. Uh, but again, Austrians, Newspapers like Arbeiterville, 
they serialized Schweik in 1927 after Greta Reiner's uh, translation. Um, and the, uh, there was also a lot of discussions about the 28th Regiment and, and the unreliability of texts in general, <laughs> which is quite an interesting theme. Or probably quite exaggerated on both sides. <laughs> um, and the protocols from the parliament, there we don't find Hasek, but there is one story he, that was censored in 1911. And this was the first uh, book of the Sheikh stories, but, but it contained a little bit more. And there was one of a uh, quite blasphemous piece that triggered the uh, census in Prague and they had it stopped. And this is actually uh, protocol in, in uh, the parliament in Vienna. And many parliamentarians actually, they complained and, and uh, explained that, well, he has already done this in Czechoslovak already. So, <laughs> so the gene is out of the bottle, so why bother? Well, and one of them, those who actually wrote or signed it was Pomash Masaryk. Aiva Axla Klopach. A lot of them were national um, I wouldn't use the word national socialist. It was used, but it was Tsiani. And so two whom two Ukrainians as well, for some reason. French National Library, snippets, not that important. I wouldn't go into it here. Library of Congress, you can find, for instance. Nines Oksunovini reported on Hasek's story with the flea of engineer Kuhn that was painted in Minnesota. Not the first, they copied it, they got it from somewhere, but they did write about it. Norwegian National Library, only circumstantial. German State Library, Libraries, Baden. The full poem of Heinrich Fierot which is probably the most bloodthirsty poem I've ever read. It's absolutely horrible. Pasek <laughs> only quote the two lines, but it's, uh, it's grotesque. And uh, that a whole stuff is. And uh, I think we're getting towards the end. What's there, we don't know. I think there's still a lot of stuff that can be dug out of Argus, no doubt. One particularly, Probably quite important thing is the Austrian State Archive and the and the uh, the anarch he was he was followed by the police as an anarchist we know well. the police themselves oh, on state today so there surely been a theory on him and I I hope I can make it to one of my next tasks in Vienna to to dig out anything about this dangerous anarchist <laughs> newspaper collections. It's right. Looking forward to that one. And um, just a few, well, obviously, the organizers at the end, but Yarda Shara, Sergei this great cooperation over 13 years. I, I can say, if it hadn't been for those two, I wouldn't have done this and I wouldn't have been here. Richard Hasek got me kickstarted by him inviting me to a conference at Lignitsa. If he hadn't done that, I probably never would have become a hospitalist. And, and of, of course, obviously, I wouldn't have been here. Hans Peter Lacour, I mentioned him, he's uh, in Bremerhaven in, in Germany. He's helped me when I had to write things in German, which I'm not very good at. And also solid research. He, he knows his history and you know, he knows shape as well. Zeni Sadlon, I've known him for quite a long time. I'm quite surprised he wasn't here, but never mind. Here's Pavel Gahn. They I used Zenny's website and also corresponded with him a few times. Pavel Gahn as well. He lives in Göttingen now, quite old. And uh, there are many more, but 10 minutes left. I think I should stop now. Or not even 10 minutes. Okay. So okay, okay, thank you. Yomar, would you like, uh, would you mind to go back to, to the slide uh, of... Uh, any questions or reactions to this uh, wealth of information about where to find what on our subject? Will you give us your websites? 
Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. A lot, I think most of it's there actually, but, yeah. that, but it, it's not that easy to find. I haven't organized it properly. Mm -hmm. It's like pouring out the bag of packs on the floor and <laughs> let you have a go. But I, I'm always open for questions yeah. and then I can find the information. I can. You know where everything is, right? I hope so. It's difficult to get on the uh, this stuff from Russia. Yes, I, I have no chance. I don't know Russian. I mean, we can do it. I mean, but it's, it's very difficult. I, I pulled it from this famous, here all the famous art of things. A lot of the He's Russian a stuff. He's a very famous psychologist. This was published in, I guess, Cast History of Law. Yeah. It's a little footnote saying this doesn't express the opinion. <laughs> 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 But I, 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 and some people say, also, if you have some people say, but I tried my best, I couldn't find it. This, this, this issue, this, this number of the channel. So, Russia would be kind of the next, next frontier. Not now. Yeah, not the easiest time to do research. No, no. Well, as I said, by the way, by the way, a lot of the project museum in here. Kutsk. Mm. Um, in, in uh, it's too, as well. Yeah. And it, it's right in the middle of town. It's on Gothic Street. Uh, and and there's, there's a little Czech pub next to it. Uh, that yeah, I, I actually I stole the menu <laughs> because it's, it's it's in Russian, but it's all about Hashek. And so I, mm. I, I meant to actually bring it with me here. So there's a museum in it. Of that, that must be new. I was there in 2020. I was there. It might, it might be closed because I was there in 2012. Uh, so uh, the pub, I remember, yeah. was Ushreika yeah, in Ulitsa Karla Marksa. Oh. And, and Gashka. Up, right? mm, I don't remember. That's a small yeah. street down, and uh, I don't remember all the details. Okay. We'll have to consult the map and find out. Yeah, awesome. Two uh, kind of um, detailed questions. Uh, was Hashtag the first person to use the word Anabasis then about the return of regions? No, it's not. There's even not even any documentary evidence what he had in his head when it come, comes to using the word Anabasis. He used it before. Yeah, he used it before. But... In 1916. And uh, in shake, I, I wouldn't even dare to say that he intended to use it as a against the regions. We don't know that. Well, we, you can speculate, but he used it in 1916 for some reason. It would be the same reason in, in 1921. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, I know about Medek. He wrote uh, a book called Anabasa, but well, that was as late as 27. 27, yeah. There's, there's a, I have a marker from 1919. Of someone from the legions, yeah. Uses okay. If you look, if you search in the in the ministry and the digital web on the website of the Ministry of Defense, you can find a lot about the legions there. And if you search Anabasa, mm -hmm. I think it was probably used already in 1918, 19. Well, yeah. We don't know. Again, yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, uh, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, do you hear me? By the way. Yeah. Do you know no, uh, <laughs> it's the short answer. It was written on calendar paper from Jeski Budjovic in 1927. And it was published. Yes. Uh, but I've seen some reference to it in the in the, in Vojenski Historiski Archive, but it was intended for Bermerwald's surname Felder, which I believe it's the same style. So my guess is what it was on Karl Wagner from Wagenried. It's a possibility, or Rudolf Kieswetter himself. Mm. It's possible. It could be deduced because the, this narrator there, he writes about his own battalion. Mm. So it was obviously quite a, he was not any minor officer. Right. But again, I don't know. So, did you look into Mongolian hack? <laughs> 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 so, uh, I and two sources explain that Ashley was uh, a manager of Sukhaman. I've, yeah, I've heard it, but I, I don't know. And uh, send to the uh, said he is mentioned in the history of Mongolia as the mentor of Sukhaman. Yeah. The conclusion I made, or the inference I made, is that Sukhaman, or the European, one of his letters to Petrovic, I guess he writes about, he's editing this journal, 
all he did, and uh, he publishes in five languages. One is Mongolian, and he says, I know all these languages, but Mongolian, I have a little guy who translates. But we should have one. Let's bring Sergey into the conversation. Yeah. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, I would like to say that a lot of the Russian materials uh, published in the book uh, Yomar mentioned at Krizik. Uh, he said that uh, it's a lot of uh, communist stuff in it, but uh, there is a lot of documents published in this book, and it's the only book when you can see his uh, marriage certificate with Shura, and to see that. Uh, they were uh, they married in Krasnoyarsk, not in Irkutsk or anywhere else. So Krizik is a fantastic book. Uh, there is a lot of lot of um, copies of documents, and another great feature of the Krizik books that there is a lot of um, Hashik's publications in the communist papers. So it's a great great source of the. Uh, documents. Uh, he uh, was in, the, I believe, in the end of the 50s, he was lucky enough to get access to the part archives and things like that. So he really um, worked with the real documents. And uh, another thing uh, regarding Anna Baza. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, basically it's not used by Hashik in 1916, as um, in my books of comments on the novel I mentioned. It's very, it was very, very popular terms. Uh, today it was mentioned a couple of times. Viktor Shklovsky, Viktor Shklovsky used uh, the Anabaza in his Sentimental Journey book in 1923. And not only his, uh, in, uh, it was used in uh, uh, memoirs of uh, General Denikin and also in memoirs of uh, General Krasnov. So it's, basically it was very popular uh, mm, term to describe a uh, long journey of the uh, armed, uh, uh, armed, uh, armed people and very, very popular and uh, very often use it. And uh, one, uh, one thing that um, uh, never in a Hashik's life, in a time of uh, most glorifications of the legion, no one, no one, and Yomar can tell you, he extensively researched archives, I mean, of the um, press of the, of the time, he could not find any um, any mention or anything um, uh, that could suggest that um, anyone uh, from the Legion suspect that Hashik tried to make fun of um, uh, Siberian and the basis of uh, Legion. So uh, it's really discussable. Uh, idea and probably it was first um, so suggested uh, by Anchikan Rula, I believe uh, Yomar also mentioned it. And the, for that, to, to, to the finish it, Yomar, if you don't mind, please, would you go back to the your slide on the Vojetate's bomb? I would like to, uh, to, 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 Vojetate's bomb, would you mind? I think it's 26. Yeah. Yes, uh, recollect you. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> why have I gone offline? I think so. I think we'd already plan to move on. Yeah, I think we're running out of time. But, uh, uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Yeah, could I ask one question about this marriage being? Do you need over there? Uh, 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 the marriage was, you know, basically abolished in a certain moment, and so he was basically righteous as long as, as you know, the, the marriage was. Yeah, okay. okay. I think we can. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, and that's uh...
Yeah. Will you get Joseph Bong? Yeah, we've got him here. So good. Can we have We'll get that image up in a moment. Is it still possible, Christopher? I think so. I think so. <laughs> People more competent than I are working. I would. I just. I, I just would like to finish on on you know on on funny stuff. I sure. would like to. Share. <laughs> I'm all about the funny stuff. <laughs> if, if, if you don't mind, of course, uh, because Richard recommended to us that there was some humor in it. Yes. This is it, right? No. No. no yeah. I think ne next one. Uh, not as fast. No, that's the last one, I believe. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, this one. Yeah. So this, this one uh, story found by Yomar was used word by word, uh, I believe, in a chapter, first chapter on the second book. But one word was changed by Hashik. Just one word. Uh, the horse in the real story was Gnedush. Ubohi mui gne duši. In Osudi dobre ovojeka, it became belush. Ah, change of color. From brown to I don't white. know why. I don't know why, why Hashik, uh, why copying word by word, with even in the, with the mistakes, I mean with the typos, decided to change gne duši to belushi. Sounds better. <laughs> That's it. All right. All right. Now, um, let me think. Uh, I think, I guess we should get the presentation ready. Uh, so I will work. So did I tell you what information? Very good. In on these, uh, yeah, the yeah. the <laughs> better, better to know less. Let's see. So, I would like to just introduce our next presenter, uh, a ecologist whose professional interests include literary theory, especially structural and structural and semiotic methods, uh, thematology, diachronic narratology, problems of spatial configurations in literary works, uh, Czech literature of the second half of the 19th century, particularly the Czech novel of this period, quantitative methods in literary studies, authorial dictionaries, literary cartography, and computational literary studies. From 2014 to 2017, he worked as an assistant professor at the Department of Bohemian Studies at the University of Wroclaw, Institut de la Logie in Wroclaw, and since 2017, He's been assistant professor at the Department of Bohemian Studies in the Faculty of Arts at Palatsky University in Olomouc, uh, where he supervises instruction and research in the fields of literary theory, literary criticism, and digital humanities and literary studies. Thank you very much, and many thanks for greater organization and for the opportunity uh, to stand here with my uh, article, which is anti-bibliographic, which is first of all, the novel. Thank
title of the soldier. Uh, should I? So uh, I will do my main uh, goal uh, is to find the structure of a fictional rock uh, topography in this novel and uh, to try to explain their character. But why by using uh, literary cartography? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay. 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 So, last sentence was, why by using a literary cartography? So, let me please say a few, a couple of words about this uh, discipline, which as, uh, its name suggests is uh, inter interdisciplinary. Literary cartography has, in recent years, uh, established itself good in the field of literary studies and uh, cartography. A good overview of the possibilities that maps and cartographic methods provide for literary scholarship and vice versa is given by uh, many monographs. For uh, example, uh, I can name literary mapping in the digital age. The monograph which was uh, published in uh, 2016, or another monograph, literary and uh, cartography theories, histories, genre, which was uh, published one year later. But just briefly, literary cartographic models can serve various purposes for literary scholars. They can map authors' uh, biography, map fictional places and routes investigate how topographical practice is translated into fiction, into literary fiction, or explore what is the reader's experience with fictional locations. It's, it, it's um, you know, so-called uh, deep maps, for example. Cartographic models also provide us uh, with a useful schematic representation of the structuring of the fictional environment. In addition, they allow numerous comparisons. So what we can compare, uh, we can compare multiple models of different fictional topographies of the same place or even of different places. In our case, of course, Prague, it will be Prague, and uh, see how it has changed over time and how this change is related to a particular genre, for example. Or otherwise, we can compare models of fictional topographies with real historical topographies, which also change. This can be very useful for the analysis of fictional topography, not only in a particular work, but also in a group of works. So uh, in my conference paper, I will try to focus on both main aspects. Here, the first comparison uh, of the model of fictional topography in Hashi's novel with other such models. And the second uh, main goal is comparison of the fictional topography with the real one, but not to look for correlations, but to investigate how and if at all the fictional topography changes under the influence of the real topography and what its significance is. Now, in this figure, uh, you can see a basic model of relations between a, a fictional world on the top and the map on the one side and the real world, the real topography, and the map of the other. Maps, as we know, are not exact representations of the real world because they depend on the type of map, method of mapping, and the selection of futures. And the same situation a please uh, applies for the relationship between fictional world and the map. But maps can provide to us schematic models of real topography and it's their power. Fictional topography can be mapped in a, a lot 
analogous way, especially if it's strongly inspired by a specific place. However, some specific conditions apply for mapping fictional topography. So uh, currently GIS, this is the basic scheme of GIS uh, model, the basic, the basic layer, and uh, there's some other layer uh, which hold uh, some information, you know, some topographic information. So currently uh, GIS is used in a literary cartography, but it has its drawbacks. Automatically identifying places and uh, routes and projecting them onto real maps, for uh, example, Google Maps or OpenStreetMaps can make the resulting fictional topographic model less clear as it requires precise coordinates for each entity on the map. But as we know, many places are not clearly declared in the fiction. Many do not even have a specific name, nor the characters pass, always follow a clearly defined route, etc. Moreover, if we are mapping a fictional world, that it's inspired by an older topography of a place that no longer exists, the current maps will not be suitable for this purpose. <laughs> so here you can see uh, one of uh, GIS model of Shades fictional topography in Hashi's first part, created by Zdeněk Stenigmaler. So I have three to take these aspects into account in my research. This is also the reason why I use the historical map of Prague, which I redraw into a blind map. This procedure has its advantages. We work with a historical topography map as a basic layer. Thank you, Bogomil. We can compare the situation between real historical topography and uh, fictional topography. We can eliminate all unnecessary information from the original map. So, um, oh, yeah, this is this is uh, these points uh, I speak about. And uh, on the next slide, you can see the resulting base layer. Uh, this is a blind map of, uh, of a Prague. So what was the next step in my methodology? In the next step, I insert information from the topography of the fictional world of the Hashish novel into this layer, and I differentiated them according to several criteria. Uh, I differentiated um, uh, the routes and the places, by a narrator speech, by Shwek speech, another character speech, the specific places the narrator is talking about, there's a blue area, and so on the specific places Shwek is, is talking about, the unspecific places the narrator is talking about, unspecific places Shwek is talking about, specific rules the narrator is talking about, the specific rules Shwek is talking uh, about. Uh, this method. Uh, allows a uh, typology of uh, places to be distinguished according to the speech layers of narratives. Also, what does the topography of Prague look like in the first part of Hasek's famous novels? As we can see in this picture, the fictional topography is chaotic and systematic. Disordered, zigzag. So, how can one explain this situation? Uh, I mean, it's uh, very useful if we have another maps of fictional topography from other works which can be compared. For this reason, I used cart cartographic models of fictional topographies in selected novels by Jakub Arbas. Jakub Arbas was a Czech writer from the second part of the 19th century. 
I know this is somewhat uh, uh, asynchronous comparison. Uh, it, it would be better to compare Hashek with Kafka or Gustav Meiring, but these maps are not yet uh, available. In this uh, two uh, pictures, on, in these two figures, you see the topography model of Arbus's novel, the, the devil, yeah, the devil on the on the rack, and the network model, which is made from roots of narrator. This topographic situation is uh, characterized by a binary topography paradigm, which is based on the confrontation between center and the periphery. So uh, the next slide shows the topography model of Arbus novel, Sank Savarius, and the network uh, model on the right side here. We can see a much stronger opposition binary paradigm, which is further enhanced by a distinct centrality. Centrality is a characteristic of the inner city and the periphery, as you see in this uh, figure. For these models, the moment of crossing the border is very important because from this moment, the plot gradually culminates and everything that happens from this moment on fateful changes the lives of the protagonists. Uh, on the next slide here, you can see the topographic model of Arbus novel, the Great Eight Demon, and the network uh, model. If you look at these two models, you can see that the paradigm of binarity breaks down. A new paradigm is emerging. We can describe it as a diffuse here. Uh, as a diffuse network or as a hint of a diffuse network. But this change is happening slowly. If you look at the network model, we see that the binary principle is based on boundary crossing is still preserved. Thus, the transition from one topographic paradigm to another occurs only at a certain structure level. So, and here, on the next slide is, uh, is uh, here, is the topographic model of Arbus Novel, the Miracles Madonna. And on the right side, the network model. This situation is quite different from the previous examples. The paradigm of the diffuse network of uh, fictional topography is fully manifested here in both models. The path of the characters described uh, the path is uh, in the network models yeah, and are uh, distinguished by color. So the paths of the characters describe imaginary cycles that intersect each other. In this prose, Arbus thematizes the labyrinthine topography of a crowd in which characters wander, describe circles, stop, and pass each other. The Prague environment is transformed into an intertwined urban network that absorbs people and makes them lonely, which is one of the basic feelings of the modern man lost inside a modern city. Arbus seems to foreshadow this feeling in his, in his prose. In the time I have closed, I cannot interpret these uh, models in details. And of course, my goal is different. I presented these models because they are useful for contextualizing further interpretation. Uh, so please look again on the topography situation in Shui. As I said, it's chaotic and disorganized. But if we try to distinguish the places that the narrator speaks about and which are connected with the circuit of the CNK police and army from the places that Schweik speaks about and which are connected with the periphery, we obtain 
this model. Respectively, this model where all symbols are hidden. We can, what we can observe, we can observe the blending of one area into another, specifically the center to the periphery and the vice versa. The boundaries between two, uh, the two parts are literally blurring. The result is confusion, the irregular incorporation of one topographical framework into the other. In the models that touch on our versus pros, we saw how important the border is for structure, prag fictional topography. Uh, this was due, uh, due, the, uh, due uh, to the uh, gender, because Arbus um, you know, wrote novel with mystery, and because the contemporary topography. Almost through the entire 19th century, the actual topography of Prague did not change fundamentally, but something is happening. Since the 1870s, the city walls have been gradually demolished. On the periphery, the number of sorry, uh, the number of inhabitants and uh, houses is increasing. Uh, in uh, this figure, we we can uh, we can see uh, the colored lines uh, that uh, index it, uh, the growing uh, number of black uh, uh, inhabitants in a uh, black periphery. That uh, is Zizko uh, Smikov. Uh, and uh, so on. And uh, in the, uh, on the next figure, we can see an analogous situation uh, in a number of houses in Prague, district uh, between these years. Yeah. And the uh, Prague periphery is growing. Yeah. And the uh, uh, center uh, of Prague uh, is uh, stagnated or go down. Yeah. A major, a major intervention in uh, Prague's topography was the Prague uh, sanitation, which took place between the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century. You can see on these pictures how it fell out. The result of these changes was the Prague of uh, the 20th uh, century a modernized growing city like Paris or Vienna. Then in 1922, the peripheral districts of Prague were officially merged into a single urban unit called Rated Prague. Hasek wrote his novel after First World War and published it the first part in 1921. And the phenomenon of the growing Prague periphery had a great impact on his novel. If the real topography of Prague is expanding, the fictional topography reflects this situation, but implements it in its own way, which we can call as infiltration of the periphery, of the periphery into the urban center and vice versa. As uh, I argued above, my aim is not to find differences between real and fictional topography because how we were real fictional topography may seem, it's always a part of a fictional world. It's uh, therefore necessary to explain also what our topographic model means. Literary topography is of course only one of many structural levels of the literary work. I'll remind you of an earlier schema now, which demonstrates this situation. If you look on the right side, mm -hmm. you will see other basic important structural levels of the work. It's multi topics, compositions, descriptions, narrations, point of view, 
and uh, so on. Also, <clears throat> another necessary step to interpret our model is to link the fictional topography to some of these layers. Shrake's speech is, of course, very significant in Hashik's novel. Shrake's speech is, in Milan Jankovic's words, full of irony, paradox, illogical conclusions, cynicism, swearing, etc. Shrake's reaction to other characters' speeches are as if taken out of context. Although Shrake always reacts to what someone says to him, but in an absurd way. In its essence, Shrake's speech is subversive. Through his speech activity, Schweik infiltrates and undermines any topic, most often socially serious and important topics. No situation in the novel is spurred this deconstructive force. Schweik's speech has the effect of dissolving the seriousness of the C and K police and army into an absolutely panoptic picture. If I uh, attempt a schematic representation of this micro composition, I can offer the following schema. And I mean, the Bogumil uh, speak about, about this micro composition. Yeah, this one is uh, the situation when Shrek uh, comments of individual parts of the motive and develops them. And uh, uh, absolute is the, for example, the introduction of the novel. Uh, this, this situation and the and the other uh, uh, main uh, structure is uh, uh, if uh, Schweik responds to the particle motives with his commentary and continues by developing in his uh, own uh, commentary. Uh, so uh, uh, <clears throat> I will show once again the situation of overlapping of uh, different topographic areas in Hashik's uh, first part, famous uh, novel. The, the subversive character and deconstructive power of Schweig's speeches is an integral part of Schweig circle. This is the red or the pink uh, area, yeah. An urban periphery that, like Schweig's speech, breaks into the center. The fluid and the pulsating boundaries of a fictional topography have the same function in the work as Schweik's words, but on different structure level. The binary between center and periphery is abolished, nor is there any clear boundary of transition. The periphery spills over into the center and mixes with it at the borders of the transition. If I still have a time, yeah, I would, uh, I would like to um, uh, comment one more uh, fact related uh, to the topography of the, of the novel. In his study, uh, Circular Patterns, Hashik and the Good Soldier Shrey from 1981, Lugumir Dolezal, uh, writes about three uh, topographic uh, circuits that Schweig described in his wandering. The first is pre-military circuit, second is a military circuit, and the last one is uh, the Boudoir's analysis. I will focus, of course, on the first two sections because they relate to the first part of Hashik's uh, novel. Uh, if you look at this model, you can see the network of journeys taken by the characters in the novel. We can clearly identify the pre-military circle formed by Schweik's journey between the police institutions and the psychiatric hospital. This is the, the blue lines, yeah, the blue lines. At the behest of the police uh, bureaucrats and doctors, Schweik make this unthinking circle to eventually arrive back where it all began at the Kalikaba. 
if you look uh, uh, at Schweik's army route with the uh, red lines, yeah, there is no cycle, but the route is linear. This is uh, understandable as the linearity develops the story in which we follow Schweik's absolute uh, advent, uh, uh, adventures. Circularity and linearity are the other two basic topographic modes of the first part of the Hushek's uh, novel. Who, circularity and linearity belong to a common axiological paradigm of the fin uh, fictional world that shapes the power structures of the police and the military. But circularity and linearity are also uh, mutually exclusive. The two trajectories are actually contradictory. The fundamental uh, difference between the two formations lies in the intersection or non-intersection of the start and end points. The principle of circularity is also clearly visible in the actions of characters belonging to C and K institutions. These characters blindly repeat the rigid rules of the police or military order. The combination of uh, the circularity with the, blue, with the blue lines, yeah, and linear principles, the red lines, create an absurd model where the two modes contradict each other. If you add to these structures, Schweig's subversive speeches and uh, the confusing nature of fictional topography where the periphery infiltrates the center, we can also understand the relationship between circularity and linearity as confusingly subversive. And uh, here is the last, the last uh, uh, side, my conclusions. So in all the examples of the novel structure layers just mentioned, it has on the level of species and micro composition, on the level of fictional topography, and uh, on the level of the network models uh, that the specialist Schweig's uh, journeys through Prague, we can observe a strange relationship between two paradigms. The first consisting of state power, the second of the figure of Schweig representing the popular component, which is characterized on the one hand by mutual penetration, on the other by mutual distancing resulting from, from mutual incompatibility. The basic principle permitting the various structural levels of Hashi's novel is one of these that significantly mine not only the topography of uh, Hashim novel, but also as a uh, result, the complex nature of uh, Hashim Phoenix uh, war. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. This is uh, fascinating for me. I, I've done a little Thank experimentation uh, yeah. on uh, oh, mapping in yeah. um, uh, my writer's in Prague, of course, and I, 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 we actually developed it, or I didn't develop it, some, some of the geeks here at Columbia developed some software to, to help students experiment with literary mapping, so this is great yeah. to see how the pros do it. Um, yeah. I wonder Thank if you, you could maybe pull up one of the maps, uh, maybe the, the overlapping blue, blue and red there that showed the, the, the official. This one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where the, the pink is the periphery and the red is the periphery and that's Schweik's world and yes. the blue is the official world. So where where is Ukalika? Where is Ukalika? Ukalika is, is uh, somewhere here. It's in the, yeah. the overlap, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yes. 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 Uh, so, yeah, um, maybe. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So because yeah. you don't see Brett Schneider there, so the yeah, official yeah, yeah, world yeah. is exactly exactly with yeah. The, yeah. The, the, yeah. Uh, the popular world. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Uh, yeah. What is the red circle? Yeah. Inside the blue, inside the blue, and uh, arena. You could make it bigger, perhaps. Yes. The other map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Red, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
inside. Number 16. Yeah. I understand you, uh, you, yes. asked, me, uh, 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 you asked me about no. this line. No, 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 no. Circles. Yeah. So, uh, 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 let's go inside the area. What's uh, the red? Is the uh, in the blue? Yeah, yeah, in the blue. Yeah, yeah. 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 okay, 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 okay. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a one part where, uh, where a shake. The one part, yeah, yeah, it's a uh, where Shrek meet with uh, uh, I don't know uh, the name of the of the character, uh, and he and he speak about the dog. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, the, uh, um, I, it was before they stole. Before they yes. Stole yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Exactly. Yes. 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 Okay. But I can't remember the name of the pub. It's not named actually. Just yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. By yes. the uh, by the steps down from the bus. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. The the public has uh, has uh, a name. Yeah. Yeah. The Yeah. 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 <laughs> I wonder if, if you could um, could you tell us about uh, the I mean what is uh, uh, the techniques that you use to create these maps? Did you, did you need a lot of uh, computing power to do this? Or no, no, no. Uh, uh, this map is is creating uh, manually. I uh, create in a in a Adobe uh, Illustrator. Okay. Because uh, using uh, GIS techniques, it's not uh, ideal for uh, for mapping. Uh, but if you use uh, GIS, yeah. so you need exact yeah exact longitude latitude uh, numbers, and does not matter use these methods and create it now. But uh, I'm not sure if it's useful for literary uh, interpretation. Yeah, because it's, it's uh, I don't know uh, what it means. Yeah, um, he described the uh, rules of characters and and but but this map, I mean, it's for tourists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe not uh, not for analysis, fictional topography, um, locations and the routes and so on. Do you think you get any? Anything more useful by combining the GIS technology with a historical map? Uh, yes, uh, it can be, but um, uh, uh, I don't know the. Uh, if you ask me about the software, mm -hmm. or I don't know any software which can combine this, uh, these two layers, so historical and uh, GIS methods, uh, historical maps and the GIS methods. But uh, as I said, um, uh, many information in the fictional world we don't know. Yeah. It's imprecise. Yes, yes. And uh, we don't know an uh, uh, exact location territory yeah? because the narrator can say uh, uh, there was uh, in, uh, uh, there was happened in a street and some, some name. And we know yeah. exactly where. And if you use a GIS, you have to put have to correctly, them. yeah, numbers. That's the limit of it. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, yes. of course. It's very useful in some ways, but uh, the kind of conceptual things, and it, yeah, you need something fuzzy, I guess, to, yeah. to draw the right picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Peter. I have a question, maybe, Mr. President. Uh, if I look at it from kind of my limited perspective, uh, the difference between cartography and uh, typography yes. is the, the difference for time in this uh, story versus plot. Yeah. Kind of real, real, natural question, real, natural setup, and then you reform it through this, this, this narrative technique. That is what it means. However, there is kind of a, a quote at then by Michael Lachin, yes. who speaks about Chronos. Yeah. And, and emerging. Time and space together. Can, can it be done or? Yes. Uh, of both, uh, of course. Uh, 
So what uh, you see in my presentation is a result is uh, or, or, or uh, this this is a result of uh, many layers. So the layers um, uh, index uh, index the charters uh, of Hashem novels. So that can be the answer for for a question. I don't know. I'm not sure, but. Uh, I, uh, I believe that these uh, cartographic uh, methods can, uh, how to say, uh, can reflect uh, not only uh, locations or uh, space uh, structure, uh, they can reflect uh, also uh, time uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the plot or in the story. Yeah. It's possible, of course. What does it mean when we want to look at another dimension? Namely, count the number of words in Hashek's, in Schweik's narratives, anecdotes, and so on, yeah. and correlate it with this map. For instance, if he is at a military hospital, he doesn't talk much. So we could conclude that if he spoke six words at that location, that location that would indicate that he is actually in a, in a, that he's oppressed. <laughs> that he has he's missing the the, the uh, freedom of speech. Yeah. And we could uh, have a whole map of freedom of speech. Yes. Yeah. Uh, projected on crime. Yes. Yeah. I think if it yes. could turn out that in peripheries, he. The the the, the 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 narratives are longer, and that in the center the picture is shorter. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Thank you. I don't know. I don't know. It's um, very talkative. I don't know, but it's a good idea. Yeah. So, in the case, I didn't mean it so serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I like it. Let <laughs> me explain. Awesome. I like these maps a lot, the, the different territories going over each other, or just yeah. looking at the only, the only space that's, that's like overlapping is now Boish, you know, it's the kind of war zone between. Yeah. Yeah. And also Carlin, right? Yes, Carlin. Right. The kind of the. the Carlin. Yeah. 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 So the marks. yeah. And yeah. Where, that's also where, where the where Cats lives, right? Also Cats is yeah. in Carlin. Yeah. 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 Um, it's worth, I mean, it's really nice to see in relation to a book that is kind of about no man's land. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean about this one? No, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the book in general. There's this question of no man's land that I, I see going through. And when Shrey gets up, it's not clear whose army he's fighting for. He's like wearing, you know, yeah, he's wearing Russian uniform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bounding yeah. the space that's between the two armies. In some ways, he always occupies this space between two different constituents, right? So two masters, but then two masters. So this is nice. But then, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about um, James Scott seeing like a state. You know, that book seemed like a state. It thinks about ways of. Um, Imagining uh, looking at the world from the perspective of the state, thinking about the ways in which it's it's actually very contrary to everyday life to be mm -hmm. ecosystems, to live within, it creates monocultures, mm -hmm. vision spaces. Um, it makes me think that really what you need is you need a different way of mapping the space world than you do for the uh, the imperial. Yes, you can't see, you can't see them both in the same place because that's Already the state is Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is fabulous too. So, were you mapping um, locations that Shay talks about? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it's what he talks about as opposed to where he is thinking at. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So the so the pink area is the stuff that we hear about from Sheikh. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I just maybe. Um, so yeah, yeah. Sorry. 
you do your rebuttal. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this is uh, this is both. Yeah, if the narrator speaks uh, uh, about uh, Schweik is uh, in um, Ukrakapab, so it's a uh, bit uh, uh, the same color as if Schweik had been talking about. Uh, sorry, no, 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 no. no. Uh, the blue is uh, the places and the roots. Uh, the the uh, narrator speaks about. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, I'll, okay. I make this in my mind. Sorry. I, I think we would come into this conversation, but we, we do want to stay more or less on the schedule, and we ran a bit over with the, the previous paper. If if I'm lucky, and if we're all lucky, there's going to be hot coffee next door. Uh, so let, let's see if that happens. We can see the conversation there. And Brian, get our next talk up at 3.30. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah well it's not what you get so that we can do but I'm also interested in like this work as a second project about socialist. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, in this place, we have to have a different that we're going to do on the same side. It's a special the Soviet Union. It's for the next couple of years. All right. But basically, yeah. Under the guise of their literary yeah. organization, yeah. they start producing this, uh, this journal that's been yeah. 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 in the Soviet Union. And when the Bible speaks, starting in 
and, and saying like, you know, can't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but but they do. They bring them in, and so this shows that there is this actually very interesting, flexible like, understanding of world literature that they develop. That is ideological and aesthetic, but they're very open about what that is. And so they're also people from China, India, Vietnam, very early on, uh, South America. Um, in fact, in 1936, they had an issue that's entirely dedicated to South American activism. Uh, what is the shortest policy of like? So it's a what I'm kind of working here is thinking about how we can understand this word in the literature and we can kind of take it and apply to what we're kind of trying to come up with. So we have a book about Chinese yeah. uh, there, I, I think I did. I have not read it yet. Right, right. But, it's kind of a, it's, um, but it's just kind of a similar situation yeah. where you have yeah. some kind of a that's right. A local center where uh, yeah. try to produce it up from there. The story is partly about how it also like does this like every yeah. that is since we cut things. That's right. <laughs> but but again, like a similar. Yeah. I'm just because I'm working on I'm, I'm working on. Yeah. Uh, Kind of related and of course, uh, of course, there is like this massive yeah. right up rise right. translation actually of course what I'm talking about so we have a massive database which is like a pretty unique all the variant right because they came to any and all foreign languages that was produced during communism but it goes from 1980 right right so we can actually so so it's a beautiful some of it is messy it's like a digitized from like a type of thing so yeah, that's a good thing. The amazing thing is how you can see how um, Hungarian can translate into what I'm not calling personal literature. Right. Is a very different canon. Yeah. So what gets translated into second world literature. And, and so, like, one can actually see on that model. How oh, they're reading yeah. is exactly yeah. as you say. Yep. It's like it's a different uh, and it's exactly. Different. exactly. And so I have an article that's in the review right now at the yeah. Journal of World Literature oh, part of the yeah. uh, yeah. uh yeah. this yeah. article yeah. 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 and uh it's on uh who is Peter Bedrush, who is a quote unquote Czech poet, but really he's saying I think it's a second dialect without their knowledge of the Egypt. This is a mining area, steel mill system, and he becomes a pillar of socialist literature. And he can translate into all the languages of the socialist But he's been translating twice into English. The very bad translation. And it was actually done as part of this, you know, way in kind of even spread communism over here. And so he becomes a great part of socialist literature. But everywhere else is right. But the, but the way this happens is that this right thing makes their way into right. this. That's right. Uh, that's right. That's right. And, and then, and then ooh, one of the yeah. Americans I'm trying to play with Sardar oh, yeah. is that because he doesn't fit into a national panel. Yeah, our question on the association that we get him. We have no reason to like read him. Yeah. Now, this like, national yeah. apparatus. So, what we're trying to find out right, is how reified the yeah. nation is in our construct of world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm so, I mean, there's like a massive, there's like a, some kind of whole group of communists, right? There's a point where he actually becomes unclear what language they need to write in. Yeah. Because so many of them start to just write in Russian. Right. But then, like, we, this bibliography, like, this. Them, but it's like right. don't publish the originals yeah. right like know right right uh, but then then that stuff gets like into various like you know languages of various yeah yeah but yeah no so this is this is this and this is what i find really fascinating is that you know, yeah. we do have this other like way of thinking about this and and my my big bugaboo you honestly with also this is this major problem of nature of the problem of nation but how we consistently rely on nationality on the nation everything around national 
Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. And, I mean, that was like, I mean, it, just to kind of zigzag from this to that, I mean, because basically, I mean, I was almost like waiting for you to, to say, like, well, I mean, there's a better of Henderson model. Right. Um, Print therapy, etc. Right. And um, is like the, the, no, thank you. There is no imagine there are these things. Although exactly. I mean I would agree with Dr. Boslav that yeah, but it always presupposes this other thing. So it's like it doesn't quite operate independently. Yeah, no, it doesn't. But, but, but it is, is an important. Could it? I mean, is there, is there a difference? Is, is there the utopian so principle behind it? I think that's what's there. Right, right, right now, we're getting idea of possibly yeah. them being beyond. As, 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 as with many utopias, they are kind of actually yeah. like vectors of that's the right. existing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's but right. I, but I really like the, the, the uh, so she's just coming back. I didn't I know. Yeah, no, I absolutely. Yeah, it's basically basically you are talking about the real literature that's emerging. Where literature actually is literature rather than a lot of this kind of translations, but. Something that is connected by something other than that's right, that's right, that's right. 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 You become a part of it, yeah, yeah. And, and opposed to having to sort of fight for your place by saying, you know, I'm the best Thai writer of the 20th century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. And, I mean, there's, there, there, I mean, there clearly is, I mean, clearly yeah. that is the dominant model. Right. But uh, like imagining alternatives, and this is kind of the thing about the old, that's right. The, 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 the Eastern Bloc is that there was, however, However, imperfect, or, yeah, 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 yeah. but there were these like, yeah. uh, and, and, and you know, David Damrosh and I, I don't know, I like the way he thinks about all the literature. Yeah. Part of what he uh, uh, argues yeah. is for us, you want to true to the text, true to the works, yeah. to see him like he is like on it. Yeah. 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 I think this is where we have our most positive, you know, happy to make angels, if you will, yeah. is by doing yeah. this. And I think yeah. it's imagining yeah. a different way of approaching yeah. it just enriches our understanding of what the literature is. Is. And so just trying it. And we'll see. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, and so, so, so the book is going to be. So there's there's actually two projects I'm coming out of this. One is trying to think through this other way of world literature and to think through it as a through the journals and through the institutions. So the, the Gork Institute and the journals are thinking about how world well is structured. The other one I want to write is actually fit on Bruno Yashinsky. On Bruno Yashinsky, the guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's going to be called Bruno Yashinsky Internationalist. And it's his search to try to be something that is not national. Right. And because this is something that yeah. all these people throughout his life of yeah. being either, you know, pushed into a corner as a poet right. or, you know, uh, even he's eventually purged because they, they, they claim the Stalinist community uh, uh, and put his Polishness behind it. Uh, and yet he, his final work at a construction novel written about Tajikistan in Russia. Right. right. And he's like really trying to give up on his own. And so, and, and is it ever possible? Does he continue writing the way he's writing in Polish? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He starts writing on the on the international But it's also kind of as bad an international language, but, you know, and, and as this, you know, in the same way that writing in English and it might be a similar gesture. It's kind of a weird thing with a bunch of communists who. you know, I mean, our our problem with this, like, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not sure.
If you don't have song, uh, I lost the lead to my too much. That's my mouse factory. Is this related? Yes. No, no, no. Give it to me. I'm we were all sitting here in the Thanksgiving that we all Look at our coffee house coffees. Even from an American perspective, you could have started risking like paying shop there. No, for you, could I ask you to move it gradually to your perspective? You are not a full shopper in that. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, but that's exactly that's the correct idea. Right, right. 
All right, now we have to now we really are going to get to it. I was just testing it before. Um, yeah, I realize uh, I have one more thank you I want to say. I think it's a lot of thank yous, but uh, they're all due. Um, of course, I'm very grateful to all the participants for coming and, and sharing their ideas and for coming this way. I want to say an extra thank you to those participants who managed to find uh, resources at their own institutions to bring them here because even as well endowed an institution as the Hanan had to kind of stretch to make this uh, happen, and it, it really is important that some of you were able to do that. So thank you, thank your institutions. They, I consider the institutions that are doing that to be our co-sponsors. So uh, it is very much appreciated. Uh, so I would like to introduce our next speaker. Mark Lipovetsky was born and educated in the Soviet Union and has lived and taught in the United States since 1996. His research uh, uh, interests include post-Soviet culture, Russian post-modernism, post-Soviet drama, late Soviet non-conformist culture, and tricksters in Soviet culture. Uh, he edited the five-volume edition of the collected works of Dmitry Brigov, and he is currently working on a critical biography of Brigov. I finished. Oh, well, so we have to... <laughs> I, I, I was quoting from an old biography. Of it's right there on display. <laughs> well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> His works have been nominated for the uh, Russian Little Booker Prize from 1997, shortlisted for the Andrei Bieli Prize from 2008. Uh, in 2014, uh, Lipovetsky received uh, the award of the American Association of Teachers of Slavic and East European Languages for outstanding contribution to scholarship. Uh, in 2019, he was awarded uh, the Andrei Gelly Prize for his service to Russian literature. 
uh, A History of Russian Literature from Oxford Press in 2018, which Lipovetsky co-authored, uh, received honorable mention for the Aldo and Jean uh, Scaglioni Prize for Studies in Slavic Languages and Literatures from the Modern Languages Association. And anyone in our field can tell you that it's really a generational book. I think every, every generation that's lucky gets a, a, a major kind of textbook like this. Um, uh, and it's really, I think, been a huge resource. And <laughs> besides that, uh, I can say that Mark has been with us in the Slavic Department at Columbia University since 2019. That sound right, and uh, has completely transformed the place, uh, uh, just taking things up about three speeds higher uh, and, and levels of intensity. Uh, Mark, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And, and uh, I should say that I'm very much humbled to be in, in, in this company of experts in, in Schweik. And uh, I, as Chris mentioned, I am studying tricksters and studying not only uh, Soviet or Russian tricksters, I'm, I'm looking broader and here, here is my colleague and uh, digital assistant with whom we are uh, teaching this semester a course on global trips and we have a class of Shvek as well but of course uh, my expertise is nothing in comparison with yours uh, so uh, obviously uh, I'm looking at Shvek as no it doesn't work again no. uh, so, uh, I'm looking I'm looking at Shvek as one of uh, uh, pictures in the uh, world culture, and uh, certainly, um, Drixus uh, exists uh, all through the, 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 the history of multiple uh, cultures and maybe all cultures, right? And we see them both in mythology and uh, in, in, in modern eras. Uh, and uh, also, of course, there are, there are multiple types of uh, tricksters from uh, fools to Picaro, from uh, for example, jester to imposter, and, and I'm, I'm not going to, to dive into this typology only, only briefly as much as it relates to, to uh, Shvek. Uh, so to, 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 to make uh, this, this huge world of tricksters manageable, um, I, I sort of summarized uh, uh, their multiple features, uh, features in what I call the trickster trope. <coughs> And as you can see, sort of I isolate four major uh, features, which which find its manifestations in, in different characteristics in every trickster. Uh, there is a different ensemble of uh, uh, how ambivalence, transgression, liminality, and laughter manifest uh, themselves. Uh, but uh, uh, Shriek, Shriek, of course, uh, can be characterized from all these uh, perspectives, and we can see. The more and, and lots of uh, characteristics have been mentioned today. Just at the previous session, it was mentioned that he's always in between, even, even specially, right? Uh, and uh, uh, that that certainly characterizes the minality, the, the multiple debates about his politics, whether he's a rebel or conformist, uh, certainly um, fall into uh, ambivalence category, right? And 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 of course, his his laughter is quite quite critical for uh, our understanding of this character as well. Um, and uh, certainly it's uh, nothing new in saying that that uh, uh, Schweik is a trickster. He was frequently compared with, with famous trickers just, just today. Peter spoke about Odysseus and certainly that's, that's uh, the context, uh, nice. the criticism as far as we know. <laughs> he had been compared with Sancho Panza and Sam Weller uh, Simplicimus and Clown of God and, and many other uh, characters from this list. So uh, what, what I'm trying to suggest here in, in, in this talk, I, I'm trying to, to compare him with, with Soviet tricksters and I'm, I believe that there are some, some very interesting typological parallels that, that allow to see something that, that uh, otherwise wouldn't be obvious perhaps. Uh, so Soviet literature of the 1920th, and I'm limiting myself by, by this uh, period because that's, that's where Schweig belongs, um, produced a number of memorable tricks of characters and uh, Babel's gangster being a creek. Uh, Ilya Ehrenburg produced, oh, sorry, that's Alyashos Ivan Babichev uh, from, from his uh, famous uh, Zavist. Uh, uh, so something happened with my... Skipped I, I skipped it, I'm sorry, okay. it was there. Okay. So uh, Ilya Ehrenburg produced at least two, two memorable tricks as one in his 
1921 novel Julio Curinita, and then um, so it's also a trick of Schlimazel, Lazi uh in, in 1928. Um, uh, Andrei Platonov's uh, Doubtful Makar is also sort of in this category. And of course, finally, Astab Bender, uh, who, who, who had become the most famous of this uh, in, in, in this gallery of treatises, although not, not the last one. In my understanding, these were the trickster narratives in which the Soviet cynic, who secretly hated the Soviet life, but really nearly followed its demands, has been transformed from the slave of circumstances into an active and independent participant of the so social drama, and even into an artistic manifestation of freedom. In other words, the meaning of the trickster narrative or other narratives lays in its ability to return the agency and not only to subalterns, but also to all those who either avoided Soviet channels for agency expression or were isolated. This character's healthy cynicism in relation to the deadening and inhuman system had been pioneered by Schwitt. Uh, Russian translations of Hasek's novel uh, became available only in 1926 from German and then in 1929 from Czech. Uh, and thus, it's pretty impossible to suppose to support the theory of Hasek's direct influence on creators of Soviet tricks and narratives, with one notable exception. Ilya Edinburgh uh, probably read Hasek's novel in German. And he directly admitted that his Lazi Krishtvanitz, Akas Shrik, and he, he, he was calling him Jewish <laughs> um, However, uh, typological Akas are much more important and interesting in this case. Both Shrik and Soviet tricksters manifest existential and political scenarios, cynical and cheerful at the same time, that could help the individual to survive and even to thrive in the real wind of historical catastrophes which explains tremendous popularity of all these characters and tremendous popularity of Schwedt in, in the Soviet Union, which is, of course, having a gulf for it. Uh, Soviet tricks of the 1920s typically represent one of two dominant models. They are either ironic messiahs or critical fools. Uh, ironic messiahs not only performatively deconstruct fundamental discourses and practices, of uh, the Soviet utopia, but through their own playful discourses and lifestyle offer models of existence alternative to the Soviet normativity. Critical thoughts embody the position of an ultimate victim of modernity and its experiments. Albeit trampled and marginalized, they nevertheless are critical of power and hegemony and incessantly produce prosaic estrangement uh, of modern discourses, as Bakhtin wrote, by means of uncomprehending stupidity. <laughs> Schwieg, as I will argue, paradoxically combines these two strategies. He fuses the position of an ultimate victim and fool, in, in air quotes, but I will be trying to, to do it all the time, so just a minute, uh, with the position of the ironic messiah performatively embodying alternatives to the catastrophic modernity. Let's begin with an obvious, a status of the fool who mirrors and exaggerates the absurd of the system by his idiocy, uh, apparent idiocy, serves as the foundation for Schwieg's personal autonomy and agency within the repressive machine of the state and the army. Critics discuss similarities of the good soldier Schwieg with Robles Gargantua and Pantigrel. Their kinship cannot be reduced to latrine humor only Rather, it indicates deep connections of Hasek's novel and his protagonist with folk and urban culture of irreverent, irreverent laughter that Bakhtin described as carnival culture. In his works of the late 30s, sorry, Bakhtin not only inscribes a fool into the carnivalesque context, but also interprets uh, this cultural figure. Ah, is it moving by itself? <laughs> um, and this cultural figure. Uh, as a mobile carnival of sorts. For him, the character is more important as the vehicle of the carnivalesque worldview outside of the carnival. The inverted logic of the carnival's world upside down serves as the motivation for laughter at the fool and by the fool. Bakhtin characterizes uh, 
it as time honors honored fools right not to understand the uh, right to confuse to tease to hyperbolize life the right to parody others while talking the right to not be taken literally not to be oneself and finally the right to betray uh, to the public a personal life down to its most private and brilliant little secrets and and I think I think we can see all these characteristics in Schwieg, uh, and uh, that they are well summarized uh, by Schwieg's apparent idiocy, and can be illustrated by multiple examples. Much has been said about Schwieg's ability to use a mask of an idiot as a surviving mechanism and defense against the aggressive machine of the imperial army trying to consume and destroy him. In all situations, however, Schwieg's actions either invert the disciplinary dogmas, Schweig leading his drunken escort when being under arrest, or aggravate chaos hidden underneath the military and imperial order. He thus invariably acts as a paragon of chaos, like all uh, the tricksters since, since the ancient times. And here I have the quote from one of the first studies of mythological tricksters by, by Carl Carini, the, the, the classical scholar. Um, like other characters of this kind, Schwieg doesn't have any possessions and dependencies uh, and uses his body, and especially guts and lower body stratum, um, for doing something that I, I lost my mm -hmm. All right. uh, Body stratum as the means to deflate and subvert the murderous power of the military system. However, Schwieg is not only a fool, but also a picker, wrong. Uh, the relation between these aspects of his character has long been a source of the critical debate. Why uh, was his idiocy genuine or was he only shaming, shaming? It is not surprising that the reader is confused when so many of the characters in the book are bewildered. Uh, and quote asks uh, Cecil Perot in his monogram. Sometimes, especially during uh, Schweig's service to, to Lukács, uh, he seems to wish the best to his master, but invariably creates trouble for him acting as an honest fool. In others, like demonstrations of his patriotism before the security commission or from the wheelchair, or during the Budovitz Anabasis, he seems to fit uh, perfectly Lieutenant Duke's uh, definition. This man, sir, pretends to be a half-wit for the sole purpose of concealing his rascality under the mask of imbecility. Uh, even a better fit would be Bakhtin's characterization of this of the clown truth as a rogue who dons the mask of a fool in order to motivate distortions and shuffling of languages and labels, thus unmasking them by not understanding them. So I, I think that these two statements uh, are very, very similar. Um, this, this fluid combination of features characteristic for various tricks and types because, because just a full rock are different tricks and types. Uh, they, they're quite typical in the 20th century. They resonate well with similar synthetic tricksters as represented by Soviet ironic messiahs. So tricksters since the 20th were engaged in ideological debates in which they not only methodically deconstructed emerging discourses of official Soviet modernity, but also introduced metaphorically or performatively alternative models of modern subject, and even sometimes of modernity in general. For example, and I give only one example because, of course, I don't have time for, for more others. Uh, in Ilya Ehrenburg's brilliant but almost entirely uh, forgotten novel, Hurio Hurinita, 1922, a uh, wandering philosopher and grand provocateur organizes parodic and profane performances of politics, which typically expose either violence or hypocrisy or both behind lofty values of Western modernity captured by Ehrenburg right before and during World War I. However, when finding himself and his disciples in revolutionary Russia, Julio Kurinito arrives to the realization of the sad fact that the new Soviet order offers a false alternative to the capitalist West. Thus, the chapter about Kurinito's meeting with Lenin is entitled, although not, not named Lenin, but it is Lenin, uh, everyone has said uh, the Grand Inquisitor outside of the legend. And in its finale, the trickster, Julio Kurinita, imitates Dostoevsky's Christ by kissing his opponent in forehead. Despite his utopian intentions, the leader of Bolsheviks is still another edition of the Grand Inquisitor. While Lenin complains to Kurinita about hardships of being violent, 
Corinthians' own disciple, Carl Schmidt, no kidding, Carl Schmidt, uh, <laughs> with uh, enthusiasm and without moral pangs, organizes in Russia concentration camps modeled after this, uh, those deadly camps for POWs that St. Schmidt administered in the wartime Germany. Majority, according to Hurinita's beta assessment, normalizes violence and no revolution can change this order. In his critique, uh, this philosopher provocateur not only foresees Holocaust, but also offers a foresight that reads today as an outline of Hannah Arendt's concept of the banality of evil. And you can see it on this quote uh, on the slide. I should uh, like to see something else the next stage. The thing still shrouded in mist. Here comes a man with a pile of papers on his hip in a special pocket. He carries a browning. Don't be afraid, he's the bandit. Is an honest official this morning having typed something under a serial number he has shot a man who has disagreed, uh, disagreed with him on some issue or another now he has died and is briskly walking swimming <laughs> disappointed by the outcomes of the revolution as by an airplane that cannot fly well, uh Corinto decides to die and his death looks like a downplayed crucifixion which is quite uh, typical for uh, the trickster narrative of this uh, type, which frequently employ messianic motif, although almost always ironically colored. And, and we can see something very similar in, in Alesha's uh, Envy, in uh, Babylon's uh, Agassa Tales, in um, Astad Bender's novels, and of course in Bulgakos Master Margarita, where we have the whole host of, of the tricksters. These tricksters challenge simplistic concepts of modernity with modernist and sometimes even postmodernist avant the latter complexity that can be easily confused for chaos. Their symbolic economics is, a, as a rule, uh, similar to Bataille's expenditure, defying any pragmatics except for the absurd one. All trickster characters, including, of course, Schwieg, vividly manifest the impossibility to structure the modern society according to a single rational principle, teleology or ideology. They are not nihilists, rather they are deliberate or intuitive anti-essentialists essentialists, who reveal deliberately or accidentally constructed and fluid nature of all authoritative concepts, of all tables of society, all symbols of faith. Schweik appears to be the most ironic the first iron messiah in his own right. His messianic features, as in the Soviet uh, trickers, are either parodic or grotesque or both. And here uh, I will uh, repeat some, some examples that, that Peter has already brought up. Uh, in the concept of uh, Hashak's anti clericalism, uh, Christian motifs surrounding trade cannot be anything but parodic, but they are nevertheless very persistent and eventually rather ambitious. Uh, rather ambivalent, right? Uh, so I have a few quotes here. Uh, mounting the staircase to the third department for questioning, Schwieg carried his cross up to the hill of Golgotha, sublimely unconscious of his martyrdom, right? Uh, then the uh, police inspector Brown, who sort of deals with Schwieg as uh, uh, Roman lictors uh, in the time of the charming emperor Nero. Right, and the same ruthless said they said throw this scoundrel of a Christian to the lions. Inspector Brown said put him behind the bars. Right, uh, or at this head of the strange procession march Schwieg, uh, grave and sublime, like one of the early Christian martyrs being dragged into the arena, etc., uh, etc. Et so, so, so there are there are many other sages that were mentioned. In this context, uh, Schwieg's emphatic innocence good natured smile, his sincerity and honest countenance, the kindly innocent eyes of Schwieg glowing with gentleness and tenderness, combined with his stoic preparedness for any suffering, acquires a clearly Christian meaning, right? T tomorrow they're going to end me. This is what they always do on these occasions and they call it spiritual consolation. And why are they going to, I don't know, replied Schwieg with a good natured smile. I haven't the faintest <laughs> idea, it must be fake. Uh, furthermore, Schwieg's manner to illustrate his argument by multiple meticulously detailed anecdotes, already mentioned again by Peter and Daniel. Sorry, I, I wrote my paper before <laughs> yours, otherwise I, I would do it differently. Um, um, so it, the, the, they definitely look like a parody of Christ's 
speaking in parables, right? So, so we we, we all remember, uh, maybe we may remember uh, <laughs> the, the quote from from uh, Matthew, uh, how Christ explains why he speaks in parables. To you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they uh, not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Uh, given the predominantly absurdist content of Schwieg's parables, uh, his secrets of the kingdom of heaven are significantly different than those about uh, which Christ speaks in his parable. So, so what, what, what are they? Uh, as a rule, you know, his, his uh, threads uh, of anecdotes are um, illustrating one and the same point or frequently an absurd, an abstract, I'm sorry, concept, mistakes, suffering, lies, justice, etc. Uh, however, uh, these anecdotes are designed, or that these threads are designed in such a way that moving from one anecdote to another, uh, while moving uh, from one anecdote to another, Schwick, as a rule, confirms the common meaning of the central category by some anecdotes, but also inserts into his stream such anecdotes that turn this category upside down or completely devalue. For instance, in chapter two, uh, uh, Schwick <laughs> uses on innocent ones suffering from the police injustice, and that's exactly where uh, the already quoted phrase appears. Uh, <laughs> Christ, uh, Jesus Christ was innocent to such uh, and uh, uh, all the same, they crucified him. But before uh, this, before this phrase, he mentions a woman who was sentenced, uh, sentenced for strangling her newly born twins, although she swore on oath that she couldn't have strangled twins when she'd given birth to only one little girl whom she had succeeded <laughs> in strangling quite painlessly. Right, so so then, of course this this example uh, completely destroys the, the, this entire this entire argument. Right, um, when uh, Chaplin Otto Katz is puzzled by a circular uh, circular regarding the administering of extreme unction to soldiers, unction, right? Uh, Schwieg recommends his pattern to buy a catechism and to stress this recommendation by a parable about the gardener's assistant who wanted to join the ranks of the lay brothers and get a cow. He bought a catechism and, quote, learned to how to make the sign of the cross. But after this, he stole half of cucumbers from the monastery garden and left the monastery in disgrace, saying, I could have flogged those cucumbers just as well without the catechism. <laughs> another, another example of usefulness of catechism. Right? Um, in response to Lukács' demand, I like honesty, I hate lies, and I punish them mercilessly, Schwieg delivers a tale in which elaborate lies almost uh, bring the amorous teacher to prison, while, quote, if he just uh, said, if he said just the bare truth, he would only be shot into his back with the soul. And, and, and so on and so forth. We, we can find such, such, such uh, contradictions, comedic contradictions in, in all this uh, in all these uh, sort of preachings, right? Uh, these parables are not just absurdist. They methodically demonstrate the instability and problematic nature of anything and everything. Indeed, Schwieg is the messiah of the new world disorder in which all categories have become fluid and self-contradictory, uh, in which beliefs can be only farcical, and in which survival and the life of the body are the only values that deserve serious, but not too serious, attempt. <laughs> Peter Sloterdijk has uh, defined a similar um, philosophy as kinicism, as opposed to cynicism in a very broad sense, uh, as the countercultural and nonconformist form of modern cynicism. Clinical reason, uh, he wrote, culminates in the knowledge, deprived as nihilism, that we must snub the grand goals. And that's exactly what, what uh, Daniel was talking about, uh, meta, meta historical uh, narratives, right? Uh, in this regard, we cannot be nihilistic enough, wrote Slaughterman. Uh, and uh, this philosopher interprets cynicism as an internal plebeian and comedic double of cynicism and traces its history since Diogenes to uh, contemporary countercultural uh, neo cynicism. But of course, Diogenes and Schwieg, they, they, they really are in the same series of characters. However, not these paradoxes, but Schwieg's method appears to be his main messianic message. Uh, Inke Arns uh, and Silvia Sasse 
defined this method without any references to Schwe. Uh, they called it uh, subversive uh, affirmation as an quote artistic slash political tactic that allows artists slash activists to take part in certain social, political, or economic discourses and to affirm appropriate or consume them while simultaneously undermining them. It is characterized precisely by the fact that with affirmation, there is simultaneously taking place a distancing from or revelation of what is being affirmed. In subversive affirmation, there is always a surplus which destabilizes affirmation and turns it into its opposite, end quote. They illustrate this strategy by mainly postmodernist works of Soviet thought art artists of uh, uh, so <laughs> social realism is, is being uh, subversive, uh, appropriated and affirmed uh, by uh, Moscow conceptions, by Polish or an alternative, or and of course, uh, after, after Zizek by Yugoslavian uh, Leibach Kunst and Aska. Right? However, uh, we definitely see this method already in Bodin Bashi. Uh, whose over identification with the role of an obedient soldier who fulfills his orders blindly produces an effect that the scholars place at the center of subversive formation, a complete removal of any outside or alternative perspective. Quote, uh, they, 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 they call this, this principle the central principle of capitalist aesthetics, and at the same time, the only structural basis on which subversive affirmation can succeed as subversive affirmation. Or in the situation is works, words, sorry, the spectacle can be only subverted by being taken literally. This is exactly what Schwe does by taking the spectacle of power and order literally. He invariably dismantles it. The effect of the subversive affirmation, as Schwe proves, is the result of the fusion of such tricks and strategies as the critical fool and ironic messiah. In subversive affirmation, apparent idiocy appears, uh, functions as a key from the ironic messiah's contradictory, for the ironic messiah's contradictory teachings. To conclude, Schwenk and Soviet tricksters historicize the sensibility as a response to the repressive features of modernity shaped by world wars and revolutions. By the means of laughter, using all the potential of the trickster tradition, they transform this sensibility into a source of optimistic critical thinking or other optimistic critical survival. Such an odd combination of optimism with critique and survival proved to be in high demand during the entire 20th and perhaps 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. A uh, lot of food for thought there. Anyone want to jump in? Yeah, it came to my mind that I saw it all the I mean, uh, because this after my subversion, you know, it's the what he did all his life. And the, uh, what was the device of, uh, how's it called, the Sherman, yeah, the device of ostensive surrender. Yeah. That's what he, you know, the no, And basically, his novels, I mean, he does not have a trickster there, but the author is the trickster. Zoo is in you know, a series of tricks. And he's playing, definitely playing meta irony game in the sense that he ironizes and then he denies that irony is being played. Yeah. And so he would be kind of, uh, you know, not straight like character, but, you know, straight like author. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Shklovsky is, is, is one, one, one of such examples. Excuse me. Whose sort of meta strategy can be described as the trickers, although of course he has many other strategies. That's one of them. But but indeed we can see it uh, in, in his works of the uh, late late twenties, for instance, in, in Prieto Fabrica, which is sort of on the face value is a sort of the um, book about necessity to conform, and at the same time it's, it's one of the most brilliant. Uh, Delivery of the formalist theory, right? And even as, as you mentioned, uh, the, the, the monument to the scholarly mistake, uh, he, he says, like in, in the, the, this famous uh, joke uh, about Trotsky, sort of who, who apologizes before Stalin. I, mean, I, I apologize before Stalin. 
so, so he's apologizing, but at the same time, he, he delivers his theory again and again and again. So, uh, the, the, actually, that, 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 the, 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 uh, it was Ilya Kalinin who first uh, made, made, uh, made, made a paper, gave a paper, sorry, about Shklovsky and the trickster. And uh, uh, in, in one of the recent sort of more or less pop popular publications about Shklovsky, the word trickster appears as some kind of had me to accept it in terms of, but yes, of course, and uh, it, it deserves more, more explorations. You can also see the, uh, the defamiliarization as base of energy, which is, you know, precisely this ironic device. The, the, it, it reminds me of, uh, in, in the world of wrestling, what's called k mm -hmm. and, and you, <laughs> it's semi device. Basically, you pretend that something is being produced, some violent egg, but de facto it is not. Then, of course, if you are real aficionado of wrestling, then you know that the K-Fape is a fake. So, the Abrazoni So, you know, thank you. Thank you. What about the Gamos is chunk? It's all wrestling. It's all Yeah. I wonder if you could say a little more, Mark, about sort of your remarks at the end about the kinological philosophy and. And whether, you know, not being nihilism, right? It's not nihilism. What, what is it affirmatively beyond survival? Or, 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 or are there different options? Does it depend what kind of a, a trickster we're dealing with? So, so, so the, 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 there are different options, right? There, there is no uh, general philosophy. So uh, it, is, it is curious that, that Slaughter and Dragon, Foucault wrote about Kinnick simultaneously. Uh, Foucault was... was uh, uh, in his last lectures in 84, uh, he was talking about you know, exactly Diogenes and his school of thought, etc. Um, and he even uh, refers to, to sort of like saying some, some, uh, some book appeared with, with pompous title, I haven't read. Um, uh, but uh, if we, they have lots of, uh, lots of overlaps, but the, the main thing uh, there, uh, and of course in, in, in clinical philosophy, as, as we know it, uh, from, from multiple retellings, right? Although there is no sort of written source, of course. Uh, it, it, it is about, about giving up. It is about cutting off uh, all, all connections with, with society, with, with, with uh, power, and, and by this means sort of getting, getting uh, uh, freedom, uh, sort of be, being equal to oneself. Uh, and uh, there are very dangerous tendencies there, right? So for instance, in, in, in sort of kinesism and diagenes kinesis, being like an animal is very good. Mm. Being like an animal is being true to, to, to one's nature. It's, 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 there, there's no lies there. Um, as you see, the tricksters, they, they, they basically, in, in my, it's my deep um, conviction, uh, they do not have positive philosophy, but they, they work very well as, as critics. They, they very well sort of dismantle uh, different authoritative or you know, positive, positive philosophers. And, and, and in, this, in this capacity, they are sort of producing lots of movement. When the trickster sort of uh, gets the power, he or she becomes extremely, extremely dangerous. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's true. So that, that's why Shriek is good as long as he is a subaltern. Mm. Right? And not even so. And when he is fall off, it's yeah. a problem. Yeah, <laughs> and he gets violent. Yeah, I mean, when he's given power, he's violent. Oh, right. Yeah, but there is that aspect of it, right? Throwing people down the stairs. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you can do it. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe technically, I was thinking about the browning in the pocket. He passed it to you, but it's kind of interesting because the browning of this right at the beginning. Yeah, it's fake, of course. Yeah, right. Shrink says, I would get a browning. A job like that, you can build 20 arch to slide in a minute with a browning, yeah, easier if they're faster, but it's really right? Um, and it's true that so the browning was, I was just looking into this the other day, the automatic, like one of the first reasonably easily available automatic guns <laughs> that you could carry around, and you could kill 20 arch chicks. <laughs> <laughs> And it's interesting because it seems to be there's something that goes hand in hand between the idea of automated killing and easy killing, mm -hmm. and the browning of this, you can put it back in your pocket and go to work. It wouldn't have the same effect if in his pocket he was carrying a carving knife, right? It'd be like, wait, that would have covered in blood and it would have been quite an exertion. You couldn't have just got up and gone to the next job after that. Right? Mm -hmm. There's something about the way in which the automatic weapon at that moment 
gives power, it gives potentially a lot of power to people who maybe shouldn't have a <laughs> Oh, like there's a, there's something way too easy about it. Well, it's a good thing we don't have any problems with that here in the US. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so I, I think that the keyword is automatic. So I think it's a, so machine gun, uh, browning, that they, they all made killing automatic and, and actually in many ways depersonalized. So here the, the depersonalization of murder is, is brought to a new level, but yeah. it's connected with- uh, it's, also like a, it's, it's like the slapstick principle of, uh, is it that someone's theory of lack of the web? What, what gets lack is the way in which humans become automatic. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. Think of modern times with, mm -hmm. when, when Charlie Chaplin's screwing in the things and then ends up inside the machine and kind of becomes a machine. That, that's the, the, kind of like the modern, modern era trickster is, is is doing that, but that that's not the trickster. It's, 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 right. it's just the vision. Yeah. I, I would say other way around. So so that the uh, not 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 the the uh, human being is becoming. Uh, yeah, of course, human being also becoming as machine. But it is the state is acting as as, as a machine gun. The state right. is sort of the the, the uh, complicated, but still the function of it is a machine. Gun. The function of it is, is, is a machine. It is a machine. Well, this is like the Chekhov, right? Is the... Yeah, he, he, he describes the uh, uh, Soviet to uh, Chekhov. I mean, this seems to be the theme that's coming up in both uh, Ehrenberg and Schweik here about becoming a part of the bureaucracy. You're actually supplementing your own identity, your own personality, your own personhood into being a, just a, a literal cog in the machine. And it seems as though that's actually a, a, a kind of a more interesting turn of the early part of the 20th century. Where and, it becomes the automation, not only of the gun, but of the person, of the state. All of this is part of this, again, the, a mechanism as opposed to an, an, an organic structure. I suppose. Yeah, and that's what we retroactively define as modernity. Mm -hmm. That's exactly science of modernity, science of new, new organization of society, new government, governmentality, biopolitics, uh, everything yeah. that we learn from. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but they have machines around themselves in a, in a new way. So I think the physical image of the machine is uh, very important to you have it in films, you have it in all these uh, um, machines that produce 1,000 bodies per minute or something like that. And uh, machines that kill 1,000 uh, people in a minute. So I think that the machine is, is, is really the overriding kind of, that was their, I would say, really experience that was to some extent human. And it is quite telling that Schwieg does know, he knows, but, but he can't operate the phone. The phone is, is not operating well. So, so this, this uh, clownade with the phone that he has to pick up, it, it is some kind of the ludist, ludist uh, tendency that, that is opposed to what, to what is associated with, with modernity. Well, with a question, you mentioned clinics, and of course, uh, according to Plato, he famously called uh, the Diogenes, he called it Socrates called Don Man. Don Man. So there is, there is kind of this, so the first trickster in Western philosophy is Socrates. Oh, yeah. uh, and if you compare the speech patterns, mm -hmm. Schweig and Socrates, you realize it's very similar to friends that Socrates agrees. He, he, he mm -hmm. always is kind of a maintaining the, the, the uh, principle of operation. And then in every maximum, uh, it is so what the this is really Thank, you. Thank you. It's a great idea. I wrote the moment. I refer to it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So maybe one minute ahead of schedule. Not one. <laughs> Is, is that really a, a sand timer for 45 minutes? That's what they told me, but I'm, I'm Do wondering. Do you have a collection of sand timers for like variations? Like, well, yeah, it's, really? it's not mine. It's no, 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 that's well, it. It's, it's fantastic. fantastic. Oh, you, you came dressed with the occasion. Let's see, are we, are we showing the screen? Yeah, let's do our presentation. So that I think it's going to be going to be a schedule. I think it goes here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
that's the graduation that oh, we yeah. bombarding oh yeah with some oh, last yeah. minute panicking <laughs> letters so we have a great and that's my job next week <laughs> lucky you yeah yeah that's actually that's where you maybe think about an idea of the sort of ironic terrible but also with the girls well, you know, there's this is that I come from. Uh -huh. Thinking about it, like, both trying to deal with the problem of the parable and uh, in this moment. And I think that'd be a really interesting way of looking at it. Well, it's apparently not. Yeah. Yeah. It's a room my house. Yeah. It, it works if I put down there. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. project yeah. sort of deals with some things. You should survive. Yeah. 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 Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. And so, Charles Sabatos is professor at Yeditepe University in Istanbul, where he lectures on Slavic, American, and comparative literature. His research focuses on transnational contexts of Central European literature, particularly Slovak and Czech. His monograph, Frontier Orientalism and the Turkish Image in Central European Literature, was published by Lexington Books in 2020. And he is also co-editor of a collected volume in progress called Home and the World in Slovak Writing, a Small Nation's Literature and Context. Okay, thanks. Uh, I am going to sit down, but before I sit down, I thought I would show. Yeah. <laughs> I've had this for over 25 years. It doesn't really fit anymore, but I couldn't resist wearing it, mainly because this actually relates to what I'm going to be talking about, which is the translations of Schweig. And of course, we have here a, the truck at the top, and then the French and uh, the English transcription. We don't actually have the correct German, which is with the J, but I... Basically, these were more or less uh, various languages. And uh, what I'll be talking about is the way um, Turkish translations of Shvek came from various languages um, indirectly, uh, none of which are actually Czech, but. Uh, okay, so the okay, so just to um, start off as we as we all know here, Shvek is, um, not only the most widely translated, I, I saw as 58 languages being the current number of Uzbek literature. But what is somewhat remarkable, there are eight translations in the Turkish, uh, which I think is possibly the most in any language. Obviously, as you know, there's only three or four in even major languages. And in Turkish, it's known as Aslan Oscar Shvaik, and I'll explain in a little while. Aslan means lion, as for those of you who know the Narnia series, that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the Turkish word for lion. Asker just means soldier, and that's pronounced as Shvaik, which is like the uh, common sort of English um, pronunciation. And as I mentioned, none of these translations, and it includes one dramatic adaptation and two abridged versions, uh, and none of them have been from the original Czech. So this presentation, I'm actually doing two things that I've worked on separately. I've never put them together. Uh, the main thing is how uh, Shvek has been translated. And we've, we've already mentioned in passing some of the translations, but I'm going to go through and give the specific sources, uh, which actually affect the, um, how Shvek has sort of um, been reproduced in Czech. But also, um, on the side, I'm going to touch on something else I've worked on, which is Hashek's view of the Ottomans. Uh, and the image of the Turks in Shvek, which is sort of a, um, it's part of a much bigger project that I um, talked about uh, earlier this week. But um, I'm going to start with two quotes here from uh, first Yaroslav Spierk, who has a very interesting book. Some of you may have seen on uh, the translations of Shvek in Portuguese. And the, the, uh, the pattern, patterns there are somewhat similar to what happened in Turkish, because again, these are indirect translations. So as he says, most works of fiction originally written in Czech, he's talking about Portuguese translations, were not only subjected to indirect translation, they were perceived and received through the prism of other dominant cultures. And this corpus thus testifies to a deeper underlying phenomenon, that of indirect reception. And this is very much the case for uh, Schweik and, and, and Czech literature in general, but especially Schweik in its uh, Turkish reception. 
Petr Kucera, who is a, um, he's a translator from Turkish and a, and a professor of Turkish literature um, now in Germany, but he translates into Czech. Um, and he has looked at the way, um, sort of the other, the other way how Turkish literature has been uh, perceived in Czech, but he does touch on the other direction a little bit. And his, his point is that um, in putting together a list of what has been published in Turkish from Czech literature, one has to deal with a host of serious problems. First, since most of the published works are translations via English, French, or German, it is difficult to track them down in databases by source language. And even in the volume itself, it usually just gives the original title and not what the translator was literally translating from, even if it might be obvious from the other books that they've translated. Um, many publishers do not mention what language was used for the translation and one made for the original from the way names are misspelled and from other textual clues. So that's the process that I went through. Okay, um, so I'm going to go through uh, and actually uh, look at the major source texts of the uh, Turkish translations. And there have been translations from, uh, from Hashek, obviously German, Russian, French, and English are the main ones. And in each one, there's been multiple translations or uh, retranslations. So, of course, everyone is probably familiar with Peter Reiner's um, original uh, translation into German, which was very influential and really helped popularize the novel across Europe. And her title, The Aventur des Braven Soldatenschweig, and I'm going to talk, talk about that in a minute, this sort of shift um, it, to, to this um, in the title. And that was the source for the adaptation by Piscator, which became very popular on stage in Germany. And actually, that's similar to the reception in Turkey that actually Schweik was, was first better known as a stage work, as a, as a theater work. And then the novel was sort of translated as a result of that success. Um, and then, of course, the sequel by Bertolt Brecht, which is really a sequel to Piscator's staging, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also an indirect sequel, Schweik uh, as a belt create. But that was also very important for the Turkish reception, because actually the reason that Schweik was, was appreciated in <laughs> Turkish at all was because Brecht has written about Schweik. And Brecht was very important in the 50s and 60s. Uh, when Turkey had a significant leftist intellectual movement. Um, okay, and, and, and so that's 1925. Um, and in, in Russia, there were two translations relatively close uh, to each other. And I believe the first one, Azukal's translation, I think was from German. It was. If I am I correct. And then Bogatirov, which I think is the most widely published one now, um, is from only a couple of years later, but that I believe was from Russia, was from Czech. And that's again. Um, the Bravo Soldatashveka, which uh, also shows the, the the title really taken through the German rather than directly. And what's interesting is even though um, Bogatirov translated from the Czech, he used the what had been established as the Russian title through the German through uh, Zukaus. In French, we have um, Henry, which is actually he was Czech, but he used for some reason the English spelling of Henry for his <laughs> French translation. Ayuzi Bozeshi, who translated um, out of the four books of of Shveik, the first two were translated uh, only, only Hojeshi only did the first. And then there was a, a translator I don't know as much about, Aranyoshi, Aranyoshi, which who I believe was Hungarian, who translated part two. And for a long time, the only French translation consisted of books one and two. And then in the, um, and actually up until the 60s, when uh, there was a, there was an adaptation, which is almost unknown. I don't know, has anyone heard of Charles Apol um, Apoltenoses? Dramatic adaptation in French, yeah. the Bras of Ashwig. Um, it has never been published. Mm -hmm. And actually, I was only able to get it from a, a colleague who had um, contacts in Geneva, and I believe Geneva was on the sort of Swiss, French Swiss National Library. But that was the original version of Schweik in Turkish, was a French play, Swiss, Swiss French, uh, Swiss Bomon. Um, and then we come to, of course, the English, the significant English translations. Paul Selvers uh, from 1930, which we saw in the morning, the first edition, uh, that was um, Selvers uh, parts one and three translated. And that's where we have, of course, the, the spelling that became very common in English, Schweik, which sometimes is pronounced as Schweik because of the ambiguity in English. And then Cecil Parrots, which is really the, uh, kind of still the authoritative translation published by Penguin, uh, which came out in the 70s. And that's the full the full uh, novel, The Good Soldier Shaking His Fortunes in the World War. Okay. All of these are in some ways sources for the Turkish translations of Shaykh that have been published. Okay. Now I'm just going to mention 
There are, of course, more translations in these languages. These have not had a direct effect, but I'll just mention that, in, that actually in both French and German, there have been recent retranslations that are uh, in German, um, Antonin Brosex, uh, which came out in, 19, in 2014, and he again changes the title back to uh, the Aventur des Guten Solanschweg in Weltkrieg. Um, and then in French, the parts three and four, actually, there was a Claudio Ancelot uh, retranslated part two from that original one in the 30s, and she translated the rest, parts three and four. So, um, Horeshi, or Horeshi, I guess, in French. Uh, his his part one was still the kind of canonical French translation until quite recently, with these other ones uh, that were translated by in the 70s, Claudia Onsado. And then only recently, Benoit Meunier uh, retranslated re it. it. That just came out in 2018. And he also, uh, they, as you see, they continue to use Brav coming from the German. Um, and then, of course, in English, uh, uh, there's another translation that came out. It's already almost 20 years ago. Uh, Zeni Sadlon and Emma Joyce's translation, a more modernized um, version at the Faithful Adventures of the Good Soldier State during the World War. And Gerald Turner is um, currently working on a um, translation of Carolina Press that will come out. And I, I assume the Good Soldier State, I don't know if he's going to use a longer title there. That might come out in probably a couple of years. Okay, so now I want to go to quickly the Turkish translations. So here, as you can see, um, these are the uh, the source texts here. The, I mean, obviously, these translators are you don't necessarily need to to uh, pay attention, but the, um, the the brownish ones are texts translated from French. The blue or uh, greenish is the only one that I know translated from Russian, mm -hmm. and the rest of them that are in red are actually translations from English. And how do I know this again? It doesn't say translated from the, but it's, you look at these people like Aisha Gugunkut, she was a well-known translator of English. Everything else she ever translated was from English literature. So obviously she didn't learn Czech just to tr translate Spanish. <laughs> um, but we start off with Salahati Bilal and his translation was, which came out in 1963, was actually a translation of that play, Charles Apoteloz's play, an adaptation of, of Schweig in French, only performed in Switzerland. I think it was actually performed in Montparnasse in Paris as well. Asla, and so he named it Aslan Oscar Schweig. So, so Hilal gave the title Aslan, the very first translation using this lion as the, as the title, but he still used the French spelling because, and that's, <laughs> that's a very obvious case. You can tell it's from, because only in French is it spelled Schweig in this way. Um, and the first translation of the novel, which was from Selvers, and it's actually shorter, and I think she might only have translated parts one and two, Selvers so has parts one through three, um, Aisha Lubunkut, and that came out in 1964. She kept the Aslan, Aslan Asker, the lion soldier, and she took, because she was using Selvers, 1930s version, she interpreted it as being pronounced Schweik. And so she, she in translator eight, that's in Turkish pronounced Schweik. And that pretty much has stayed the standard title up until today. No one has ever corrected it to the correct, to this Czech, um, you know, spelling. Uh, I think you say that. So the, the only one from Russian, again, because he's, he's best known, you look, you look at other things, these people were translated. He translated mostly 19th century Russian literature, and he used a different title, Kahraman, which means hero, Oscar Schweik. So again, this heroic, um, Connotation. Uh, we have one which, again, I believe is from French, using a slightly different spelling, Aslan, the Aslan Asker Schweig. Um, and it's sort of odd. Um, these are these are uh, two abridgments, and they're almost like short version. It's almost like for children. Mm -hmm. They're like these you know, fifty page. It's like when you read, you know, a, a version of Robinson Crusoe or something for ten year olds or whatever, or Moby Dick. And it's odd because I haven't really, I don't know of any other language that there's like Schweig, you know, sort of simplified. Even in Czech, I don't think there's like kids versions of Schweig, but they do have them. And what's also odd is uh, there are two different tra two different translators, two different, um, but as far as I know, it's exactly the same translation. So why somebody else got the credit for, I don't know, that's uh, that's something I haven't figured. But the last two translations, there was one in the, in the, um, in the 80s, which I believe was from Cecil Parrots already, because that's a full translation. And the most recent, um, Jalal Uster, who I'm going to be quoting from a little bit later, in, in 2006 went through and retranslated um, the, the Parrot edition, but in a little more uh, um, faithful, let's say. Okay, so hopefully, um, I, I put together a little chart just because it's so confusing to follow the paths of how these different editions came through, and hopefully this is somewhat um, 
uh, comprehensible here. But uh, obviously, at the top, we have the German, French, and English translations. And this is how they kind of, and down at the bottom right, we have the, the Turkish uh, translations. And how did they get filtered through these? Um, we sort of read the Reiners, and then it's, it's, it's too bad that it will be cut up. It's Piscator's play, which then inspired Brecht. Okay, and so Brecht was being performed, Brecht's Schweig in the Second World War was being performed in Istanbul in, I believe, the late 50s. Mm. And then um, he loved was translated and performed because there was, again, that might be one of the only um, adaptations, like dramatic adaptations of Schweig. Obviously, they could have also translated Piscator's, but for whatever reason, they chose the French one, uh, and so that's so. So meanwhile, in the French, we have we have Pogetti's, um uh, novel, then translated, um, then adapted by Apotelos, and then um, translated by Hilab. Okay, so all of these somehow come together into various reasons why this translation exists in Turkish, and then from English, we have some of them from Selber and some from Parrot, as I mentioned with Gunkud being um, the first one from Selber and Uster being the most recent one from Cecil Perry. Um, okay, why do we have this odd? Uh, I just wanted to touch on this, these shifts in, um, in, in meaning. Obviously, Delbri Voyak goes through German and French with Brav. And again, there's amb this ambiguity in, in Brav, um, which then take, is taken literally in um, the in the Turkish in the very first Turkish translation, with, which everybody just copies after after him. Um, so, um, well, sort of the easy part. The Schweig, obviously, we have we have Rainer Schweig, which she she turns into a phonetic um, spelling of Schweig in German, but of course still pronounced the same. Selver then does a sort of phonetic, but then he thinks J is probably too confusing because English speakers would make it J. So he turns it into this not really phonetic, but kind of. And then for the next 50 years, everybody says Schweig. And that's what Gunku did is she turned it into Schweig, which can only be pronounced as Schweig in Turkish. Okay, so again, in German, Brav um, is in, in current, and in, 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 feel free to um, add to this, but basically Brav is, is more of a well-behaved, it's more good, it's actually um, fits the good sense of good rather than the English brave. And we have different connotations as, as, um, as far as I, as I understand that there was this set connotation of brave in German, which is now mostly obsolete. But we can see that connotation even in Scots. Uh, Scots English, the word bra is good. It means like a fine looking lad is, is bra mm -hmm. or bra, uh, I guess bra. Okay, and in French, it can mean both, and there's this sort of, sort of connotation of where you place the adjective. So, so it's basically Jose, she was directly responsible for Apotelos, who's responsible for uh, the Turkish. Um, and Apovam versus Anomprav. Mm. So we sort of have this, this um, slippage, and um, so then Schweik becomes the brave soldier, the lion, but again, really brave, like a truly, you know, roaring, uh, heroic lioness. Okay, now why do we have Brav to begin with? And this actually goes back to Max Brod. And uh, we might uh, be familiar with the story that, of course, Max Brod helped to popularize uh, Schweig, just as he had done for Kafka's work. But the very first translate, I think somebody mentioned it, that um, the very first translation, well, of course, you know this, but uh, <laughs> Max Brod, the very first translation of, of the first chapter of Schweig, which is the Schweig intervenes in the World War, which coincidentally is the part I'm going to be focusing on in a minute is that it, that was published in uh, Praga Pagblad, like, in, like, again, two days after Hashek's death, there was a little bit, Broad, Broad had this chapter, which I, it, was he the translator? I don't, there's nothing in, I've, I've looked at that newspaper, I think he might have translated that chapter, I don't even know how, how much Broad translated directly. But basically, he says here, the following chapter is taken from the soldier novel, Schweig ein Soldat und Brav. So he put Brav in there as his own translation, uh, which as far as it is the first time that was used in German. And of course he was the one that was always networking, like he got uh, Greta Reiner uh, on board, I, I think with the translation. And so that Brav continued with her translation. But also, it, it, of course, if you remember, there's, there's, there is that allusion in chapter yeah. eight where the German does come from. Wow. So it's not that, that Brav completely came, came, pulled this out of nowhere. It's, you know, this betterness von Wotzenheim. It says, Apiet minu und vierge lage, der brave soldat schweig, und perem septale, legi mit schettin der baraku. So we have even in the original text, there is that brave as the German name, 
but it's it's broad that first puts it in print and then Reiner and then it gets diffused through all these other languages and sort of canonized in Turkish as it's really literal. Um, okay, I just wanted to touch on a couple other things, as I said, related to how Hasek uh, himself had these encounters with the Ottomans, which then influences Schweik's perceptions of the Ottomans, especially in the first chapter. And um, if you're, if uh, some of you may know Hasek's story of uh, Klimesh, you know, who's the commander of the Macedonian Revolutionary Troops, which supposedly was his adventure in the Balkans. And it's a very funny story where Klimesh is, is walking around Prague boasting of his heroic, sounding, you know, somewhat familiar heroic wartime um, adventures. And it turns out like they, they were down, they were down in the Ottoman, then the Bulgarian Ottoman border. And at the first shot, they, they ran away, but they were captured. Uh, so, <laughs> So basically, this is when um, when supposedly Hasek joins Klimesh down, um, you know, fighting the Turks, and the 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 this uh, the Macedonian revolutionary troops are like, well, do you know, you know, do you know how to shoot a gun? Basically, do you understand how to do it? Of course we do. So the valley commander, this is Klimesh. You just stick the cartridge into the rifle, brother, and aim it at a Turk. Bang! And then that Turkish swine falls down. You then stamp on his throat and cut off his head. It warms your heart. That's how it. That's how it is, brothers. Uh, the Turk that. Um, I should, I actually uh, forget what's under that thing. <laughs> so basically, it's heathen beast, something like that. Uh, lives like a dog, and like a dog, he shall die. Okay, so of course, that's going to be something that we see also in Shvey. Being in the vanguard, we were the first to reach that summit and see all around us, around below us, the fires of the Turkish regulars, and we pledged the Turks. I knew a few sentences of Turkish and put them together to say, Turkish gentlemen, Komataji, pursue us, we flee. That was that great battle on Mount Garvan, of which Klimash, the Macedonian commander, told the story in Prague and related how we had killed 2,500 Turks there. And actually, they're taken into custody. They're, they're, they're taken into captivity by the Ottomans, but the, the Ottoman commander is actually a very polite gentleman and sends them back on their way the next day. So um, <laughs> that's, that's the heroic. Now, there's also something uh, related to the ideological background of the Austrian-Ottoman conflict. And this is actually um, Masaryk's confidential memorandum of the case for a new state uh, from 1915, uh, already with Czechoslovakia in the works. And this is just a short quote from this, but this is something I, I took from like a, a larger anthology of World War I documents. So I, I, this is from some kind of memorandum. That Austria owes her origins to the invasions of the Turks and previously of the Huns or Magyars. Austria means the Eastern Empire, the German provinces, Bohemian Hungary, joined in a federation against Turkey. With the fall of the Turks, Austria falls also. Austria lost her ruling idea and is unable to find a positive idea. Okay, so this just is something in the background ideologically for the, the you know, Masaryk founding the state. Um, if, if, if the Ottoman Empire falls, there's no, there's no longer any need for a, an Austrian Empire either. Okay, so really what I'm going to focus on is in, the, in the latter part is uh, chapter one, where we have the famous scene of uh, Schweik and Brett Schneider discussing the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand at Palavetz's Pau, which of course we've all talked about the cellist. But um, and in the Schweikathon that Chris organized, I actually read this scene with two of my Turkish students, which was amusing. Um, but this is, of course, um, from the first part. Um, what's interesting is I, I don't have it quoted here, but even before Shvei goes to the pub, he says something similar to Pani Mularova. So it's, it does seem to be his authentic idea that, that rather than something just provocative, that he's, that he's playing, you know, provoking the provocateur. Um, so, so again, I'm, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically that Brecht Schneider is trying to provoke him from Sarajevo, Navazal, Brecht Schneider told Udiel, Serbove, and so Shvei is like, no, the Turks did it. And then um, he turns to, to Palivet, sort of trying to drag him into this awkward scene. <laughs> and um, Palivet's like, host, host, and finally, he's, he's, he's desperately trying to avoid getting implicated in anything. And of course, that doesn't help because of this comment he made about the portrait of the emperor before that. Okay, so Selber's translation, which was the standard English translation for a long time. Again, the business in Sarajevo was done by the Serbs. You're wrong, the replied Shvek. It was done by the Turks because of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then he turns to Palowitz. Do you like the Turks? He said Shvek, turning to Palowitz. Do you like that heathen pack of dogs? You don't, do you? <laughs> and again, one customer is the same, even if, same, or even if he's a Turk, it's all the same to me. Okay. Um, Hojeshi's uh, French translation, which again was influential on the adaptation, which then became the source, 
à, à Sarajevo, in Sinua Brett Schneider, c'est les seuls qui, qui, ont, uh, qui ont tout fait. And then again, we have this, um, est-ce que tu aimes les turcs, toi, ajoute à cheveux, uh, est-ce que tu les aimes, ces chiens de pain, n'est-ce pas que non? So again, these pagan dogs. <laughs> And just a slight difference that um, Jose, she sometimes adds this extra, it's like, again, it, it, not sort of the neutral, like it's all the same to me, but like, you know, I don't even, uh, it's basically, there's, you know, I, I don't, I don't, um, I, I wink at it, which that actually is reproduced in the Turkish translations. I'm not going to go into that, but that has become also part of this sort of more uh, colloquial form of, of saying instead of, you know, this kind of uh, slangy thing. Okay, so Charlotte Poltenos. Um, in his adaptation for the stage, we have, again, Brett Schneider. He, he doesn't really do, he, he really um, adapts it in terms of, he does rewrite some of the dialogue uh, in a shorter way. It's not really a word for word. Um, so Brett Schneider, ce qui m'a fait le coup à sérieux, ce sont les Serbes. And so then again, Schweig is like, ce sont les Turcs, right, the Turks. And then he turns to Palivet's Uh, so it's slightly different, but again, still those pagan dogs, and surely you don't like them. Uh, and Palivets doesn't want to deal with that. Okay, so here we have um, the first Turkish translation, Selhat and Hilav, um, and, and this is a translation of, of um, the uh, of the play again, but that's it's not it's not an exact translation either. And so Schweik says here. Um, is that what you think, saying to Brett Schneider? And what's interesting is he turns it from Turk to Ottoman, mm -hmm. right? So he says, um, right? The Ottomans did it, my friend. Um, so this is, a, this is an interesting thing in the 1960s when there was this sort of, it, it was very much the uh, secular republic that was sort of distant, had distanced itself from the Ottomans. So again, it's almost by using Ottoman, it's almost like not, not drawing in Uh, the, Tur the, the present day Turks. It's like a distancing from, and he also, what's also interesting is he, he because there's a lot of, um, obviously the Ottomans have had a lot of contacts with the South Slavs. So he, he, he actually changes um, the name to, he thinks it's like a Serbian name, Palovic. So, it's like, <laughs> so, so actually he spelled it with this, the, you know, the South Slav bitch. <laughs> and the reason that's interesting is that gets, that gets reproduced in other translations later on, other Turkish translations. Um, again, so, well, of course, as you noticed that what happened to the Those dogs, the dogs that were in the front, <laughs> the, dog, right? um, the first prose translation, as I said, which was just a year later. So, so this had been performed on stage and the work had been um, sufficiently successful on stage to be translated. And this is from the Selber translation. And this is where um, things start to get um, with, with, uh, with Gunkut's translation. He said, he again says, you're wrong. And it says because of it, it's because of Bos Bosnia Herzegovina, the Turks pulled off his job. And then he says, Turk letter said, I'm saying, do you like them? And he's just like, huh, do you like them? And again, leaves it kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't go on there. Uh, do you like them? And um, with the next one, which was published only a few years later, but from Russian. And I, again, I don't know why these came in such quick succession. I really don't know the reason why they, they, they felt the need. But this is from, this is a longer translation. And again, he says here, um, do you have a liking for the church? So for the first time, he does include some version of that negative, but 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 not quite as strong as Hashem. Uh, so he says, So do you have a liking for the Turks? Do you, do you like those infidel scoundrels? Which obviously is insulting, but it's not quite as you know a deadly insult as calling them pagan dogs. And you probably don't like that, so that's a little closer <laughs> to this. Um, again, another translation, just a couple of years later, and this was, um, I believe, from the French again. Um, and he once again says, "Do you like the? Um, do you like the Turks?" And again, you said miss and human. You don't like them, right? Again, leaving this sort of much vaguer than in the original. Um, okay, so now we've come, so all of those were translated before Parrot's, Parrot's translation had come out in English, which later served as the basis of a couple. So Parrot's is, is more or less, in this, in this case, it's very close to Selber's, but basically uh, slightly different phrasing. 
At Sarajevo, Brett Schneider resumed it was the Serbs who did it. You're wrong, they were quite straight. It was the Turks. And he turns, do you like the Turks? Do you like those heathen dogs? You don't do the, do you? And again, never mind the Turk, it's all the same to me. So again, re relatively similar. Um, and so this translation, which came out um, uh, just a little bit later, um, and this is where you start to see the thing when you translate from um, English, various things that get lost. And obviously, some of the um, one of the first things that get lost is, of course, the difference between uh, the formal you and the informal you. So there's a bit of a variation. And the ones from, from French and Russian, they do get that correctly because, of course, it's correct. But this is obviously from English because he calls Schweig in his conversation, when he speaks to Brett Schneider, he uses V, and when he speaks to Palivets, he uses T, or Sis in Sen in Turkish. And here he, he says um, Sen, which is informal to both of them. Uh, but again, it's from English, so you wouldn't know. And he says the Turks did it, and he turns to Pilate. So to both of them, he says, you're wrong there. And he says, do you like the Turks? And there's not even any kind of further, do you like them? And Pal that's, that's when Palivets refuses to get into it. So that's is even shorter. Okay, so the last most recent translation, which is kind of the one that's in print now and is most widely probably read, Jalal Uster, which came out in 2005. And he had two versions. And I actually had, what they did was they released a, 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 a booklet form. This is this is one of the main publishers of like literary fiction in Turkey. And they, re, they released like a little booklet promotional thing of with just the first chapter or two, I think as a kind of, a taster before the translation came out. So I thought this was just the standard translation until I finally uh, later on looked at there is a difference. He actually went back and revised it mm -hmm. after it had even come out in a sort of mini, mini format the first. So basically he says here, uh, and so here he says polyvets. He does get it correct, but he spells it phonetically in Turkish. So you would know how to pronounce polyvets. Mm -hmm. um, so Schmeig still isn't correct, but polyvets is correct, although, although phonetic. Um, and here he, uh, he is polite to both. Here he's using the polite form to both Brett Schneider and to um, Polyvex. But again, taken from, from Parrot's English version. And so he's, so, so he's a little bit more um, colloquial here. Again, say, do you like the Turks? So he says, really, well, good heavens, they're merciless. Really, do you like those stone-hearted ones? And that was his first version. Um, which then he changed is there. So um, <laughs> in the um, late in this one, if it, when the book came out, it was just in 2006. Uh, like, um, oh, oh, is seven is. So he, he turns to Polybeth and he says, do you like the Turks? Do you like those, those rabid pagans? Is it possible that you like them? So for the first time, he doesn't actually use the word dog, but I mean, you're rabid so, dog, so okay. it's, it's in there. And Pagan is in there. So this, for the first time, he gets this really direct language in there. So um, what's interesting is Uster actually um, wrote an article um, around the time the translation came out, giving his own perspective as a translator of Schweig. And what's fascinating here is there's all these different elements that first um, that influence his perception of Schweig. And again, none of them were really the original novel, but it's all these cultural things, mostly from the theater and different performances. So he says here in 1963, the Arena Theater, which is in Taksim, the very center of the sort of cultural center of Istanbul, played things. Um, so there's Ubu, um, Ubu Hatu, um, Hashek's Pixel of Schweig. And this was an adaptation by a French writer in a translation, he doesn't name the Apocalypse, but in a translation by Salahatin Hilal, which means that the title, Lion Soldier Schweig, which no one was brave enough to change afterwards was Hilal's invention. So he also acknowledges that he's kept that first uh, when it was performed. And um, that actually, that translation has come out as in book format, is the very first one. Later in the mid 1970s, it, um, at the city theater in Uskadar, Schweig against Hitler, and that's the Turkish title for Brecht's play of Schweig in the Civil World War, Second World War, um, caught my attention. Um, uh, Schener Shen's Schweig was very different from Genjo Ed Kahl's Schweig that had been carved. So, so the first, both of the, both of the plays were performed by very well-known actors, but they had very different styles, and he, he was thinking of both of them. Um, and John Ugel's an Astonishing Turkish, John Ugel was, the, was a very well-known translator, and he was a translator for X play. So, so we have the, the, the French, German, 
different actors, different theaters, and this sort of whole the ambiance of the 1960s. And and later on, like decades later, he found a copy of of uh, the Penguin translation, Parrot's translation, and decided to translate it. So these are again all of these sort of bits and pieces that he produced. <clears throat> Uh, so again, Schweik has continued to uh, exist as really a dramatic adaptation. There was even, I haven't seen this, but there's a new adaptation, which is called Schweik in Wonderland. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's again, a, a probably based on um, Hilal, Hilal's um, translation of the French. And I wanted to add that actually this, this uh, Turkish theme that we can see in Hashek, it actually came up even in Karol Vanyak's sequel, which uh, nobody's really brought up yet. I don't even, I'd be curious to know if anybody's read Vanyak because it's, of course, as you know, it's sort of critically under, but I, I actually um, sat and read the Vanyak's um, during the pandemic. I was like, okay, now it's fine. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> and I, re I read the entire thing. Uh, and this is from Schweik Revoluzzi, which is like the last volume. And again, it's uh, published very soon after. Uh, the original. And in chapter three, this is actually Shveik in that, in that, if anybody knows, Shveik is uh, a Russian prisoner of war for, for, for most of that, of, of volume six. He actually ends up even in Siberia. And um, so he's in Omsk. And there's a, um, there's a speech, which is, this I find very, very um, hash, Hashekian. Or, or this is, I mean, obviously he doesn't capture Hashek's humor a lot of the time, but in this case, he, he does kind of reach that. So uh, during the day, the high school religious religion teacher, uh, Batushka Joachim, or Father Joachim, spoke of the significance of greater Slavdom uniting around Mother Moscow. <laughs> but he confused the Czechs with the Montenegrins. <laughs> For him, the Czech kingdom lay somewhere on the Adriatic Sea, and the same confusion of ideas was later reflected in his sermons. Brothers, he said ardently, who of you does not know that until the time when the Germans defeated you at White Mountain and the Turks sub subjugated you, your ancestors called the Muldau River by the Slavic name of This is like teaching history. And after Batushka Joachim made a ceremonial speech about the Czech suffering under the Turkish yoke, and now he sought protection upon the breast of Mother Russia, a loud weeping rang out. Before <laughs> um, and one more thing is um, how Hashek's Turks have been then filtered into later um, Czech literature. And this is from uh, Harabal um, and Harabal's. So, so there's a quote from Schweik talking to Dub. Um, and this is actually interesting because it's from part three, Forward March. And it's one of the cases where Schweik actually, almost the mask, the foolish mask slips a little bit because Dub is so drunk that, that Shveik is, is obviously making fun of him. <laughs> and he says here, to every one of his sentences, do bad. I think that you fall. So like, Dube, he, I think he's bringing Dube home from the from the, um, the courthouse or something. And I think that you follow me. I certainly do, Shveik answered. You talk rather like a tinsmith called Pokorni and Budyovice. Whenever people asked him, have you bathed this year in the Malshi? He, he answered, I haven't, but there'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> or they asked him, have you eaten any mushrooms this year? And he answered, I haven't, but the, but the new Sultan of Morocco is said to be a very good man. <laughs> and there's this, um, these interviews that Harabal did with uh, the um, Hungarian Slovak journalist, Lazo uh, Sigeti. And uh, Harabal, describes his style as flitting about. He's like, he's talking, he has these long conversations with this, uh, this journalist. And he says, you remember I wanted our dialogue to have a few sentences from Hashek Shveik as an epigraph. And he quotes this having been swimming in the mouth shape. No, but there could be a good crop of plums this year. And then he repeats that question at the end and Sigeti replies, no, I haven't, but Mr. Rabal, that new Turkish Sultan must be a damn good bloke. <laughs> so he repeats it, but it's, it's there's a shift there from the Moroccan to the Turkish. Um, and I think that's the end. So um, I'm finished there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just in case we got to receive here. Is there any form of formal censorship in Turkey? Well, this what, is what is yeah. the background? Or so, the, the so the interesting thing is, why did they do this? And um, I think there could be a certain amount of self censorship. There is, I mean, there is a um, there there are there are laws against insulting the Turkish state. And of course, Orhan Pamuk has written things and had various issues. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, 
again, the, the, these interpretations, you know, something from um, from from this long ago, you wouldn't think a translation of a foreign work wouldn't fall under that. But that very first translation is, you know, the Ottoman. And it's interesting that they didn't use Ottoman after that uh, as a sort of a compromise. But I think I don't have any any concrete um, like proof on how much it was like self censorship or publishers not wanting to. I don't know how much like an editor would have intervened or the translator was just like, oh, why should I have this insulting thing about the Turks for a Turkish reader that they're going to hate? Out the books. They're going to hate me from the very first chapter. So why should we put this in there? I don't, I'm not really sure. Actually, that's a, that's obviously a very essential question that is sort of remained unanswered for me. Just related to the none of the other dogs are sensitive. So many dogs because you can see why why they'd be sensitive. Correct is a. And I'm going to give you my, my, my well, but lines. yes, but I mean, most of those dogs aren't directly. Yes, right. It was scoundrels. Yes, not right. Dogs, right. Yeah. So it's like the. I'm, I'm just asking is, is it yeah is well it i mean the, the dog right? i mean the only thing worse not like might be pig or something yeah. but um the dog is, is obviously very i mean uh so there's plenty of moments when they call when when uh there's references to check dogs mm -hmm. um or check pigs mm -hmm. uh, but they're not sensitive no. yeah um I mean, I haven't, I haven't really looked through the, the, the trans, you know, the parts of the dogs, and that that would be interesting, actually. That obviously they don't completely cut the sections with, you know, him selling dogs and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that's. Um, yeah, there is a sense that, but I mean, like, dogs are not. I mean, uh, dogs are ta are traditionally taboo in Muslim culture, but I mean, Tur Turkey. Has been secular for so long. I mean, every, you know, everyone in my neighborhood has a dog. You know, it's not like right. this. so. It wouldn't it wouldn't offend people to just read about dogs, but they might feel a little bit, you know. Um, so, you know would they be Christian dogs? <laughs> would they be a set phrase? Uh, so um, would be a, a kind yeah. Of... I wonder if they use it. They, they might. I, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I can't think of something offhand. But yeah. I mean, possibly it could be used the other way. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah, it's mm -hmm. just on factual observation. Uh, as far as I know, I, I might be wrong. The most translated Czech book is Fuchi's uh, Notes from the Dogs. Yes. Uh, and yes. I mention it only because Fuchi wrote a lot of it. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Very, very essential. Yeah. Uh, and there, there are two Turkish translations of Fuchi also. Yeah, of course. So, and yeah. yeah. And uh, he actually is, according to some, emulated. And right. he is by some is considered a trickster. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very curious video too. Anna? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add something to your question about uh, Max Bohut's role in, in facilitating this early translation. And as far as I know, there's a very good book on the early German reception of Schweig by Patrick Pavel. It's not a very like, smart book, but it is very well researched, I would say. And um, as far as I may recall, Paul did not translate these two yeah. chapters of what it was. Yeah. They were already translated by Dr. Okay, um, yeah. But he wrote like immediately after the first parts were published, uh, like of, of, of Pashik's novel, he reviewed it in, I think it was already in 21, mm -hmm. for the Praga Tanabat. Mm -hmm. And there he already used this Brave Soldat right. title. Yeah. And Dritte Reiner obviously only reproduced Holt's title. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he is to blame for. Yeah. So it's the same. So it's even earlier, but more or less the same conclusion that I had. Yeah, just he had exactly. done it in a review. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wanted to add is that uh, when it comes to Brecht, uh, I would probably also say a little bit about that more. But he he was already involved in his um mm -hmm. adaption. Mm -hmm. He co-wrote actually mm -hmm. uh, parts of of, of the. Uh, this, the, the play that, 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 that the adaptation was based on. Mm -hmm. 
and and this so the sequel is not his first engagement with the, right yeah i know he was involved in, i didn't realize how deeply he was involved in it but yeah yeah actually so piscato picks up on this in the in this i think it's called the Colucci theater or something like his theoretical book um and there he also references uh Brecht's involvement in, in mm -hmm. the early the um, early ad adoption mm -hmm. The first text for the discovery of the nation was uh, uh, written by uh, Brock and someone else, Piscator, and Brecht didn't like it. Yeah. And then yeah. rewrite. Yeah. 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 Rewriting it. Uh, do you know if the if the text by Brock and someone else was still at the base? I don't. Or I, they I, I, write I don't know. something. Totally I mean, different. as 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 I as I recall from Piscato's book, um, he basically said that they were writing their own version against Bolt's uh, adaptation because they didn't like. I don't know. It's been a bad question. They even proceeded to a trial because Broad uh, yeah. tried them for a, a breach of contract. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just, uh, not so much a question as adding something. You were uh, mentioning like the Hungarian translator of the second, third volume. The second book of, right, the French. Yeah. Uh, so that's actually not one person, but two. Okay. There was a couple mm -hmm. of communist Hungarian journalists who translated it not out of Czech. So this is like a French translation, which was translated by Hungarians into French out of it out of a Hungarian translation made by another Hungarian communist that was published in Paris, yeah. okay. that was made out of a German translation. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And, and the, uh, the Aranyoshi um, uh, Mantra and Tal, <laughs> they are actually the uh, aunt and uncle of the Hungarian novelist Peter Nados. Oh, wow. Who, oh, wow. Uh, um, so, Yes, so that, that well, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, I couldn't find a lot of information on well, them. Um, the only thing, so. the, the only way we know about them now that now that has like this big memoir that he published like a oh, few years ago, yeah, okay. he writes about them uh, okay. extensively. But the the the, con, the the communist translator of of Hasek out of German mm -hmm. into Hungarian, and then, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's kind of just not. Um, yeah, so yeah, every one of these languages, there's these different. But then it's paths. amazing to think about like how then that ends up as the Turkish and how you could mm -hmm. trace back what you were doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> with all those languages. And, right. Yeah, that would, that's actually because that, that was part of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Front, the source for the, right. for the French. French. So, yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. I could have just checked in with the. Um, we put, uh, got in front of me now, Prague and Prince Sir, from 1st, 5th of November 1921. And there's an article called Prague Lokal Stücke, signed by someone called B, yeah, which is surely much wrong. And here he, he does use the term Shake that Brave Soldat from Jaroslav Hasek. Of course, we put that on, but even it's an almost yet yet, the case. So that's surely confirms what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, we'll take a little break and reconvene at 5.30 for uh, John Michel Robert I don't know these Hungarian things. I don't work on Hush. I just don't. This is like, I mean, this is still a conversation. Yeah, I know, I guess. I know, I guess. Well, but I mean, in that's <laughs> 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 
Okay, I have no idea. I have no idea. I have I have no I have I have I have I I'm going I'm sorry for this. no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, so then I should move a little bit. Uh, I should be a little bit. Oh, you know, it's just a bit. Yeah, 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 this is actually my So when you look at this, I was like, oh, that made me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating. Well, I knew something. The only thing I actually thought was something about obviously, it was a kind of thing. There's something real vague about what it really was. I don't think it's going to be a It's my point. It's a right. So it's their last name. It's their actual. You know, it's like Kafka was going to be translated by the, the newer, the, you know, the, right, uh, right, 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 right. So, but, but again, I'm not quite sure because I haven't done like um, properly. So, so, the, so that part, I just yeah, have to actually like Google that. Like, you know, talking the the fact that it was that, that translation came out a couple of years after the first time you had the that was probably in Paris. I know that is kind of a fact. Whether it's the truth of them, if that was like such thing, not they don't think they will probably be in play. I'll just say how they want to tell them. Yeah. Anyway, the um, so interesting that that second part was was replaced more quickly than the first part. So so there was there was originally just part one and two, and I think it was just one. Although. 
now that I think of it, I mean, part one was just the film volume, and part two was a separate call of ACC. Oh, so they do have Right. Yes. Yeah. And then they, they released a new adventure, which is a continuation of part yeah. with all, all, all with this new translator. Right. But it was still the, the, the first book was still called just the most important. So that didn't change. And right. still just this last. Right. Translation. Yeah. Translation. The other, the, the, the weird thing that I just now saw was that yeah, 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 even though they were working yeah, on yeah, the yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I think I have those. Yeah, 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 and they go to the house and they yes, the 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 in Turkey, you have so German, like German the and the yeah. um, immediate. Well, you know, the most common is English. Even even if you would think German would be more logical, they usually use English. Yeah, that's um, the also like part of class I mean, they're getting all this, all this research. Yeah. Yeah. And they go between, they go French is obvious. And, 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 and there's quite a few different things. Obviously, if you speak <laughs> French, you went to French, like French, like French, like German, like you know, yeah, they work back to work. Exactly. So there's yeah. there's you know the controversy of Kundera. Uh, translated into French and right. then making yeah, the translation sure. was too nice and yeah. not faithful and, and all the right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, that is yeah. the first The night writes in French, mm -hmm. his first translation mm -hmm. was right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm going to move to the middle of the middle of the Okay, great. Um, 
I mean, still really worth watching. Like, you should have been in experience anyway. so oh, no, there is a tree. Really? Try to say funny stuff. Go ahead. Thank you. No, no, this is a uh, design. Oh, okay. We just have a car. 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 We just have a yeah, 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 yeah. But I can't was it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 I so they, but the moment the world will be changed, they will be there with some experiences. Yeah, they all will be there with some experiences. But then I still have to say, I started to do it. Yeah, because there was the most bad thing I had. Yeah, 
Sorry, so what was it about the whole way that which I work? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a song. Yeah. It's very surprised. We're like, join for the experience of yeah. the <laughs> Whatever, but yeah, it was also very interesting. So, are you doing this on the side? And it turns out to be that it's because of the accent on the head. Oh, is that also happening? Uh, uh, oh, all right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Or just somebody like coming up to you. I don't think I don't I think the only thing is that there is that section, there is that part where where um, where where we are basically performed. So like I say those lines when saying we should do this. You know, right, right. right. But one thing we could do is just demonstrate what's happening so that at this point, who's first person that you are? So here, you just slowly walk around the stage and maybe just think you like, kind of indicate that this is what's happening. I mean, because that's what it suggests that we do it. And then, and then we are. And then you and then you do your own sort of right? So maybe the way oh, we should she, do it when I was saying it, it's all you have to be full. No, 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 don't get it, don't read it because he's going to read this. And if you read it, you just you know, you walk around the stage actually away from this because we are together. You and I are going to do this. Yeah, but you can yeah, 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 yeah. go away and come back while I do you know, Except, right? So you, so you want, so basically what I should do is while, while, because the way it works is like, no, I'm saying, and while each of us is going to say, I am, and then I should like basically do this, and maybe I should do that by walking around. Right, and we should be standing on one foot on one side of the center and do use the right. So, like, and the story, 
You guys exactly. That's it. That's it. That's it. So which one are you from? It says up steps. So you need to see the one who are not the one who are not the one who are not the are you guys doing a dramatic reading? Uh, I mean, I am the middle of the Yes, that's right. Right, right. 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 In the end, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, I think we have a and another proud journalist feminism going I'm going strong. Yeah. Yes. You got it out of the way early. You've been in that sort of post presentation group. That's right. I'm done now. That's right. It's the best part of every conference, right? You're done. You're relaxed. You're done. It's kind of like. Exactly. Like being a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had those conferences, though, like being you ask you the worst point, but you present on Thursday, but then you're chair of the event of the last one. Uh, yeah. And, and it's just like, and then you're at the airport waiting, waiting for that that's right. late flight home. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's what I'm Yeah, yeah, sure. Anyway, this is this is good. We've got a you know a packed day today, and tomorrow tomorrow is yeah. He's more easy going. Start late, finish early. Go drink beer. That's right. Oh no, the horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If you're going right now, you can do a serious you want to do serious project scholars this year. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's exciting. 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 It's I, 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 I suspect that people were like turned off by it, like the language of the copy goer the reference as it's turned off by the soldier. They're like, this is too militaristic yeah, for me. Yeah, so now it's called like shape. <laughs> I think it's intelligence. I think I think you're right. There's nobody on this. I 
the opera I saw in Chicago actually. No, no, no. Oh, like, I have the CD of it, like, oh, yeah. like, with the, the, all the music and everything. And it's in English. I I I I no, no, all right, folks, I'd like to make a, a brief announcement. Um, it's important for recording this uh, part of our Zoom audience. Uh, it's actually Dom Nexer is recording. Yes. Um, that a collection of hot text short story is being published this month. <laughs> Uh, containing 16 stories never before translated into English. Uh, the stories are relay translations from German, so it's a very contemporary thesis. Uh, translated by me, my publisher, or my mission, expects the first copies to ship next week. Anyone interested can search for the title, uh, The Man Without a Transit Path. So, uh, an interesting project. I think so. Yeah, we're distracting anyone, are we? All right, folks, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. And uh, this is where the weaknesses in my education will be apparent as I'm going to butcher the French title, a couple of his words, but bear with me. Uh, Jean Michel Rabaté is professor of English and comparative literature at the University of Pennsylvania. He is co-editor of the Journal of Modern Literature, and he is co-founder and senior curator of the Slot, Slot, Slot Foundation, which is an exhibition space for contemporary art on the UPenn campus. Uh, he is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he is the author or editor of 50 books on modernism, psychoanalysis, philosophy, and literary theory. His monographs include Rust from 2018, Kafka Lol, 2018, that is LOL, not Kafka. <laughs> um, Rio Soleil, 2019, uh, Beckett and Sage from 2020, uh, Rire Prodique, uh, Rire et Jouissance chez Marx, Freud et Kafka, 2021, uh, James Joyce, Hérétique et Prodique, uh, 2022. And I love this title, Lacan Irritant, 2023. <laughs> uh, he edited the volumes After Derrida from 2018, uh, New Beckett from 2019, 
understanding, understanding Derrida, Understanding Modernism from 2019, uh, Knots, Post-Lacanian Readings of Literature and Film from 2020, and he co-edited the volumes Historical Modernisms, uh, Time, History, and Modernist Aesthetics, 2022, and Encounters with uh, Song Gui Kim, Writings from 1975 uh, to 2021, published in 2022. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dong Michel Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chris. And first of all, thanks to Chris and to Vesla for organizing this uh, wonderful conference. And I have to say that I am humble and all facing such a knowledgeable audience. And I have to say that what I know about Ashek, I owe to Rasla, who whose dissertation I supervised at Penn and who very kindly made me believe I knew something about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's only this morning I realized that it was a total delusion. <laughs> so what I will try to do is take Hajek as a point of departure for something that I am still working on that's not absolutely completed. Should be a book on stupidity <laughs> and to sketch strategies of political resistance deployed in the name of what we might call stupidity, but I insist on this uh, question, the uh, double quotes around the term, because as soon as one uses a term like stupidity, many semantic and conceptual problems crop up. For instance, in my native French, we are very attentive to fine nuances distinguishing between bêtises, conneries, stupidité, sottise, idiocy, and vicinité, just to stick with the most basic. The first two of those words are untranslatable into English, which is a problem. For bêtise, my friend David Wells used asininity. <laughs> Not really great to <laughs> translate Derrida as the animal that therefore I am, in which Derrida keeps returning to the question of the animal, bad means animal. The second term, Connerie that we use so systematically today in French is also delicate with the suggestion of female genitals. So order to render in English, I saw that recently reading this excellent book by Damien Catani, Re Ferdinand Céline, Journeys to the Extreme. Uh, I was looking for the famous passage, I guess you may know some of that, when during the occupation, Céline, had come to a meeting of the rabbi, rabbi anti-Semitic, the study of Jewish questions, and then he interrupted the speaker. That's how it goes in the translation. Say, what about Aryan stupidity? You've got nothing to say about that? <laughs> the French vernacular coming from a no less rabbi anti-Semite, Céline, huh? than the stupefied speaker is this, et la connerie arienne dit tant cause pas, all right, it's hard to render. <laughs> what complicates uh, these things is that whether we follow certain metaphors, contemptuously animalistic, grotesquely sexualized to define stupidity, as soon as we use the term, the tables are likely to be turned on you. Soon, one finds oneself swallowed by the silliness from which one wants to take some distance, if only to define it. There is no more stupid statement in French literature, I think, than Paul Valéry's opening sentence of Monsieur Test, Mr. Test, wishing to present his character as the most intelligent person on earth. Valéry begins an evening with Monsieur Test with famous sentence, la bêtise n'est pas mon fort. I translate, I am not very gifted for stupidity. <laughs> As soon as we meet this monstrous intellectual obsessed by thinking the absolute, we are initiated into his heavy thoughts, and we're only reassured when we hear, after 10 or 15 pages, Mr. Test Y testify that he's not, after all, such a Luftmensch. Love and sex make him land to earth. She explained that, according to Mr. Test, love consists in being able to be bad together stupid and animals together. Uh, Zakir Paul, 
uh, teaches at NYU has a wonderful forthcoming book on the theme of disarming intelligence, not out yet, in French and German culture. And he will probe these issues elegantly and systematically. To sum up his uh, thesis in one sentence, I would say that the question of intelligence in French is a fascination for stupidity and conversely. Uh, Robert Musil, in a famous text, perceived these problems very well. Text from 1937, some of you may know it, 19 on stupidity. He begins with a disclaimer. Anyone who presumes to speak about stupidity today runs the risk of coming to grief in a number of ways. And he ends with similar words of caution. Occasionally, we are all stupid. I'm not sure that Musil has read Hashek, although he might. One of his analyses suggests the possibility, I quote this passage, stupidity lulls mistrust to sleep. It disarms, as we still say today, in the title of like it. Uh, uh, and uh, traces of such venerable craftiness and artful stupidity are still to be found in dependent relationships in which the relative strength are so disproportionately divided that the weaker person seeks salvation by acting more stupid than he is. <laughs> the traces show themselves, for instance, in the peasant's so-called slyness, the servants dealing with his culture among master and mistresses, the soldier's relation to his superior officer, the pupils to the teacher, the child to the parents. And we can say that indeed, this is what we meet as soon as we begin reading the epic of Solar Schweig. Uh, we uh, realize that Schweig has been called a legal idiot, a certified imbecile, various authorities have officially confirmed that he is stupid. And indeed, at the beginning, he sounds moronic, but immediately we realize that the silliness he displays mimics, mimes, or echoes the systemic or endemic absurdity of the army, the police, military ideology, and so on. <clears throat> Quite disarmingly, Schweik manages to fend off attempts by uh, policemen at the beginning to lock him up in jail for the disturbance he would have caused. And we, we touched on that point uh, earlier. The policeman screams at him, don't look so stupid. Suddenly, sinking his tone, the policeman mentions the fact that if he is not having little intelligence, there must be somebody who pushed him, who is behind him, who entices you to commit those silly ask he asks. Trey does not answer, neither acknowledge having committed any sorry, silly act. His innocent face destroys the evil lurking in the policeman's eyes. In that third section, Shrek is presented as honest, a true lamb, whose spontaneous patriotism clashes with the cynicism, we just talked about the cynicism of the police. I think in Shrek at the beginning, the cynical ones are more on the side of the administration of the police and then on Shrek. Uh, it is common knowledge among the police that they belong to, uh, I quote, the sons of a nation destined to bleed itself empty for interests totally alien to them. The official cannot believe that Shrek, who was by then taken to jail, could have uttered the patriotic words seriously. And he adds, and you yourself well know that such a patriotic outburst could and probably did strike the audience ironically rather than seriously. <laughs> Shrek's response is disarming indeed. And so this is this theme of the disarming value of stupidity and is then dismissed. So Schweik's apparent guilelessness, naivety, his innocence, offer a better form of political resistance than Melville's Bartleby. I would, if I had more time, I would compare them. Bartleby, we know, almost says nothing and limits his rejection to, I prefer not to, and then somehow dies of this. Unlike Bartleby, you could say that Schweik's sort of anti-Bartleby, uh, Schweik cannot keep silent. He keeps on talking, chatting endlessly, and so on. And he has always a new shaggy dog story akin to old woman gossip, hearsay, peasant folklore, also first-hand vignettes, 
endless anecdotes, and we talked about that term earlier, uh, anecdote, uh, that somehow uh, sends up all the military rituals, unjust orders, inane contradictions of the bureaucracy. However, if stupidity is indeed a powerful weapon in the satire, can we grant it a dominant status throughout the entire epic? Most certainly, and in book three and four, Drake appears more rational, and that with a clearer vision, closer to the shrewdness of Sancho Panza. Actually, as you all know, Panza is mentioned quite early by when he's made the orderly of Lieutenant Lukas. I quote, the institution of military servants is of ancient origin. It seemed that Alexander the Great of Macedonia had the put spring. German in that one, the new translation. In feudal times, the knights mercenaries fulfilled this role. What was Central Panza to Don Quixote? Indeed, we know, and especially also in uh, Don Quixote, there is an evolution, if you remember, between part one and part two. Part two, basically, Sancho Panza takes over and becomes the rational one, <clears throat> more rational in a novel that, according to Foucault, and I would agree with this, is the first modern novel. Um, <clears throat> what we need to understand, and I think it becomes relatively clear when we have, I mentioned earlier, the theme of a pseudo couple launched by Beckett, and he takes, of course, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza as a Pseudo couple. The pseudo couple for Beck has, has to be of the same sex, but sexuality is not necessarily present. But um, I, I suggest to uh, get a, a better sense of what is at stake here uh, that if we understand stupidity in, as the reverse of rationality, we have to understand that there is always the possibility of a reversal. And to go a little further, I will look at the text in German, so not French, to uh, see the semantics of what Kant, so this is Kant, who had probed what he called the diseases of the head uh, in a strange essay that hasn't been discussed so often from 1764, Kant had just turned 40, that is both playful and serious. Kant at that time had been struck by the discovery of an old man who was living in the woods with a young boy and claimed to be a goat prophet, shunning human company. This led Kant to meditate on madness. In fact, the main uh, aim of this text is to discuss madness. But before, Kant says that he wants to understand the various diseases of the head, which is interesting. It distinguishes the head and the heart. And as he says in modern, society, people do not care too much about the heart. People uh, uh, prefer having a scoundrel as a friend than a dimwit or a moron. He, argue, he begins like this. He then says that he will sketch an onomastic of the frailties of the head. And so he has this wide array of terms. And so I give you in English and in German, Imbecility, blödsinnigkeit, madness, tollheit, idiocy, dunkelfischkeit, foolishness, narheit. I'll return to nar at the end via Kafka. Here is the first definition. The dull head, the cop, lacks wit. The idiot lacks understanding. Wit corresponds to the agility of the mind in finding verbal expression. And uh, there is also those, he calls in English, ninny, tough, simpleton, idiot. And this person is too simple. And as Kant says, surprisingly, uh, when it is a man, this person will generally be called a H, abbreviation for Hanrai Kakold. <laughs> uh, to be distinguished from the foolish person, Toro, and so on. Uh, the foolish person understands the true intention of his passion very well, even if he grants it the strength that is able of fettering reason. The fool, nah, however, is at the same time rendered so stupid by his passion that he believes only then to be in possession of the thing desired when he actually deprives himself of it. And so, and so on. I, I, I'll go a little faster. Very 
interesting multiplication of terms. And fundamentally, what Kant wants to show is that uh, there is a gradation leading from simply mild stupidity to absolute madness. On the way to it, uh, Kant betrays a certain racism, and I return to this. One may not fully despair that a foolish person can be made shrewd, but he who thinks of making a fool clever is washing the moor. I return to some of these racist jokes in uh, Kant, but what interests me here is that at the end of the essay, Kant quotes an author he often quoted, Jonathan Swift. It's a text in which Swift was discussing the bad style, peri batu, or anti sublime. A text from, uh, that had been translated into German in 1733, the satire of bad poetry. Surprisingly, in that text, Swift says that it's good to have bad people writing badly. <laughs> Why? Because this is the way in which the desire of writing is the titillation of the generative faculty of the brain, and such uh, must go bring forth um, what the discharge of the peccant humor in purulent meter is useful. Uh, one avoids an abundance of untimely death for uh, uh, wretches for mere want of pen, ink, and paper. For hence it followed that the suppression of the very worst poetry is of dangerous consequence <laughs> to the state. And so we have here this idea, which is interesting in Kant, that bad writing and also stupidity can be cathartic, at least has a function for the whole machine of the state. And this is what he said, the commonwealth somehow. We see this a little bit in uh, a, a number of passages of Shake's adventures. In the fourth book, we see him, and I return to it, taken as a Russian spy or a traitor because he has done the Russian uniform. But because he knows some drama, immediately he's taken as a Jew by the interpreter quartermaster. To demonstrate the superiority of the Austrian discipline of a Jewish affair, the quartermaster calls in private Hans Löffler. Löffler, a peasant soldier afflicted with a goiter, is then humiliated thoroughly, made to crawl on all fours like a dog with a pipe in his mouth, finally to yodel. To go further in the humiliation game, Schweik tells the story of an officer's orderly, so obedient, not himself, but another one, that he had notified his master that he would eat his excrement by spoon, but he adds a qualification. I quote, if my Mr. Lieutenant ordered it, I would gobble it up as ordered, but I better not find a hair in it. That is terribly yucky to me. That would make me <laughs> sick right away. <laughs> the quartermaster grudgingly recognizes this to be better, it's a good joke. You choose, sure have good jokes, but he adds, you have no discipline. <laughs> so this idea of uh, the slight detail in the experimental fantasy of eating the shit of the officer would be a sort of Jewish, a meta-Jewish joke. Uh, this is indeed what Kant would suggest because he follows the trope of a sublime too close to stupidity because both would uncover a certain infinite. And here, this is what uh, we have in a quote. Uh, uh, we know there's a long tradition in French, Ernest Renan, hein, la bêtise humaine est la seule chose qui donne une idée de l'infini. Human stupidity is the only thing that gives an idea of the infinite, but <laughs> it was rephrased by Rémi de Gourmont wittily, quoting Kant, ce n'est pas l'immensité de la voûte étoilée qui peut donner le plus complètement l'idée de l'infini, mais bien la bêtise humaine. It is not the immensity of the sky with the stars that can give a good idea of infinity, but human stupidity. You recognize the Kantian tag here. Einstein later echoed this, only two things are infinite, 
the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the former. <laughs> we see in the second moment the links between the idea of infinity and that of stupidity, thanks to Alain Badiou. And here is uh, the moment when I want to announce that we'll have my, my talk is relatively long and we'll have a little break soon uh, in which uh, three actors all dressed in black will uh, embody a little play by Alain Badiou. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fundamentally, I would say that from Kant to Badiou, there is a certain, <clears throat> we say, uh, evolution. And uh, here I won't have time to discuss this at some length, but I just send you back to send you to a wonderful text that I discovered when it was published uh, two or three years ago, uh, 2021. Uh, Robert Cluis, Kant's Humorous Writings and Illustrated Guide. <laughs> I like it. Each, each time there is a joke in Kant, you have a little drawing. <laughs> so it's really easy to uh, understand and follow. Of course, again, for Kant, stupidity is the reverse of rationality, but we cannot tell very precisely what is the right side and the wrong side. That's by general point here. Um, this is indeed something that we have in Freud as well. In similar indecision underpins the category. So this is what justifies my title of stupid jokes, something that I worked on in the French book on, on Freud. Uh, in German, Dummheitswitzen, <laughs> jokes of stupidity. And uh, that's uh, the best example, the first example to, to define <laughs> What is a stupid joke is something that looks like it comes from Schweik. <laughs> so here it is, Freud. A Jewish joke. There is a Jewish soldier called Itzik who has been declared fit for the artillery. He's a smart and a very good soldier, but he cannot hide that he has no interest in wartime duties. His officer, because he wishes her well, like Lukash, does he fake? takes him aside and says, Itzik, you're no good for us. Buy yourself a cannon and make yourself independent. <laughs> Freud comment is a piece of nonsense. One cannot wait to work for oneself. Cannons are not for sale. Confirmed that the logic of the army and the logic of business are incompatible. As it puts, as Freud puts it, it would be very foolish of Itzik and a grosse dummheit to persist applying the intelligence yet gained in doing business. Indeed, as Freud quips, in the army, the word is subordination and cooperation. We are in the world of fake, I think, here. Another book, Dumm Heiswitz, discussed by Freud, is a remark by the humorist Georg Christoph Lichtenberg. He wonders that cats should have two holes cut in the fur in the very place where they have eyes. <laughs> the joke is presented by Freud as a stupid joke, which surprises me. <laughs> Freud says, to wonder at something self-evident, as something which actually is only the statement of an identity, is certainly stupid and a doomer. Freud, however, cannot be as naive as to believe that Lichtenberg is naive. Uh, he compares this with a sentence he attributed to Michelet, uh, which was not uh, by Michelet, how beautifully nature has arranged things so that as soon as a child comes into the world, he finds a mother ready to live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Michelet is not always very smart, but happily he never wrote this, uh, <laughs> even though he has many books on mothers and so on. But uh, in a way, the fact that this uh, uh, metaphor, then a little later, Freud said that it is a shrewd and witty metaphor, creates laughter because suddenly we replace the organic sense of the cat with a fur, with a skin cat donning a fur that may not exactly be fitting. Uh, which calls up Derrida's meditation of nakedness in front of his cat in the <laughs> animal that therefore I am. You can also call up, also call, call up the uh, little story 
uh, that you probably know by Herzeg, the unfortunate affair of the Tomcat. I don't know whether you remember this. After a horrible political brawl, the cat of a politician called Kustos is harassed by the son of his opponent. The son then deliberately <laughs> steps on the cat's tail. A few days later, while the boy passes, the cat takes its revenge and scratches and bites the boy. The father of the boy files a complaint. The complaint is escalated by the police and the medical authorities. Finally, taken to jail, Rousteau is told of his impending execution. He presents too great a danger to his neighbors. This parable of political abuse and terror inverts the language of animal rights. Here, the cat is so human that it is the owner who ends up being taken for the offensive pet, uh, which is the way of twisted, uh, showing the consequences of administrative stupidity. <clears throat> when Derrida meditated looking at his cat and wondering whether he was naked in front of the cat and whether the cat felt naked in front of Derrida, he was taking his cue from Avita Ronell's book, Stupidity, a great book, in which he asserts that stupidity is a quasi-concept. Ronald posited an equation between Heidegger's recognition that his years of service as a Nazi chancellor, chancellor were in the Grosse Dome Height, in Grosse Betise in French. About the time of this stupid turn, Heidegger was meditating about the divide between animals and humans in the meditation that has then been unpacked by Giorgio Agamben in the open. In the 1929 seminar, Heidegger examines animals and gives us perhaps a solution to the cat riddle as presented by Lichtenberg and lost by Freud. This is what Heidegger writes. Is the eye some kind of equipment, equipment for seeing with, even though it does not seem to be an instrument since it does not help to produce anything? Or is it not indeed true that it produced something? Can we not say that the eye produces the retina and along with it, what is visible and seen, the eye is for seeing. Is seeing produced by the eye? We must frame our question more precisely. If we wish to decide about the instrumental character of the eye, can the animal see because it has eyes? Or does it have eyes because it can <coughs> see? Do we call this a Dummheismith or just a philosophical <laughs> meditation? <laughs> uh, we know that Heidegger's solution is to assert that seeing remains open for potentiality, which is where Agamben takes his starting point here. And we can say that nevertheless, Heidegger's Dummheit does not extend to his analysis of the an animal uh, in general and may account for his uh, fact that he remained stumm, uh, dumm uh, in German and stumm have a certain connection, never apologizing for his behavior in the 30s. If we understand this via Freud, we can go back briefly to why uh, Freud calls the cat joke, a stupid joke. I would say simply, and here, yeah, condense a long analysis, that this joke of the fur with the holes and the eyes is a Bergsonian joke. That is that it uh, presupposes the fact that there is a superposition between a human living, uh, 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 an animal uh, as a living organism and a machine. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what uh, we see. And here we understand that in Freud's book on uh, drugs, he seems to agree with Bergson's analysis of the drug, but then doesn't really. Uh, he fails to use the Bergson analysis of laughter as being first a corrective, but also cruel. Uh, for Bergson, we laugh when we see somebody falling on a banana peel in front of our eyes. Why? Because suddenly somebody who look pompous and uh, a human being is reduced to the status of a little machine, a little uh, disarticulated toy, and so on. 
However, uh, what I would like to say is that Freud's main hypothesis about drugs in general, and also stupidity drugs, is an economic analysis that uh, drugs are a sort of spare on the expenditure by creating a compression. It doesn't fit with Bergson's analysis of the plaquette, plate, uh, the way the machine and the organism do not totally fit together. <clears throat> and uh, one uh, can say that here, at this point for Freud, one has to return to the question of uh, naivety, children, and this is what uh, we, we can see in Freud, the idea of the uh, laughter that is uh, a sort of naive, childish laughter. We simply quote here Lacan. When Lacan went back to Freud's book on drugs, he simply disagreed with the last chapter. And when he saw the possibility of Freud moving towards Bergson, he needed to attack completely <laughs> Bergson's, that he calls Bergson a romantic theory and opposes to Bergson Kleist's famous analysis of the marionette. Lacan concludes his criticism of Bergson in those words. Laughter touches everything that is an imitation, a doubling, a doppelganger, a mask, and if we look at it more closely, it's not just a matter of masks, but of unmasking. Unmasking at moments that are worth thinking about. You go up to a child with your face covered by a mask. He laughs in a nervous or embarrassed way. You move a bit closer, a manifestation of anxiety starts to appear. You take off the mask, the child laughs. But if you are wearing another mask, we need to mask. <laughs> you won't laugh a bit. <laughs> So we have to return to the question of unmasking, which I'll uh, do in uh, another uh, passage. But I'll just say in between that this is a little what we have in Hajek's way of unmasking a certain stupidity. And here I just, we, we heard this morning a famous Cadet, cadet Beagler, uh, sort of double or fake, intensely pro war, also learned, treated as an idiot by his superiors. Uh, and uh, we, so what interested me is that at some point, uh, when he's drafting all those books, like uh, we have Who Started the War, Slavic Imperialism, and the War, Our Heroes in Captivity, he takes as his model a German professor named Udo Kraft. <laughs> Udo Kraft was killed in action in August 1914 after having published a strange book that is quoted in a footnote, Selbst Erziehung zum Tod für Kaiser, <laughs> <laughs> educating oneself to die for the emperor. Happily, this book is online. <laughs> I, I read it yes. and I couldn't believe it. Uh, Udo Kraft, as you know, the name means strength, was 44. And a high school professor teaching history in the town of Büdingen near Frankfurt. And when he uh, volunteered in 1914 to join the German army. But he had already written a number of texts. He was obsessed with Napoleon. He hated Napoleon, but he was always teaching about Napoleon, Napoleon I. He had lived in Argentina, he had visited Baltimore, but he was homesick. And uh, he was what we might say a good example of a pre-Nazi thinker. <laughs> uh, he kept pondering concepts like Heimat, Folk, the Folk, the German people, had a soul that had been tainted, that had to be kept pure, and he thought Germany had two arch enemies, England and France, and that war would purify everything. War is the most sacred thing on earth. The loss of individual lives was a necessary sacrifice to keep the spirit of the folk alive. His posthumous papers were published by his brother in 1915 and read Fake on his way to the Russian front. But it's very strange in Kraft's attitude. So I would say it's quite a strange mixture of beautiful style, noble romantic feelings, and utter stupidity. Uh, <laughs> he wanted to be killed as a gift to the Kaiser. So 
And, it, and indeed, he was killed in the first month, probably just uh, killed up and was shot immediately. <laughs> Wanted to be killed stupidly as a gay person. This quasi suicidal attitude seems at some point to be replicated, nevertheless, by Schweik. <laughs> when he decides on an impulse to don a Russian uniform left by a Russian soldier taking a swim in a lake, as we know in book three. Immediately, Schweik is arrested as an enemy sent to a prisoner's jail, suspected as being a spy and traitor, and so on. A little later, Schweik discovers that Russian army overcoats are warmer and bigger than the Austrian equivalent, but he never really explains his gesture. He seems unwilling to realize that the fact of donning an enemy uniform in times of war cannot be understood by that treason and that the punishment will be death. Later on, he tried to account for his gesture. He was testing whether he could be seen as a spy. All this remains totally unconvincing. Is that another stupid joke? Uh, we know, of course, that it was Hajek's way of slyly putting in his novel the way of his double desertion from the or triple desertion from the army, the Czech Legion, the communist returning, and so on. However, uh, we know that what saved Sheikh, and so this is the interesting spiral, is not the strength of his position. His position is absurd, stupid, or simply, uh, you could say, uh, the sending off of everything or the values in a suicidal effect. The fact is that the officer in charge of his fate is called General Fink. General Fink loves jokes. He collects books that Hindenburg jokes, Hindenburg in the mirror of humor. Fink, of course, had no qualms hanging Shrek. He would shake, he would do it. Uh, but uh, to conclude the stupid joke, in the end, we understand it's only the rigidity of the Austrian army system, the convoluted system of checks and counter checks, that the delays in the telegram reclaiming Shrek for his unit, that somehow saves him. I just pause here uh, before our little sketch to say that uh, my own passage to the French army, when I had to do my military service, taught me a lot about stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it do, dawned on me after a few months that what binds the army is stupidity. However, I would say, it is a stupidity that is inevitable and even necessary. One cannot be intelligent when one has to organize thousands of uneducated, rebellious young men bursting with testosterone and uh, trying to do whatever. We had a sergeant who started to teach us the different parts of an automatic hunger. He would begin each sentence with, my name is and he would show the trigger. My name is firing pit. My name is, of course, we nicknamed him Trigger. <laughs> and we found him totally stupid until one day he saved one of my friends from uh, uh, unpro, I mean, from a stupid moment when he had unpinned a grenade, light grenade, dropped it at his feet, and the sergeant rushed and threw it in the air where it, where it exploded. Of course, in the army, I saw countless sinister types resembling more the sadistic Lieutenant Dub in the epic. At this point, I will make a little jump and I will just introduce uh, Alain Badiou, a philosopher and playwright as well. And uh, so we are going to stage a short passage, very short passage from this uh, little sketch, Hamed the Philosopher, 30 short plays for children the sketch entitled The Same and the Other. So I read the stage directions, and you're going to read the Ahmed and the doubles. Okay. So I adjust. So Ahmed enters, acting important like a master followed by his two understudies dressed exactly like him. <laughs> Gentlemen, um, it is the big day. 
after months of practice and intellectual preparation, you are going to attempt for the first time to play Amen. Keep telling yourselves that, obviously impossible though it may be, you are Amen. You walk like Amen. You talk like Amen. Obviously, you don't think like Amen, but in the theater, that doesn't matter. <laughs> you understand my explanations very well. Yes, master. I understand everything. No, dear master. I understand nothing. Yeah. Yes, my colleague. I understand nothing. Uh, how, how, how can you say that you understand everything that you understand nothing? Because he never understands anything. That's right, master. I never understand anything. But you just said that you understood everything. You said I had to understand everything. So since I'm Ahmed, since I'm the same as you, I understood everything. But then he said that he understood nothing. And he's also on it, the same as you. <laughs> Therefore, the same as me. He's the other guy who's the same. So being the same as this other guy who's the same, I didn't understand anything either. But then why didn't you understand anything? Because your explanations are stupid. Your Ahmed isn't really the same as the Ahmeds one sees in rotten housing projects. They're completely other. They're miserable, bullied, pathetic. And you tell us to be like you. Upbeat, lively, sublime, with a joyous ferocity. They're illiterate, and you tell us to be philosophers of masses of French language. So being the same as you basically means being other than all the others. It's stupid. And you? What do you think of my theatrical explanations? What do I think of them? That's right. What do you think of them, imbecile? I think they're stupid. And why are they stupid, my explanations? Because I'm an imbecile. The understudy for an understudy who's a lot more the same as all the other Ahmeds than the real Ahmed ever will be is necessarily an imbecile. <laughs> and if the one who's the same as me says I'm an imbecile, it's because he knows it necessarily. If he didn't know that he himself is an imbecile, he couldn't know that. I, who am another, but the same as him, am also an imbecile. Are you insinuating that I'm a cretin? A cretin? I don't know. An imbecile, definitely, <laughs> since you just told me you. I just told you that you were an imbecile, not me, you cretin. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you are a cretin too, <laughs> in addition to being an imbecile. Calm down, you two. I'd like to understand why, because you, you are an imbecile, or even a cretin. It follows that my explanations are stupid. It's because they're brilliant, magnificent, because they make us completely understand what Ahmed is. Get a load of this caveman who thinks he's Ahmed. The gentleman's explanations are stupid because they're brilliant. He could drive us crazy. No, not at all. He's absolutely right. If my explanations are brilliant, since he's an imbecile, he thinks they're stupid because imbecility is taking something not for what it is, but for something other than what it is. Conversely, um, if you find my brilliant explanation stupid, it's because you're an imbecile. But they're not brilliant, they're stupid. And you, you're stupid too, because you think that the Ahmed of your master is the same as all the other Ahmeds, while he's at best the same as you, and while the one who's the same as the others is me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, I understand everything. But what do you understand? <laughs> Is the Ahmed who's the same as the other Ahmeds, the Ahmeds who the who's other than the other Ahmeds, the Ahmed who's other than the same Ahmed, and the Ahmeds who's the same as the same Ahmed. And above all, there's me, who I'm the same as myself in the role of Ahmed. And then you two <laughs> can't hold a candle to the others. All right, listen. We're going to conduct a very simple test. Each of us is going to cross the stage while being Ahmed to the max. Each of us is really going to walk like Ahmed and talk like Ahmed. And while walking, each of us is going to say, I am Ahmed the philosopher. And I am capable of distinguishing between the one who is the same as Ahmed and the one who is other than him. And having seen this, we'll designate the best Ahmed. <laughs> and how will we manage to designate the best Ahmed? Can you tell me that, sir? Well, we'll do it as it has to be done in a democracy. We'll vote. <laughs> uh, after the test, all three of us will form a jury and we'll vote. I understand everything. We'll vote for the one who is the same as Ahmed. 
The same as weight China, if you imbecile. <laughs> According to the latest reports, cretin, not imbecile. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> not an imbecile or a cretin. Are you going to question the holiness of democracy, the sovereignty of universal suffrage? Not in a million years. We're going to vote for the same. And the one who's a little bit too much the other, we're going to throw him in the cracker. <laughs> come here. For... Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh, come here for a second. As Ahmed, you're the same as me, right? I'm the other Ahmed, who's the same as the Ahmed, who's the same as you. As you wish. When we're on the journey, jury, I'm going to vote for myself. But since you're the same as me, you're going to vote the same as me. And if you don't vote the same as me, it's because you're another, you're not Ahmed. And we're going to throw you in the cracker. I understand everything. <laughs> Can you repeat it to me? Repeat what, dear Ahmed? What you understand. When we're on the jury, you're going to vote for yourself. Since I'm the same as you, I'm going to vote for myself. You bet it. <laughs> if you vote like me, you've got to vote for me. You imbecile. Why, if it's the same as you, would I vote for someone other than me while you vote for your me? If I vote for you, I'd be someone other than you. And I'd go right into the crapper. <laughs> <laughs> Enough with your conspiracies, my loads of pupils. The test is beginning. So here I read the stage direction. All three crops pray stage trying to be Ahmed as well as possible, pronouncing the sentence, I am Ahmed the philosopher, and I am capable of distinguishing between the one who is the same as Ahmed and the one who is other than him. See, the acting style of the first and the study is extremely overdone. His crossing takes the longest time, making it possible to insert the following aside. Come here for a second. Yes, your master. What may I do for you? When we're on the jury, I'm going to vote for you. And since you're my best pupil, really the same as Ahmed, your master, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to vote for me. I understand everything, master. Repeat what I said. Since each of us is the same as the other, each of us will vote for the other. Perfect. Excellent. First, understudy has positioned himself as to a spy on the conversation. This test is going to be a flop. I'm voting for myself. The imbecile is voting for Ahmed, and Ahmed for the imbecile. <laughs> One vote each, the teacher will look ridiculous, which isn't such a bad thing. Jury meeting. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Jury meeting. First understudy. Um, first understudy. For whom do you vote? I vote for myself. My realist art surpasses you, you and your stupid explanations. <laughs> Second understudy. What is your choice? I understand everything, Master. You explained it to me. I vote for you. And me, I vote for myself too. I'm designated the sole authentic Ahmed by two votes to one. You cretin! <laughs> you stupid imbecile! And you got fucked by your master! <laughs> I understand everything. Can you tell me what you understand, cheap knockoff of an, of an Ahmed? The one who's really Ahmed, the one who's the same as Ahmed, is the one who fucks all the others. With the most honorable of attentions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful. You did it so well. Uh, as you can see here, that you is posing the question of democracy as stupidity or stupidity as democracy. As we know, he chose Ahmed as this kind of Burr, Arab name, the suburban person who is at the same time the Platonician philosopher, whose value always claims he is the only philosopher who can be like Plato, the Platonician thinker. He's also in that little sketch parodying Lacan's sophism of the three prisoners who discover their identical white discs by just looking at each other's backs and concluding that they all are the same. Here, it is a parody of that kind of great equalizer stupidity that would be the key of democracy. And we know indeed, if we look at Badiou's retranslation or hypertranslation of Plato's Republic, that's how he rethinks the Republic. The question for Badiou is, among other things, at least you see this in Plato, what is the best political system? Is it democracy? Is it communism? At the same time, uh, if you read this very entertaining, I think, modernized version, every time Plato 
mentions uh, God, uh, he talks about the big other, you have uh, discussions of Cantor, transfinite numbers, the Russian Revolution, and so on, Maoism, and so on. However, there is a passage that is quite important for our uh, discussion, the moment when he reaches that uh, decision of the Republic to exile poets from the police. And this is how, uh, and I have to say that, that you also invents a feminine philosopher called Amantha. <laughs> Socrates uh, explains that indeed the new state, the new police will not have any poets. They will be sent to the border and exiled. Amantha objects. The political utopia like that of the Republic cannot have any borders. And I quote, she says to Socrates, you'll be well aware that our project is internationalist in scope. The proletariat has no country. A communist border agent would be a pathetic oxymoron, which only proves Socrates shot back that what I was suggesting was an image that I was speaking metaphorically. Trust me, this vision of the poet banned from the city will become famous. Oh, then, she says, you are the poet with the deceptive language and the enticing images. Well, concluded Socrates, I entrust you with the task of personally seeing to my deportation. They all burst out laughing. This is Badu's way of twisting the question of the exile of the poet. The exclusion of the poet is a stupid joke that Plato played upon himself. And as Nietzsche has reminded us, Plato was a frustrated playwright who was always, of course, ambivalent about writing. To go a little faster, I just adduce a recent, at least the latest book by Badu, translated into English, and uh, there is a new one because there are very, very many coming. The Manners of Truth, 700 pages. <laughs> And begins with a number of passages on Ahmed again, interspersed with analysis of mathematics, logical theory, and a number of very short chapters devoted to literary texts by Ronisha, Hugo, Dickinson, Salam, Mandelstam, Tresor, Brecht, and Samuel Beckett. In all those texts, and here I am just in time, Badiou launches a uh, conceptual couple that he calls recouvrement and découvrement, translated in English as covering over and uncovering. His main idea is that ideology is always a covering over in the sense of finitude that reduces the potentiality of any text. To give you just one example, uh, he takes uh, Beckett, um, and uh, so that's Beckett's last uh, poem, uh, what is the word in which you have folly, folly in English, folly, what to, what is the word, folly, from this, all this, folly, given, folly, seeing all this. And that you show that all the readings that try to contextualize or historicize Beckett are wrong. They miss everything. They don't understand that what is at stake in Beckett and in all those writers is an unleashing of a certain infinite and infinite potential. What he calls covering uh, covering over is similar to, and so this is what he says, to what Lacan called the non duped le, the non du pair, the non du pair in French, meaning those who are not du are mistaken. And so as he says, uh, these non du are people who try to be smarter and always think that they will find, let's say, in a kind of no historical context, a reduction of the text to a certain finite and miss the infinity. <clears throat> and so uh, for him, one has to see in text and so for all the examples he gives something in the, in the passage that I will not have the time to discuss because it would be too long, a poem in French by Beckett in which Kant plays a certain role, Kant contemplating the Lisbon earthquake of 1755, <clears throat> that for Beckett is a good example of how uh, the 
uh, Beckett manages to fight against the law of the father and he wants to be infinitized. Uh, uh, he wants to destroy any finitude. It is also for Badiou uh, something that is that accompanied by laughter. He ends the chapter on Beckett with a quote from a Mirlitonade, so in French, en face le pire jusqu'à ce qu'il fasse rire, facing the worst until it turns into mirth. But you comments, he who sees the night as he sees himself seeing the night, he who experiments further than the here and there of the name thing, he who is not infinitized faces the worst and sees his derision. But you forces us to revisit and question the basic equation of democracy equals stupidity, stupidity equals democracy that is central to the problematics of the recent book by Nobutaka Otobe. Stupidity in politics is unavoidability <laughs> and its potential. I recommend this book. Like Badiou, always with less panache or stringency, Obey assert that only stupidity is universal. We cannot contain stupidity in a rationalistic manner. We cannot blame it on post truth condition. Fake would be no exception. Uh, and uh, one cannot, as he says, the experience of stupidity stupefies us into thinking. And here I'll give you my last example. A few years ago, I had started collecting examples of stupid behavior in the US. And in fact, there were so many <laughs> everywhere. But one I just mentioned, because I think in the present context, it has some relevance, was in an article that I discovered, gun, gun enthusiasts celebrate man who shot himself in the balls as a king. What? <laughs> so I looked it up. The victim uh, lives in San Diego, and he belongs to a group of gun collectors who, in order to disregard the usual guidelines insisting on security rules, take selfies showing loaded weapons pointed at their genitals. <laughs> While taking a similar selfie, the San Diego man shot himself accidentally in the testicles. <laughs> he survived after an operation. Quite logically, so not just 2020, the group hailed him as a hero and made him king of the association. <laughs> the group the got loaded guns pointed at penis, posted the video. I saw it, but it was deleted a bit later. <laughs> you see the king pointed the loaded 45 hand guns at his crotch, a brief pause, a big sh shot, the video has been deleted. But I would say the in that absurd stupidity, the members were right to name the shooter king a president, he had acted out the unconscious desire to <laughs> perverse castration and not be killed. <laughs> so it is from this angle of the concept of castration that I would just return to Schweig uh, <clears throat> and uh, to say that, as we've seen, and I think most of uh, the excellent uh, presentation I had this morning, agree that we cannot present the psychology of Schweig. Um, we can say, is he faking? Is he not faking? Is he simple? Is he essential? Is he smart? Is he his guys? Is there an evolution? I would say that fundamentally, uh, it's a device called stupidity. And this device would give a new spin on what Hermann Brauch, uh, followed by Milan Kondera, called the theoretical or epistemological novel. There can't be theoretical roman as Broch put it. Uh, and so I would say that the stupidity Roman would be the logical conclusion of the epistemological novel. And uh, this is indeed where, like Kafka, Hajek uh, would exclaim, no more psychology. He lets his character run away wildly, like the child narrator of one of Kafka's earlier stories, one of the earliest he published, a beautiful story, children on a country road that begins with the laughter of the peasants that come back from the fields heard by the young narrator. The young narrator is having 
uh, dinner, and then follow the other children who play games. Most of the evening, part of the night, they all run together in a heap in the fields. And then at the end, he decides to go home to sleep. And one thinks he's just going to his bed. But as the final vignette, Kafka depicts literature as quite literally a fool's paradise. I just go <laughs> this. This is the end of the story. And when time was up, I kissed the next one to me, reached to the three nearest, began to run home. None called me back. At the first crossroads, where they could no longer see me, I turned off and ran by the field path into the forest again. I was making for that city in the south, of which it was said in our village, quote, there you find queer folk. Just think, they never sleep. And why not? Because they never get tired. And why not? Because they are fools. Marilyn, don't fools get tired? How could, get, how could fools get tired? Let me just ask you, how could we get tired? <laughs> Yes, there yes. is. There is. Um, we, we are expected at the speech in about 55 minutes, but it won't take us that long to get there. So it's certainly time for questions, comments, rebuttals, wisdom from the staircase. And for those of you who want to have, uh, I have a few more copies. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, I, so, so, so. You, you had it, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you, George. Yeah. Um, one of the one of your books that Chris didn't mention, I don't think Pig, and it's a book about Beckett. Uh, and it suggests just the title suggests the idea of a thinking animal or animals that think. Mm -hmm. But it's an opposition, at least set up in the beginning of the talk between Betis, the idea of animals not thinking, animals being stupid. Um, and you end it with Kafka. I'm, I'm just going to try and talk about this tomorrow. Then Kafka animals do think all the yeah. time. It's all they do. Right? Too much. Yeah. Too much. They're auto digesting. Yeah. They think mm -hmm. themselves into cages. Yeah. Yeah. And handshake animals don't really seem to think. I wonder if it's not a question again, but. No, 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 it's a good question because indeed it's the Beckett Kafka divide that is yeah. so surprising that somehow Beckett always said he didn't like Kafka, he didn't appreciate Kafka, and it's a little surprising given the fact that when you read what you cannot, you know, have thinking of, them. and we know that he had read Kafka, but apparently he didn't like the way. Kafka treated the form and so on. So, but there seems here sort of a double, double thinking of, of, of Beckett. And indeed, the uh, uh, thing pig is clearly uh, a man speaking to a man. Uh, it's uh, uh, lucky who is presented as a as a pig by uh, uh, his master. He's the slave, obviously. And uh, what is interesting in that moment, uh, I think I. I um, made that point in, in the book or, or maybe in another text. Uh, Günther Anders uh, read this uh, moment very interestingly, showing that up to that point, one had a sort of meta Heideggerian parody, and then suddenly history intervenes. The dialectic of the master and the slave comes uh, through Pozzo and Aki, uh, locked in kind of right? uh, almost uh, double and clearly again another uh, couple uh, for, for, for Beckett. So to, to think like a pig is not the same exactly as for Kafka when we see the dog uh, having all these investigations and so on. And indeed Kafka would probably send us more towards Wittgenstein's and less investigations. Uh, whereas uh, Kafka's joke is of course, you know, investigation of the dog, that the dog is always thinking about a number of things, but he doesn't see literally humans. 
so he doesn't know something really important in his life, where does food come from and so on. Um, thank you so much for this talk, uh, really a lot to grab onto, but um, there was, I was thinking while I was reading Shriek of another joke, so one comment, one question, um, that Freud tells, and I didn't manage to work it into my talk at all, um, but I think it's apropos of the way, especially the way the army works in regard to Sheik, where, uh, you probably, I'm sure you know it, uh, two Jews are sitting on a train going to Krakow, yes. and one or two Jews are sitting on a train, one of them asks the other one where they're going. He says, I'm going to Krakow, and the other one says, I know you're going to, wait, how's it work? Lemberg. I know you're going to Lemberg, so why are you telling me you're going That's to it. Krakow? Yeah. Or That's it. Complicated, more complicated, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's sort of, um, you know, assuming someone is smarter that's than it, the it. other person in order, and that therefore the whole logical structure falls apart. Um, but so my my comment, which maybe bases is based on that, is you talk about the stupid joke. Is there a smart joke? And what would that be? <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, at least that joke is, uh, if you remember. Freud calls it a skeptical joke, not, not a stupid joke. And a skeptical joke is, as he says, a joke that questions rationality as such. So um, indeed, the, uh, the joke relies on the fact that two Jews who meet each other for business purposes will lie. And so if one doesn't lie, then there is a contradiction <laughs> in the terms. And so uh, I'd say that, uh, no, for Freud, there is no, there is no non-stupid joke because precisely any joke, if it is a good joke, let's say, but let's say the bad joke may be a rational joke, but a good joke touches the irrationality of the unconscious. So by itself, it explodes the notion we can have that we still hold to something rational in our minds. A good joke stupefies us, like you know, uh, so. Whether it's a stupid, a stupid joke or a skeptical joke or any any real joke, and I think uh, having worked a little bit on on jokes that generally the good jokes uh, are being translated uh, from culture to culture, and uh, I discovered that many of the jokes we think are Jewish jokes or in fact Scottish jokes a century mm -hmm. earlier, Presbyterian jokes, and so on. So. Theological system changes completely, but you have the same structures. And um, just as a, a little detail, it's something that I had uh, worked on for uh, an earlier book. Uh, that joke of Lambert and so on, we don't know where it comes from. In fact. Uh, we, we don't have it. It's not a joke that you could find. At least I never found it in any of the collection that we know. Freud was looking at, but we know he was asking many of his correspondents for jokes, and originally he was writing a book on Jewish humor, and then it became a book on jokes, so much earlier than Protection of Dreams. However, Lambert, the, 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 uh, one of the cities mentioned, what I saw is that in uh, Freud's youth, he had fallen in love with a young woman called Gisela Fruss. And he would write to his friend about her and have fantasies about her. And then he heard that she was going to marry and that it was going to be in Lemberg. <laughs> and Freud was really very sad. And then something happened and she did not marry. So she did not marry in Lemberg and so on. She married later in Vienna. So in that joke, there is a little bit of Freud's attitude facing this woman. He was daily courting and so on. The first, uh, you know, fantasy woman and so on. So that, that little edge in it. But in, in, there is no, no rational book. Reminds me of a, a Jiddick joke. When a communist functionary is traveling through Germany and he turns to the passenger next to him and asks him, where are we? And the passenger says, Baden Baden. And the functionary says, I heard you, I heard you the first time. I'm not stupid. You don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> works in New York as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Can I, if I understood you correctly, I mean, the, the découvrement, découvrement, I mean, this is going to be, I, découvrement is the stupid move, right? The kind of the foreclosing. So let me do a bit of that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> just about the Lichtenberg um, aphorism joke, whatever yeah. that is, yeah. uh, that you talked about, because that was like, right. in, in, in a way, that was the joke you talked yeah. most about. That's true. And it's actually a smart joke. It's not a stupid Indeed. joke. It's a, it's a very smart joke, but it's also, and I'm doing the découvrement because I'm kind of doing the historical contextualization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the bad thing. Um, is that, I mean, is it not the case that Lichtenberg's joke is at the expense of basically like physical theology, a kind of 17th, 18th exactly. century, exactly. where you say like, I mean, it's like, it, 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 does it not show God's wisdom that our yeah. ears are on the two sides of our heads and that way we get that. <laughs> so it's, it's, it, this is like taking that thinking to, to, uh, to the extreme. It is, it is a joke, Kant would say about teleology. Right. It, it's a Kantian joke, you, you, right. you could say. Right. Um, it's a joke about the, uh, looking like the teleology, but not really right. teleology. But, but in this case, so, like, it's specifically given Lichtenberg's right, exactly. na natural historical yeah, interest, yeah, yeah. like it's like yeah. specifically yeah. about yeah. this, yeah. which is like a very 18th century fascinating. Absolutely. But it, it, it's surprising, you're, you're totally right, thank you. But surprising that we know that Freud that read Lichtenberg and almost memorized everything. Yeah. We see this on the uh, early correspondence, and he quotes many, many funny things, including Lichtenberg uh, 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 against anti Semitism in, in, in Germany and so on. And it's funny that there he pretends to believe that it is a stupid joke, whereas it's a little that, that's what in a way intrigued me that he classified this among the stupid jokes, whereas it, it's sick. And the gun, yes, you understand, not stupid, but he pretends to be stupid. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Thank you. There is uh, Schweik's comment on stupidity in the novel. I have just uh, checked uh, so to translate. Everybody can be smart. The stupid ones must make an exception. Because if everybody was smart, yeah. There <laughs> would be so much rationality in the world that uh, a half of humankind would be totally stupid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> uh, something I didn't have time to mention here is, and maybe you will tell me whether you agree with this or, or, or not. I'm not a Hajek specialist, but I tried to read everything I could find in English, all those collections and so on. I have to say, I was disappointed by everything that is not fake. And I was wondering why. The same jokes about, let's say, the Synological Institute, the little story. And we know that Hajek indeed with these guys, dogs, and sell them or pretend he had found werewolves and so on. When you read them in those little installments that he sent to newspapers, fall flat for me. When they are in the uh, long epic, they are fantastic. So I was wondering about that. See, this is my a joke we know doesn't come on its own somehow. You cannot, you know, there are moments of jokes, even socially speaking, Generally at the end of the dinner and so on. And a lot of what I, I see today, and of a young colleague at Penn who is working like me, but in a different context on French political jokes about racism in the suburbs of Paris and like jokes against uh, white racism uh, by performers of color and minority and so on, like the other MS and so on. But uh, what I realized talking with friends who are, say, performers and so on, how loaded and difficult it is today to make jokes, mm -hmm. make a living <laughs> as a stand-up comedian 
and the danger of making the wrong joke and so on. And I think academia, we all know that we are all afraid of suddenly forgetting where we are and making the incongruous joke that will then be used <laughs> to destroy us. And so on, the other moment when, uh, like we see in the chair, and the stupid moment when the professor makes a Hitlerian salute and so on. So it's, it's a very political question, I would say today, the joke and the joke in context and in isolation. What is the context that make, makes a joke good or possible or interesting? Because I think a good joke is a joke that makes you laugh. It, and since I, I, I laugh a lot at very, very silly jokes, so I'm not, uh, uh, but some people would not laugh at them somehow. So why is it? We touch generally sort of childishness, maybe, at least I do <laughs> in my case. I like you know, press falls and so on. All those stupid programs on television where you see people who do who try to do performances and fall horribly. You know, people find them. I laugh. You know, I, I, guess what I, I laugh at that. But I think we have become all more aware of what it can entail today to make a joke and laugh at a joke or say, oh, this is a joke I cannot you know, take part in. So it, it, I think it's become, a, a, and, and it's not only in the US, of course, but uh, I see this in France as well. People are extremely careful about even laughing at a joke. You know, well, I think that with jokes and humor, we have to accept, or maybe it's culturally kind of dependent, but we have to accept that there is another ethics that they could, that they, that you have to, someone has long ears and you are able to laugh at it. And how about if he is sick or something like that? Or why would we laugh at it or something? So jokes introduce an ethic uh, that is uh, in, in the current homogenization of ethics uh, um, kind of problematic. And that's uh, uh, in, in many ways, uh, uh, Kind of step back because there is it, it worked with only one possible ethics forward and right. not the possibility to think about other ethics or but you see jokes. I think I think you touched on the problem most jokes most good jokes are unethical yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. because they are at the expense of somebody yeah. exactly yeah. That's, oh. there's no avoiding that yeah. and so you see this is that you squirrel will live in us and the wrong quarrel, and so on, and with the Levinas, and so Hamed is used as a sort of foil against Levinas, for, among other things, for that you, but indeed, a joke, a good joke, will offend a few people, necessarily, so, yes. There are so many people in the joke, there is taking, you know, making fun of somebody who is automatically considered inferior. Well, so it's not necessarily not necessarily inferior, but you could be the butt of a joke and and not yeah you could laugh and and uh, depends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't I didn't mean offend someone, but that is for me not the key point. The key point is that there are other ethical words worlds. I think the question is ethics. Just I, I, I stop right, you here. Okay. As soon as you talk about jokes and ethics. Where do you put the limit? Where can you say today we will have a few good jokes, but they will all be ethical jokes? Quite likely that they will not be very funny. You see what I mean? No, I don't know. What that Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. I don't know. I'm I, I'm we opened a debate, and I don't want to prolong it. But I I think I disagree that all jokes are aimed at, I mean, many jokes are aimed at someone, but I think many jokes are, and I think this is what you're getting at in some ways, or this is what Freud is getting at in some yeah. ways, that, you know, there are jokes on on logic itself. I think that's also what Hashik is getting at in, in maybe, and in, there, are, there are so many jokes in the novel, and some of them are aimed at something or other, but some of them are just aimed at certain forms of logic. And I guess if you take those certain forms of logic very seriously, then the jokes aren't funny either and mm. you could be offended. But 
there are jokes where there is no superiority, but where it sort of takes aim at the structure of thought per right. se. Right. But see, there's the problem of all the jokes that make fun of a group making fun yeah. of itself. Like Jewish jokes uh, are known for that. And can you produce them if you're not Jewish yourself? And so on. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit more complicated. It's not just we are talking about I don't Polish jokes, Flemish jokes. If you don't get the joke, you are the stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's but the choice is very ironic. Uh, no, no, but, uh, to, 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 to go back to, to uh, I didn't want to stop the discussion on ethics, but I think that for me, and really I'm not a specialist, but what interests me in Hashek is that I see him as an anarchist. I think we would agree. And there is an anarchist humor in Hashek. And uh, there is a, a, a humor in, in most anarchists, the good anarchists, I would say, even in Bakunin, from <laughs> in Bakunin. But, you know, the, 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 the best for me, I mean, the founder, you might say, of the thought leading to anarchism is Max Stirner. The, I don't know whether you read the Heinziger yeah, yeah, Line to the uh, unique and it, its property, but it's hilarious. It's hilarious. You have the moment when he says, we need to think love from the point of view of egoists. So we have the community of egoists. <laughs> if you read him like Marx, you read him uh, critically, but he's very, very funny. <laughs> like the German ideology is a very funny book as well, full of jokes and so on. And it, isn't this sort of what we're kind of getting back at? It's this idea of unmasking, you brought up yeah. from Lacan, exactly. is that the, uh, the, the anarchist can unmask to reveal yeah, the fact it, that you know, all ideology is problematic. That's it. That's it. And, then, and that unmasking there is a is both funny, but it also has an ethical tinge to it. Yeah. There is actually a goal. There actually can even be a telos That's That's to it. this kind of jokes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, one of the problems that we have here is what is left after that unmasking? Mm -hmm. if, if the thing that's left after that unmasking is a pretty mm -hmm. ugly thing or an ugly stereotype or an ugly idea, mm -hmm. then it might be funny if you participated in that. But, you know, there are some jokes that are not very funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but and, just to, to, to interject here, yeah, uh, uh, something that I saw a few years ago on television in England, there was a big ceremony and they had the most expensive bottle, a very old bottle that they had found in a shipwreck from 1800. And so they didn't know whether it was, but it was like covered in dust and you had the queen and so on. And the person who brought the bottle at the last minute slipped, mm -hmm. fell, broke the bottle. That, that's funny. And, so, <laughs> and that's it. Everybody <laughs> laughed. The point is, can the person who has fallen laugh at himself? Yeah. Well, and, without and, being beheaded. I mean, and, and, yeah. and this, this, this is the, the question of, you know, where do we shift from the laughing at to the laughing with? Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. here I wanted to ask about what role do you think that someone like Schweig plays here? And sometimes I wonder this, how this goes back to say what Mark was talking about before with the idea of the trickster. Mm -hmm. And is the trickster the person who comes and can reveal? Are they, are they playing almost like um, the, the role of the satyr from the mm -hmm. old satyr plays of, of, of telling the uncomfortable truth? Is that, mm -hmm. is that the kind of thing that's going on here? Um, so, so that's my, my, my first question, but I have, an, I have another one sort of behind this as well, which is about the, the kind of problems of stupidity here, because I wanted to ask if there are certain stupidities that are worse than others. Uh, for example, you gave the example of, uh, of Udo Kraft, hmm. and it seems to me that his, uh, his stupidity is a particularly romantic stupidity. And this kind of romantic stupidity is, yeah. is, is not only just stupid, it's also very dangerous. Yeah. And, and I wonder if there is a, a type of stupidity here that is still sort of frivolous and fun, and we can still say, okay, maybe, maybe this actually is okay to have a, uh, a, a nitwit as a friend in a, in a Kantian term here. But there is also a, a, a type of stupidity here that not only do you not want as a friend, but you know, is, is somehow worse than a, even a scoundrel. Right. But I think when I read that book by Udo Kraft, I really experienced sort of vertigo of the infinite. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> really? <laughs> It's there, yeah. <laughs> really did it, believed it, and so on. So there is this moment of sends you back through something. I think a Lacanian answer to what you were uh, suggesting would be that, and I think but you would agree with that, that often the point is just to see the split, the constitutive split in the subject, that, that we are not, or what Kafka said famously, you know, 
what do I have in common with the Jews? I have nothing in common with myself. Mm -hmm. When we see that we have nothing in common with ourselves, mm -hmm. we can take the joke and laugh both at and with, perhaps, not always. <laughs> So they ask more of a general question for everybody. What part of shake did you actually laugh the most at? <laughs> just, I'm just curious. It could, it could be a long discussion, but. You know, I mean, that, that's a very good question, I think. But I have that uh, same question. I worked a lot on Finnegan's Wake. Okay. Not so many people have read Finnegan's Wake in this room, I'm sure, but Finnegan's Wake can be both remote. Tedious, impossible book full of puns and sort of incomprehensible verbiage, although most funny book. But I have to say, having read it or read through it many times, I never really laugh at the same spots. Mm -hmm. There's sort of displacement. Not well, first time I would laugh at the obvious funny puns, like one I uh, often use. Uh, with my students, uh, which has to do with the joke about superiority. Hey, you, I, I, that's in Finnegan's answer. It's a quote. Huh? You understand? I understand. <laughs> I can, but are you able? And so on. But then you, you laugh at other more subtle things. And I think for me, it's a little like that. Not that I've read tricks many times, but a few times, and first in French, then in the yeah. Penguin and in a new translation, the new translation changes indeed a lot the way I, I, I love it somehow. I, it, it's more funny, I would say, than the penguin. Which is already. So it's not exactly always the same, I guess. I don't know whether I speak just for myself. But... Yeah. And it also really depends on what translation is. Exactly. Exactly. I think translation is a very is a key issue here for humor because it's something that. I've been taught, pushed many times in English. I realized in English, it's not funny. It's very funny in French. How can I explain that? Of course, in French is hilarious, I would say. And the same little details that make you laugh are missing from the two good translations that exist in, in English. So it's a very, very subtle little thing that are cumulative, I would say. It's really good question. Thank you. In Shrek, it's very one. There's one difficult thing, and that's uh, separate things that we laugh with and that we laugh at. Because mm -hmm. actually, 80, 90 percent of Shrek is not sort of satire, yeah. and it's very often political satire. Of course, and you know. Is this funny that the, the Franz Josef is breastfed? <laughs> because because he, he, is, he is senile. Uh, he is present, so he is the emperor, but he is senile. He doesn't know what's going on. And on top of that, in Sherbourne, they have to uh, breastfeed him uh, because he's gaga. And um, that's for me a uh, really political satire. And I don't know, is it very funny? I, I can understand the logic of it. I find it funny. But, yes. all right. No, it's, it's also the least common denominator for it, yeah, right? Is, uh, yeah, I mean, even, with the, even if you don't know Franz Josef, it's just talking about some old guy mm -hmm. who has lost it, and it, it's funny. <laughs> it's just inherently funny. I mean, it's more, it was more funny when he was a revered monarch. Yeah. Oh, sure. And so yeah. today, yeah. who cares about him? But still, I find it funny. Yeah. There is a philosophical second play, because you know, uh, the circle of life from the beginning to the yeah. end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, I mean, this is where ethics, in, I would say, in a Hegelian sense, like, Zittlichkeit, the, the, the morality of a moment intervenes. When Hegel says that Antigone, since we, 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 we hear about Antigone, um, uh, is the irony of the police, it is within a certain context of male values that are, that are destroyed. I don't want to interrupt the conversation. I'm, I'm confident it will continue over dinner, but um, 
I want to give everyone ample time. Uh, this Vichy is a little bit less than a kilometer from here. So depending on how fast you walk or how fast you can get an Uber, you know, you want to plan on that. I'm uh, blocks. Well, it's like a it's like a long block west, and it's about what maybe seven or eight blocks uptown, something like that. It's just yeah, not quite. It's less. It's shorter than that. It's about eight blocks. if you found one so yeah, I'm ah. coming quite, quite, quite often. Yeah. So, Teddy's not long, the center. Oh, you have one. Thank you very much. 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 Thank my other niece is just going to go through as the villa nova and seem to be totally overwhelmed. So, I think it's the second part. I think it's the second part. Oh, I know it's eventually. If I read it, I'm going to have that. That's right. Yo, you can have a change. All right, so you can have a change. Sorry, I'll take a look at the